greetings new and returning IT enthusiasts. Certification Synergy has another IT training course ready and waiting for you. Whether you are continuing with us after moving on from our CompTIA ITF plus training, or you are discovering us for the first time, welcome to Certification Synergy. By clicking on this video, you have opened the door to our CompTIA A plus Core 1 complete training course. And guess what? It's going to cost you absolutely nothing. That's right. This full-length course is 100% free. No hidden fees, no additional content charges, just pure, concentrated knowledge tailored to teach you everything you need to know in order to pass the CompTIA A plus Core 1 certification exam. With that said, we are excited that you have chosen us as your guide while you prepare for the CompTIA A plus Core 1 certification exam and we appreciate the opportunity to share our expertise with you. And just once more, in case you didn't believe me the first time, this complete training course is a free, self-paced learning resource here for everyone's benefit. So what makes Certification Synergy the best IT training in town? Easy. Besides our strategic and orderly presentation of exam topics, we make learning feel like a walk in the park. You can expect to learn from vivid, comprehensible video segments, all seasoned with a dash of humor, to keep the experience lively. This course isn't just a learning pathway, it's a guided experience. If you are still listening, it is now time to get a little more real and discuss what this certification is all about. Now we will explore what makes an ideal candidate for the CompTIA A Plus certification and this course. This certification is for entry-level problem solvers and innovative thinkers. If you have a solid grasp of IT basics, presumably from the CompTIA ITF plus certification or similar experience, and a zest for turning technological puzzles into triumphs, this is your call to action. The A plus journey welcomes those who are ready and willing to bridge the gap between users and the magic of tech. Whether you're dreaming of being the tech wizard everyone relies on, or you envision a future crafting cutting-edge solutions, the CompTIA A Plus certification is the logical next step following the foundational ITF Plus certification. So how do you become CompTIA A Plus certified? It is important to know that this widely recognized credential requires you to successfully pass two separate exams known as the Core 1 and the Core 2 exams. Each of these exams delves into distinct yet complementary domains of IT knowledge. Core 1 focuses on the essentials of hardware and networking, while Core 2 dives deeper into operating systems, security, and operational procedures. Together, these exams validate the dual spectrum of practical and theoretical expertise that is essential for entry-level IT professionals. Achieving a passing score on both exams is a necessary component to obtaining the CompTIA A Plus certification. As for this course, I will be covering every topic needed to pass the core one part of this two-headed certification beast. Taking a step back, let's understand the overall path to IT foundational mastery. Ideally, you've either earned your CompTIA ITF Plus certification or you've acquired comparable foundational IT skills, which primes you for this A plus core one course. As your guide and educator for this leg of the journey, I will help you build upon your already strong foundational knowledge, equipping you with the expertise needed to tackle and succeed in subsequent certifications, such as the CompTIA Network Plus and the CompTIA Security Plus. This course is designed to be a stepping stone, helping you to grow while progressively expanding on your IT capabilities. Next, you need to know what IT concepts will be taught in this course. The CompTIA A Plus Core 1 certification exam focuses on the essential IT skills and knowledge needed to complete tasks commonly performed by entry-level IT professionals. To pass, you will need to have the knowledge and skills required to understand. Mobile devices networking concepts, computing hardware, cloud computing, and virtualization. Additionally, 
This exam will assess your knowledge of troubleshooting scenarios related to these topics. Now the current version of the CompTIA A Plus Core 1 certification exam, designated as 220-1101, was launched in April of 2022. The exam consists of 90 multiple choice and performance-based questions, lovingly referred to as PBQs, that must be completed in 90 minutes and the passing score is 675 on a scale of 900. Now the scoring system can be a bit confusing, so I will give you a breakdown that works well for us here at Certification Synergy. If you score below 500, you have some more studying to do. If you score between 500 and 674, you knew more than half the content and just need a bit more understanding to get you across the finish line. Score between 675 and 749, and you knew about two-thirds to three-quarters of the content, and you will have passed. With a score of 750 to 799, you knew most of the exam content. Go above 800, and you can tell everyone you crushed it. Anyone scoring 800 plus on a CompTIA exam should be very proud of their accomplishment. If you get a perfect 900 score, Contact us immediately, we want to hire you. Okay, not really, but know this. Even seasoned veterans tend to score in the low to mid 800 range. I hope you find this scoring breakdown helpful when evaluating your exam results. Now we need to discuss the heart of this exam, the exam objectives. For those of you who watched our ITF plus training course videos, you will surely remember that the exam objectives are a document that outlines the parameters for studying for and eventually taking a certification exam. It will include exam items like how many questions, the question format or what type of questions you will be asked, and the requirements to pass the exam. The exam objectives will also outline the topics you will be tested on. At the highest level, the exam is broken into domains. The domains for the CompTIA A Plus Core 1 exam, 220-1101, are shown here with a percentage value next to them. The percentage refers to how many questions can be expected from each domain when you take your exam. Each domain is then broken into exam objectives. Here we can see the first domain for the CompTIA A Plus Core 1 certification exam is mobile devices. And the first exam objective in this domain is, given a scenario, install and configure laptop hardware and components. Within this exam objective are the exam topics. Exam objective 1.1 starts with topics focused on hardware and device replacement. Don't worry if you do not understand some of these topics yet, as this is the reason for this course. So why have I spent your time breaking down the exam objectives? because they are super important and often overlooked. The exam objectives are a roadmap to success. They provide a clear path of what to study and keep you on track. Additionally, once you have completed this training course, the exam objectives should act as a final checklist. Taking one last look at the official exam objectives before attempting the certification exam will help focus your thoughts and point you in the direction of any additional study you may need. To download the exam objectives, you can visit the CompTIA A Plus Core 1 product page on our CertificationSynergy.com website. I will also provide a link in the description section of this video and in the comments. Now, as you continue with this training course, I encourage you to watch each video segment as many times as you need to master the topics. Go as fast or as slow as you want. It would also be a great idea to subscribe now making it easier to find us later. We are always pumping out new free content and you don't want to miss out. CompTIA A Plus Core 1 Complete Training Course Exam Objective 1.1 Given a scenario, install and configure laptop hardware and components. Mobile Device Hardware The first topic up for the CompTIA A Plus Core 1 Certification Exam is Hardware and device replacement for mobile devices. That is why I will start by defining the term mobile device. 
In IT, a mobile device is a portable, battery-powered computing gadget like smartphones, tablets, or laptops designed for ease of mobility. These devices are commonly equipped with wireless connectivity and include a range of functions from communication to web browsing and application usage tailored to operate on the go. While these portable devices allow us to perform many of the same tasks as a traditional desktop computer, their internal computing components may differ. Unlike the spacious insides of a desktop PC, mobile devices have to fit everything into a much smaller space. Therefore, engineers design these components with a focus on miniaturization, power efficiency, and heat management which are crucial for maintaining performance without compromising the device's portability. Now, before we dive inside one of these mobile devices and get our hands dirty, safety first. Whenever you're planning to work inside a mobile device, always disconnect it from any power source and remove the battery. Implementing this one step helps to prevent electrical accidents or damage to the device. Additionally, when it comes to battery maintenance, you'll need to be aware of the type of battery your device uses and the manufacturer's guidelines for removal and replacement. Some devices have batteries that are easily swappable, while others may require a more delicate approach. Our next mobile device component on the list are keyboards and keys. These components are prone to wear and tear and may eventually require replacement. It is also important to carefully remove and clean under the keys from time to time. Keeping your keyboard clean will prolong its life and ensure your keystroke inputs are accurately recorded. Moving on to random access memory or RAM, laptops typically use a type called SODIM. SODIM stands for Small Outline Dual Inline Memory Module. I know, what a mouthful. Anyways, this type of RAM is more compact than standard memory modules found in desktop computers, allowing it to fit into the thin profile of a laptop. Additionally, SODIMs are designed for lower power consumption, which helps prolong battery life, and are upgradable in many situations, providing increased performance when required. Now, when it comes to smartphones and tablets, these devices commonly use RAM soldered directly onto the device's motherboard. This integration means that RAM in smartphones and tablets is not user-upgradable as increasing memory capacity would require a complete redesign of the motherboard, making it a fixed resource from the moment of manufacture. The last internal computing component we will discuss in this video is laptop storage. For this we encounter two main types, the hard disk drive, or HDD, and the solid state drive, or SSD. An HDD, with its traditional mechanical parts, offers a cost-effective solution for large storage capacities, but it's the SSD that brings a performance edge. SSDs, having no moving parts, provide faster data access, reduced power consumption, and improved durability, leading to a noticeable boost in performance. While upgrading from an HDD drive to an SSD drive is feasible, there is one drawback. Most laptops are designed with a single drive bay, limiting upgrade options to either replacing the existing drive or migrating data to a new drive. Replacement involves installing a new drive and reinstalling the operating system and applications, while migration is a cloning process that transfers the entire contents of the old drive to the new SSD, preserving all data and programs. Whichever method you choose, just don't lose any important data. Exam Objective 1.1 Given a scenario, install and configure laptop hardware and components. Wireless Cards Wireless Network Interface Cards, also known as Wireless NICs or Wireless Network Adapters, are hardware components that allow computers and other devices to connect to wireless networks in scenarios where wired network connections like Ethernet cables and RJ45 connectors are not available. They are typically installed inside mobile devices to connect to a variety of wireless signals. Inside of laptops, 
These cards can come pre-installed or added as needed to provide connectivity to Bluetooth, Wi-Fi networks, and cellular networks. These cards can handle multiple frequencies and protocols to provide seamless connectivity for tasks such as internet browsing, file sharing, and streaming. For instance, Bluetooth cards are used for linking peripherals like keyboards, mice, and speakers. WLAN cards enable devices to connect to local Wi-Fi networks, and WAN cards connect to mobile phone networks for internet access over long distances or while traveling. Each type of card is designed to support specific wireless standards, ensuring that mobile devices can communicate effectively in different wireless environments. When you're ready to install or replace a wireless card in your laptop, be particularly mindful to power down the device as your first step. After ensuring the laptop is powered down and disconnected from all power sources, locate and open the compartment that houses the wireless card. If you're replacing an existing card, you'll see the antenna cables attached to it. Carefully detach the antenna cables from the old card. As you remove them, know how they are routed, traveling up from the motherboard and around the display, tucked away under the screen's trim bezel. This grounding is deliberate to prevent signal interference and maximize the antenna's efficacy. When installing the new wireless card, gently reroute the antenna cables along the same path. Ensure the cables are laid flat and securely fastened along their designated path without any undue tension. After the card is seated and the antenna cables are correctly grouted, connect them to the new card. Next, reassemble your device with care and close up any access panels. Once everything is back in place, you can power on your laptop and the operating system should recognize the new hardware, prompting you to install any necessary drivers. If a driver is needed, most vendors now offer them as downloads from their websites. With the antenna properly routed and the components secured, you can expect robust wireless performance from your newly installed card. Exam Objective 1.1 Given a scenario, install and configure laptop hardware and components. Mobile device security. The security features of mobile devices, including laptops, often differ slightly from those found on desktops. Specifically, mobile devices tend to have certain security measures that are more prominent due to the nature of mobile computing. Two notable examples are biometric authentication and near-field communication technology, or NFC. Biometric authentication, such as fingerprint recognition, is becoming a common feature on laptops. This is because laptops are designed for users who need quick and convenient access while on the go. A fingerprint sensor provides a fast way to unlock the device, confirm purchases, or log into secure services, bypassing the need for complex passwords. This not only makes the login process faster, but also adds a unique layer of security that ensures only authorized users can access the device. Desktops, conversely, don't commonly come with built-in fingerprint sensors. While the technology exists for desktops, it typically requires separate external hardware. Desktop users interested in biometric security must invest in these additional tools and manage their installation and setup. Since desktops are often situated in more secure, private settings and are not transported as frequently, the demand for built-in biometric devices is lower, making them a rarer feature in desktop environments. Near-field communication technology is also more frequently found in laptops compared to desktops. This prevalence is attributed to the portable nature of laptops, which often necessitates the quick and effortless exchange of information with other mobile devices such as smartphones and tablets. NFC enables just that, a rapid, touch-based pairing process that simplifies the setup and initiation of wireless communication between devices. This is particularly useful for on-the-go users who may frequently need to connect their laptops to various peripherals and mobile gadgets without navigating complex settings or using cables. In contrast, desktops typically do not prioritize such features. 
Since desktops remain stationary and are usually set up with a permanent network connection, the need for quick wireless pairing and a physical disconnect from networks is less pronounced. Exam Objective 1.2 Compare and contrast the display components of mobile devices. Display Types Mobile devices primarily utilize flat panel screen technologies such as LCD and OLED screens due to their efficiency, thin profile, and superior display qualities. As for their construction, LCD screens use a backlight to illuminate pixels, which are controlled by liquid crystals. This technology is cost-effective, produces high-resolution displays, and performs well in bright conditions. However, the need for a backlight means these displays are thicker and less energy-efficient than their OLED counterparts. OLED screens, in contrast, generate a small amount of light from each and every pixel, negating the need for a backlight and allowing for a thinner display. They are celebrated for their superior color contrast, most accurate color spectrum, and the ability to achieve true blacks, as pixels can be completely turned off. They also offer wide viewing angles that are as good, if not better than LCD displays, making them perfect for premium devices. While OLEDs can be more costly and are prone to burn in with static images, advancements continue, with newer technologies being released each year. Now we will take a closer look at each of these flat panel display technologies, starting with LCD. LCD stands for Liquid Crystal Display and is a flat panel technology that incorporates special liquid crystals to show images. Now, there are a few different types of these LCD displays. IPS, or in-plane switching, is the fancy version. It's really good at showing bright, true colors from all angles. So if you move around or aren't sitting right in front of it, the picture still looks good. People who need to see colors perfectly, like artists or designers, really like this type. TN, or twisted pneumatic displays, are super fast. They're not the best at showing colors accurately, and you need to look at them straight on for the best view. But for things that move really quickly on the screen, like in video games, they're great. As for VA, or vertical alignment displays, they are more balanced. A VA display is better at showing colors and can be seen from wider angles than the TN-type display, but not as good as the IPS. However, it is fairly good at showing dark blacks and color contrasts, which is great for watching movies or in rooms where the ambient light level changes frequently. Next, we have OLED. This acronym stands for Organic Light Emitting Diode and is a flat panel technology that incorporates organic materials that glow when electricity is applied to them. For this screen type, Imagine a bunch of tiny colored lights that can turn on and off on their own. Each little light is a pixel, and they can create pictures without needing a backlight, which is something LCD screens require. Because these tiny lights make their own color, everything looks super vibrant, and the blacks in the picture are really deep and dark. It's like each pixel is a tiny color-changing firefly, working together to create a bright and lively image. OLED screens have a superpower too, the power of flexibility. Since the materials they're made of are organic and can be put on different surfaces, OLED screens can bend and fold without breaking. This means we can have things like curved displays, foldable phones, and wearable gadgets with screens that wrap around your wrist. It's a bit like having a super thin, super bright wallpaper that you can stick on all sorts of shapes and things and it will still show you those perfect colors from all angles. Exam Objective 1.2 Compare and contrast the display components of mobile devices. Display Components In today's mobile devices, the display is not a standalone component, but a complex hub where various system components and peripherals converge. This intricate integration is a testament to innovative design, aiming to maximize functionality within the minimal real estate of a device on the go. The sleek, 
Compact form factor we've grown accustomed to is largely thanks to this strategic consolidation of parts. However, this space-saving approach brings its own set of complexities when it comes to repairs. The close quarters within which these elements coexist means that disassembling one part can often involve navigating around or temporarily removing others, increasing the risk of damage and the challenge of the repair. Technicians must have a keen understanding of the layout and be adept at handling the delicate interplay of components. For example, when addressing the Wi-Fi antenna routing within a laptop, it's essential to appreciate the intricacy of its placement and the impact it has on signal reception. The antenna cables, which are integral to the laptop's ability to connect to wireless networks, are delicately threaded in a specific path to optimize the efficacy of the signal. They typically travel from the motherboard, ascend around the display, and are carefully tucked beneath the screen's trim bezel. This meticulous routing is designed to minimize signal interference, an important factor in maintaining a strong and stable wireless connection. Any deviation from this path could result in signal degradation. Thus, when working around these antenna cables, it's vital to avoid any crimping or undue tension. Either condition can lead to a weakened or erratic signal, severely reducing your laptop's wireless capabilities. After ensuring the antenna cables are correctly routed, connect them to the appropriate wireless card. These connectors are typically snap-on types. They should be attached firmly to the card but not forced. Double-check that they're secured to the card and not at risk of being dislodged. With the antenna correctly routed and secured, the laptop should maintain robust wireless capabilities needed for optimal functionality. As for webcam and microphone placement within a modern laptop, their design serves both function and form, but it also presents specific repair and maintenance considerations. The webcam is typically situated at the top of the display panel, often in the center to align with the user's point of view during video calls. This location is chosen not only for user convenience, but also to allow for the most natural interaction possible. Additionally, the microphone is frequently located on either side of the webcam and is intended to capture the user's voice with clarity while minimizing the pickup of keyboard and ambient noises. When repairing or replacing these components, it is critical to handle the associated cables and connectors with care. These are often delicate and can be easily damaged. The routing of these cables is carefully planned to avoid interference with other components and to prevent the risk of crimping, which can lead to hardware failure. In the case of the webcam, any misalignment during installation can result in an obstructed view or a camera that points in the wrong direction, impairing its functionality. For the microphone, improper placement can lead to suboptimal sound capture, reducing the quality of voice transmission. Next up, we have the touchscreen and digitizer. These components work in tandem to allow users to interact directly with the images displayed on the screen. The digitizer is a transparent layer that sits above the actual display screen and is responsible for detecting touch input. When a user taps, swipes, or performs any gesture on the device, it's the digitizer that captures the physical motion and translates it into digital signals. Below the digitizer is the actual display screen, which outputs the visual content. It doesn't detect touch by itself. That's the digitizer's job. But without the display, the user wouldn't have visual feedback for their interactions. This seamless integration of the display screen and the digitizer is what makes the user interface of mobile devices incredibly intuitive and easy to use, but also a bit more difficult to repair if damaged. And if we didn't have enough crammed into the display case already, let's add one more component to the list. Inverters. An inverter is primarily found in older laptop models. The inverter's role is to convert the low-voltage DC power from the laptop's battery or power supply to the high-voltage AC power used in older, non-LED backlights. This power conversion process was essential for illuminating the screen so that the display is visible. In terms of location, 
The inverter is usually placed at the bottom of the laptop screen, often within the screen bezel itself. It's a small, thin board that connects directly to the lower part of the LCD screen. With the advent of LED backlit displays, inverters have become obsolete. Exam Objective 1.3 Given a scenario, set up and configure accessories and ports of mobile devices. Mobile Device Accessories In today's IT landscape, Mobile device accessories are not just add-ons but essential tools that extend the capabilities of the primary devices they accompany. They serve as a bridge, enhancing user interaction and operational efficiency, and are a testament to the personalized nature of modern technology. Though there are many mobile device accessories available, for this video, we will stick to the accessories listed in the CompTIA A plus Core 1 exam objectives. First up, we have touch pens. Touch pens, also known as stylus devices, have revolutionized the way we engage with our touchscreen gadgets. They go beyond mere pointing devices, delivering an unmatched finesse that mimics the natural writing experience on digital screens. These slender, pen-like instruments transform the glassy surface of a mobile device screen into a canvas or notepad, merging the analog and digital realms. Touch pens come in two primary varieties, passive and active. Passive touch pens, which operate without a battery, function by conducting the user's electrical charge directly to the touchscreen, much like a finger would. They are simpler and lack the advanced features of their counterparts, but are valued for their consistent readiness and affordability, making them apt for basic tasks like screen navigation and simple drawing. Conversely, Active touch pens require a battery to enable sophisticated features such as pressure sensitivity and electronic erasing. These features enrich experiences with digital art and handwriting recognition. But when the battery drains, these pens must be recharged or have their batteries replaced to continue their advanced touchscreen interaction. Moving on to audio accessories like headsets and speakers, these devices are indispensable for amplifying the quality and versatility of built-in audio components in our mobile devices. While most mobile and computing devices come with their own speakers and microphones, external headsets and speakers offer a significant enhancement. They deliver superior sound quality, richer bass, and clearer treble, transforming the way we enjoy media by providing a more immersive and dynamic audio experience. Headsets, particularly with their noise-canceling capabilities and dedicated microphones, can greatly improve upon the clarity and privacy of audio and video calls, ensuring that communication is crisp and uninterrupted even in noisy environments. Also, should you wish to use one of these accessories, ensure that the correct audio output and input devices are selected in your device settings. This selection process is what activates the advanced functionalities of these accessories, allowing them to take precedence over the more limited built-in audio components. By consciously choosing the right output and input within the settings menu, users dictate where their sound is directed and from where their voice is captured. Transitioning from audio to visual, external webcams play a pivotal role in enhancing video-based experiences on mobile devices. They surpass most built-in webcams by offering improved resolution, enhanced performance in low-light conditions, and more accurate color representation. For optimal performance, it's important to secure external webcams on a stable and level surface. This prevents the video feed from shaking or wobbling. The ability to adjust the webcam's angle and position also allows for better control over how things appear on the other end of the video capture, which can be adjusted to suit the framing and lighting of your environment. Additionally, careful management of the webcam's access is necessary to avoid technical glitches. When multiple applications attempt to access the webcam simultaneously, it can lead to conflicts that disrupt the video feed, ensuring that only one application has permission to use the webcam at a time can mitigate such issues. 
Last up, we have drawing pads and trackpads, also referred to as touchpads. These devices provide a level of control and comfort that often surpasses that of a traditional mouse, offering a more natural and intuitive way to interact with your computer. Trackpads, with their gesture-based inputs, are particularly useful for navigating through content quickly. While drawing pads are indispensable for artists and designers, translating hand-drawn art directly onto the digital canvas. However, to function properly, these devices need to be turned on and calibrated. Without correct calibration, you might experience ghost cursor movements or pointer drift, where the cursor moves on its own accord or doesn't accurately track your finger or stylus movements. This can be frustrating and counterproductive, especially when precision is required. Regularly calibrating your trackpad or drawing pad can alleviate these issues, ensuring that every movement is captured as intended and that your device responds accurately to your input. Moreover, when integrating a trackpad into your workflow, it's essential to ensure that it is actually enabled, as connecting an external mouse or modifying system preferences can potentially disable it. To avoid confusion, regularly check your device's settings, particularly after connecting or disconnecting external peripherals, and manually toggle the trackpad on if necessary. And for one last tidbit of information, FN keys or function keys on a laptop serve as shortcuts to perform specific tasks more efficiently. They are usually found in the top row of the keyboard and work in tandem with the FN key. One practical use of FN keys is to control the laptop's built-in features, such as adjusting volume, screen brightness, or as it applies to our current topic, toggling the trackpad on or off. Exam Objective 1.3 Given a scenario, set up and configure accessories and ports of mobile devices. Mobile Device Connections Mobile devices may be great as a standalone computing device, but the true magic really happens when they reach out and connect with other devices and accessories. In this video, we will discuss some common wired and wireless connection types used by various mobile devices. Let's begin with USB or Universal Serial Bus Connections. USB is a wired peripheral device interface standard that allows for data transfer and device charging, and the ports come in several form factors. Some of the most common form factors for mobile devices include USB-C, micro-USB, and mini-USB. USB-C, known for its reversible design, is the latest and most versatile, allowing for faster data transfer and charging. As for the micro-USB and mini-USB, these are older but still prevalent. Another common wired connection type is the Lightning Connector. Lightning is a wired peripheral device interface standard that is exclusive to Apple devices and allows for data transfer and device charging. It's a sleek, small connector that can be used for various tasks, like transferring files from an Apple phone to a workstation. Such a task could be accomplished by simply plugging one end into your iPhone and the other into the USB port of your computer. Do so, and you will be ready to transmit data. Next, we have serial interfaces. These are a type of communication interface that transmits data sequentially, one bit at a time, over a single communication line. While they may seem primitive when compared to newer technologies, their role in networking is still important. They are primarily used to connect to the console ports of network devices like switches and routers, such console ports provide network administrators direct access to a device's operating system. By connecting a laptop to the console port of a network device with a serial cable, IT professionals can issue configuration commands directly to the device. Switching away from wired connection types, we will now cover a few wireless connection options used by mobile devices. And first up for the wireless category, we have Near Field Communication, or NFC. NFC is a wireless networking interface standard that uses radio frequencies to share data over a short distance of a few centimeters or inches. 
This short-range wireless connectivity enables various convenient functions like authentication and mobile payments. For example, by simply tapping your device to a reader, you can authenticate access or complete purchases quickly and securely. Now we have Bluetooth, a wireless networking interface and peripheral device interface standard that uses radio frequencies to share data over a short distance of a few meters or yards. This technology allows mobile devices to effortlessly connect with peripherals such as wireless headphones, portable speakers, and keyboards, eliminating the need for cables. Bluetooth enables a clutter-free, hands-free experience. Additionally, it supports various functions like file sharing, audio streaming, and voice commands, which serves to amplify the capabilities of connected devices, creating a cohesive and more productive personal tech environment. And for our last mobile device connection method, we have Hotspot. Hotspot is a game changer, transforming your mobile device into a wireless access point. Other devices can connect to the internet through your mobile device's data connection, offering a lifeline when traditional Wi-Fi networks are out of reach. Exam Objective 1.3. Given a scenario, set up and configure accessories and ports of mobile devices. Port Replicator. A port replicator is a device that plugs into a laptop or other mobile device and provides additional ports for peripherals, but does not provide additional features. With that said, they typically plug directly into these mobile devices through a USB, USB-C, or Thunderbolt port to multiply the number of available connections. Essentially, it allows a laptop to interface with a variety of peripherals that would typically be connected to a desktop computer, providing an array of ports such as USB, HDMI, Ethernet, and sometimes more specialized ports like serial or parallel ports, depending on the model. The convenience of a port replicator lies in its ability to consolidate connections. For individuals who alternate between multiple workspaces or those who are frequently on the move, the replicator becomes a stationary hub to which all peripherals are connected. When the user arrives at their workspace, they can connect their laptop to the replicator with a single cable, immediately integrating with all the connected devices. This is not only a time saver, but also reduces the physical wear and tear on the laptop's ports from repeatedly plugging and unplugging peripherals. With the trend of making laptops thinner and lighter, many models sacrifice the number of available ports, which can limit functionality. Port replicators address this limitation by providing the extra ports that users need without the need for internal hardware upgrades or external attachments. Additionally, they have become more advanced over time, with the latest models supporting USB 3.0, USB-C, and Thunderbolt connections for faster data transfer, providing outputs for high-definition displays, and offering power delivery to charge the laptop while it's connected. For professionals, students, or anyone who uses their laptop for various tasks and needs to connect multiple devices, a port replicator is a valuable investment. It transforms the laptop into a dynamic workstation that mimics the connectivity of a desktop computer, enhancing productivity and making it easier to work efficiently in any location. The streamlined setup enabled by a port replicator is a simple yet powerful solution for maximizing the potential of portable devices in today's mobile-first world. Exam Objective 1.3 Given a scenario, Set up and configure accessories and ports of mobile devices. Docking Station A docking station is a device that plugs into a laptop or other mobile device and provides additional ports for peripherals and provides additional features. This is very similar to the port replicator with that one difference of providing additional features, not just additional ports. Docking stations elevate the functionality of mobile computing devices by incorporating these feature enhancements, which can range from additional storage and improved audio to advanced video graphics capabilities. 
The key to a docking station's ability to offer these enhancements lies in its connection to the mobile device. Using high-speed interfaces like Thunderbolt or proprietary connectors, docking stations can transfer data, power, and video signals simultaneously through a single cable. This robust connection allows the docking station to not only increase the number of available ports, but also to augment the device's capabilities significantly. One of the primary additional features of a docking station is the inclusion of its own power supply which allows it to charge the connected laptop directly. This power can also support more power-hungry peripherals that a port replicator cannot handle due to its reliance on the laptop's power resources. Furthermore, docking stations can host additional hardware like dedicated graphics cards, which empower laptops to perform tasks that are graphically intensive, such as video rendering or gaming, far beyond the laptop's built-in capabilities. Docking stations also often come with added storage in the form of built-in hard drives or SSD, providing not just extra space, but also the possibility of enhanced data processing speeds. Some even have their own network ports for faster internet connections, multiple video ports that support high-resolution external monitors, and advanced audio ports for high-fidelity sound systems. These additional features make docking stations particularly suitable for power users who need more than just extra USB ports or a simple video output extension. They cater to those who need to transform their laptop into a fully-fledged desktop computing environment when at the office or home, but still require the flexibility to undock and go mobile at a moment's notice. Exam Objective 1.3 Given a scenario, Set up and configure accessories and ports of mobile devices. KVM switch. While you won't find this topic in the exam objectives, it is a part of the list of acronyms you should know. So why not cover it now? First off, KVM stands for keyboard, video, and mouse. A KVM switch is a device that allows you to control multiple computers from a single keyboard, video monitor, and mouse. Imagine a scenario where an IT professional needs to manage several servers housed in a server room. Instead of needing a separate monitor, keyboard, and mouse for each server, a KVM switch allows the professional to switch control from one machine to another with the push of a button or a keyboard shortcut, thereby saving space, reducing clutter, and increasing efficiency. So how does a KVM switch compare to a port replicator or docking station? While they might seem similar at first glance, their purpose and functionality are quite distinct. A port replicator is a device that allows a laptop to connect with multiple peripherals through a single plug or connection, essentially replicating ports to accommodate more devices. A docking station, on the other hand, not only provides this replication, but may also offer additional features like extra storage, charging capabilities, and more robust connectivity options. Both port replicators and docking stations are designed to enhance the connectivity of a single computer. In contrast, a KVM switch is focused on controlling multiple computers from one set of peripherals, which is a different function altogether. In the IT world, KVM switches are invaluable. They are widely used in data centers, server rooms, and by IT professionals who need to manage multiple systems simultaneously. Whether it's for routine maintenance, troubleshooting, or monitoring different systems, a KVM switch streamlines the process by allowing for quick and seamless switching between computers without the need for physical movement or the hassle of multiple sets of input devices. This efficiency is particularly crucial in environments where downtime or delays can have significant impacts. Exam Objective 1.4 Given a scenario, configure basic mobile device network connectivity and application support. Cellular Connectivity Cellular connectivity refers to the technology that allows mobile phones and other mobile devices to communicate over long distances without wires. 
It employs a complex system of radio waves transmitted by cell towers strategically placed to cover as much geographical area as possible. When you make a call, send a text, or use your mobile data to browse the internet, your device sends and receives signals to and from these towers. This technology operates on various frequencies and channels, carefully managed to allow numerous people to use their phones simultaneously without interference. It's a dynamic and robust system that seamlessly hands off your connection from one cell tower to another as you move, maintaining a continuous link. This is what enables you to stream a video on the move or start a call in one location and continue it uninterrupted as you travel. Now, let's break down the generations of cellular technology. 2G, or second generation, was one of the earliest forms of mobile internet. It was sufficient for calls and basic texting, which was revolutionary in its time, but it's quite slow by today's standards. Next came 3G, which brought speeds that made mobile web browsing and video streaming a reality. It was a significant leap from 2G, offering faster data transfer rates and improved capacity. 4G stands for fourth generation and is where we really began to see mobile internet speeds comparable to that of wired connections. With 4G high-definition video streaming, gaming, and advanced telecommunications became widely accessible to mobile devices. And now we have 5G, the current latest and greatest. It's a game changer with its incredibly high speed and capacity and low latency. This means not only can you do everything you did on 4G much faster, but it also opens the door to new technologies like augmented reality and autonomous vehicles. As we progress from 2G to 5G, each generation improves upon the last, offering faster speeds, more reliable connections, and supporting more devices at once. Understanding the ins and outs of cellular connectivity extends to the practical ability to control a mobile device's connection to a cellular network too. When you enable a cellular connection, your device can make calls, send texts, and access the internet via your mobile service provider or carrier. This connection is essential for staying in touch and online when Wi-Fi isn't available. However, there are times when you might want to disable the cellular data connection. Turning off cellular data can help save on battery life and avoid extra charges, especially while traveling. It's also a quick step to secure your device by stopping all cellular data traffic if needed. To accomplish this, most mobile devices will allow you to toggle the connection on or off within the device settings menu. Exam Objective 1.4 Given a scenario, configure basic mobile device network connectivity and application support. GSM versus CDMA. In the previous video, we discussed cellular connectivity, exploring how our mobile devices keep us connected on the go. Building upon that foundation, this video will pivot our discussion to two prevalent types of cellular networks that you might encounter, GSM and CDMA. These acronyms might sound technical, but they're simply different methods of achieving the same goal, keeping you connected with the world, whether you're making a call or browsing the internet. First up, I will define GSM or Global System for Mobile Communications. This is a standard that defines protocols for digital cellular networks used by mobile phones and other devices. Introduced in 1991, GSM is a widely used mobile network technology known the world over, hence global is in the acronym. It standardized network communication and facilitated international roaming agreements between mobile device carriers, enabling users to use their mobile device in various parts of the world. GSM networks utilize a SIM card or subscriber identity module card to identify the user to the network allowing them to switch devices simply by moving the SIM card to a new device. As for CDMA, or Code Division Multiple Access, this digital cellular technology uses spread-spectrum radio communications. Without getting too technical, 
CDMA is like having a personalized path from your mobile device straight to the network tower. With CDMA, your identity is tied to your device, making it the linchpin of your service. This approach has traditionally meant that changing devices would require assistance from your service carrier. While popular in the United States, CDMA has a legacy of providing robust service, especially in less populated areas. For you, as you prepare for the CompTIA A Plus Core 1 certification exam, remember GSM is noted for its flexibility, enabled by the use of SIM cards that facilitate easy device switching and international roaming, while CDMA is recognized for its robust network stability and wide coverage area, which is particularly advantageous in rural locations, though switching devices can be a bit more complex. Exam Objective 1.4 Given a scenario, configure basic mobile device network connectivity and application support. PRL. A preferred roaming list, or PRL, is a list that contains various frequency bands and service provider ID, helping devices determine which network to connect to, especially when roaming. To understand this definition better, imagine you're traveling abroad and your mobile phone seamlessly connects to local networks, allowing you to make calls, send texts, and browse the internet. This magic happens because of the PRL. This list effectively tells your device which cellular towers it should connect to, ensuring you have service, even when you're away from your home network. Now, why is the PRL so important? For travelers, the PRL ensures that you remain connected without the need for any manual input. This is not just convenient, but also essential for safety and connectivity. In general, a current and well-managed PRL can save costs for service providers and customers by avoiding roaming on higher cost networks. So, how does the PRL work? When you turn on your device, it checks the PRL to find which towers it should connect to for the best signal. This process is automatic and happens every time the device searches for a signal, ensuring that you are always connected to the preferred network. The list is prioritized, so if a top choice isn't available, the device moves down the list until it finds a suitable one. For IT professionals, knowing how to update the PRL is an important skill. This can usually be done with a simple update from your network provider, ensuring that your device's list is current, which is particularly important after traveling since new towers and network alliances are constantly established. To perform an update, head on over to the mobile device's settings menu. From here, you can initiate an update manually. Look for an option that says Update PRL or Roaming Update. Select this option to initiate the update process. Once you've initiated the update, your device will connect to the carrier's network and search for any available PRL updates. If one is available, it will be downloaded and applied. Depending on your carrier and the specific device, you might see a progress bar or just a notification indicating that the update was completed successfully. After restarting the device, you will be good to go. Exam Objective 1.4 Given a scenario, configure basic mobile device network connectivity and application support. Hotspot A mobile device hotspot is your gateway to the internet when traditional network connections are just out of reach. For instance, imagine you are in a cafe that doesn't offer Wi-Fi, but you urgently need to send an email from your laptop. This is where your smartphone could come to the rescue. By enabling the hotspot feature, your smartphone uses its cellular data connection to create a personal Wi-Fi network. You can then connect your laptop to this network, allowing your laptop to access the internet just as if it were connected to a regular Wi-Fi or wired network with little time and effort required. To begin setting up a mobile device hotspot, you can start with your smartphone. First, enable the hotspot feature by going to the settings menu and enable the hotspot option. Once you do this, your smartphone will begin broadcasting a Wi-Fi signal. Once your smartphone's hotspot is active, take your laptop and open the Wi-Fi network list. 
Your smartphone's network name should appear here. Select it. Now your laptop will be connected to the internet via your smartphone's data connection. This seamless connectivity allows you to use your laptop to browse the internet, stream content, or attend virtual meetings, leveraging the mobile data from your phone. Just remember, while connected, your laptop is using your phone's data plan, so be mindful of your data usage to avoid incurring any fees. Now this is just one way in which to set up a hotspot. There are many other hotspot arrangements that can be utilized depending on the specific use case. I just walked you through the scenario, as it tends to be the most commonly used method. Now for a little housekeeping. When maintaining a hotspot, keep in mind that it can drain your mobile device's battery more quickly, so it may be wise to keep it plugged into a charger during extended use. When you're finished and no longer need the hotspot, don't forget to turn it off on your smartphone to save data and battery life and to keep your connection secure. This is done by simply returning to the settings menu and toggling the hotspot feature off. Exam Objective 1.4 Given a scenario, configure basic mobile device network connectivity and application support. Bluetooth pairing Bluetooth is a wireless technology that allows the exchange of data between different devices. With Bluetooth, you can connect devices like smartphones, computers, headphones, speakers, and even car audio systems without the hassle of wires. It's a technology that's all about convenience, enabling things like listening to music on wireless headphones or sharing files quickly between devices. But to do this, you first need to know a bit more about Bluetooth pairing. Pairing is the process of establishing a secure wireless connection between two Bluetooth-enabled devices so they can communicate with each other. And the process starts by enabling Bluetooth connections in the settings menu of your mobile device. Once your Bluetooth antenna is enabled and connections are allowed, the next step in the pairing process begins with placing the Bluetooth device you want to connect with into pairing mode. This is usually done by holding a button on the device, such as a long press on the power button of Bluetooth headphones. This puts the device into a state where it actively looks to connect with other Bluetooth-enabled devices. Next, you'll go back to the first device and search for available devices. This is generally done within the Bluetooth settings page, where you can scan for new devices. Once the second device appears on the list, you can select it to initiate the pairing process. Sometimes, you may need to enter a PIN code to complete the pairing. In the Bluetooth pairing process, entering a PIN code is an additional security measure to ensure that only users with the correct permissions can establish a connection between devices. The necessity of entering this code prevents unauthorized users from connecting to your device because, without the correct PIN, the connection cannot be completed. This step is particularly important when pairing devices in public spaces where multiple Bluetooth devices might be present, and the risk of an unintended or malicious connection is higher. After the devices are paired, they'll remember each other unless you choose to disconnect them or remove the pairing meaning you won't have to go through the setup process every time. Lastly, disabling Bluetooth on your device is a straightforward way to conserve battery life and increase security. When you disable Bluetooth, you effectively cut off the wireless communication channel, ensuring that no Bluetooth connections can be made to your device without your consent. And to disable Bluetooth, just toggle the setting to the off position and you're done. Exam Objective 1.4 Given a scenario, configure basic mobile device network connectivity and application support. Location Services In today's interconnected world, mobile device location services are the invisible threads that weave together our digital experiences with the physical world. That is why this video will assist you in understanding how these services pinpoint our location and interact with the technology around us. Let's begin with the basics. GPS stands for Global Positioning System. It's a network of satellites orbiting Earth, 
which provide location and time information to a GPS receiver found in many devices like your smartphone or navigation unit in cars. Imagine it as a cosmic dance where satellites continuously broadcast their location and your device listens in. Using this information, it can determine its position on the globe. You can also consider GPS as an echolocation system where each signal bounce helps to map out where you are. Apart from GPS, cellular signals are also used for something known as device triangulation. This method utilizes the signal from cell towers. Your mobile device constantly communicates with nearby towers, and by measuring the strength of your signal to multiple towers, a location can be inferred. The more towers your device can see, the more precise the location. It's akin to finding the center point of a triangle when you know its three corners. Now that we know a little about how location services work, we should probably move on to the security aspect. Your applications often need to know your location to function correctly. For example, a weather app needs to know where you are in order to provide the forecast for your area. However, you have control over which apps can access this data in order to prevent application misuse. With each application, you have the power to grant or deny permissions to location data ensuring that only trusted applications have access to your location. Lastly, we have a few location settings to consider. These settings allow you to control the accuracy and the battery usage of your location services. The high accuracy mode uses both GPS and local cellular networks to determine your location. This is more precise but can consume more battery. Battery saving mode, on the other hand, uses only local cellular networks, not GPS, to save power. And the device-only mode relies solely on GPS and is useful when you are out of your service carrier's coverage area but still need location information. Exam Objective 1.4 Given a scenario, configure basic mobile device network connectivity and application support. MDM and MAEM Enterprise Mobility Management is a comprehensive approach to securing and enabling the use of mobile devices within a business setting. This management framework employs an array of services and technologies that are specifically designed to protect these devices, ensuring a clear separation between personal and corporate data and primarily consists of two main components, mobile device management and mobile application management. These functions work in tandem to enhance the management of mobile devices, aiding in their setup, the distribution of applications, the enforcement of company policies, and the protection of mobile access to enterprise resources. Adopting such a management framework is increasingly important in a landscape where employees access sensitive corporate data from a multitude of mobile devices and from various locations. This not only helps organizations safeguard security and adhere to compliance demands, but also boosts productivity and allows employees the flexibility to work remotely. As we look further into the intricacies of this management framework, we come to mobile device management. Mobile device management, or MDM, is a technology that allows IT administrators to control, secure, and enforce policies on mobile devices. It serves as a critical software component focused on the administration and oversight of the mobile devices themselves, ensuring that each device adheres to the enterprise's security requirements. Mobile device management enables the centralized management of device settings, ensuring that all mobile devices are configured to the organization's standards. A perfect example would be configuring corporate email accounts to use encrypted protocols only. It also allows for the monitoring and enforcement of compliance, like requiring two-factor authentication, as well as the ability to remotely lock, erase, or wipe the contents of a device that is lost or stolen, thereby protecting sensitive corporate information. Moving on, we have Mobile Application Management, or MAN. This is the process of controlling and securing access to corporate applications and the data within them on mobile devices. 
Mobile application management software is dedicated to the deployment, administration, and security of mobile apps on corporate and personally owned mobile devices. Unlike mobile device management, which controls the entire device, mobile application management focuses specifically on managing and securing corporate applications. To shed a little more light on this topic, mobile application management allows IT departments to control which users can access certain managed applications, safeguard company data within those apps, and manage updates and configurations of software across mobile devices. This management also includes the ability to wipe company data from individual applications without affecting personal data, providing an appropriate balance between user convenience and data security. Exam Objective 1.4 Given a scenario, configure basic mobile device network connectivity and application support. Mobile device synchronization. So what exactly does mobile device synchronization or syncing really mean? Well, it is the process of ensuring that the same data is available on all of your mobile devices, be it smartphones, tablets, or laptop computers. It is comparable to having an invisible link that keeps your data updated and available no matter which mobile device you're using. To start syncing, you need to set up an account on your mobile device. This could be your Apple ID if using iCloud, your Google account if you are working with Google Workspaces, or your email address in the case of Office 365. Additionally, entering your personal details, including a password, and agreeing to terms of service will be required. If you have any trouble during the account setup process, just recheck that your account credentials were accurately entered. After you set up your account, you get to choose the data you want to synchronize across your devices, which ensures that your information is updated and consistent. If you enable email sync, for instance, any action you take on an email, be it sending, receiving, or deleting, will be replicated on all your other devices. Similarly, activating PhotoSync means that any photos you take on your phone will automatically be available on your tablet or computer. For your calendar, any events you add or modify will also be synchronized across all your devices, so changes made on one will be reflected on the others. The same goes for contacts. A new contact added on your phone will automatically show up when you access your email on any other sync device. Remember, synchronization involves data transfer, which can add up quickly if you're syncing large files like photos or videos, and this could lead to extra charges if your mobile plan has a data cap. To circumvent this, always try to sync while connected to Wi-Fi or change your device settings to only sync when Wi-Fi is available thus saving your mobile data allowance. With the conclusion of this video, we have now reached the end of domain one of this CompTIA A plus core one training course. Great job on making it this far. Keep up the great work. Exam objective 2.1. Compare and contrast transmission control protocol or TCP and user datagram protocol or UDP ports, protocols, and their purposes. Networking Protocols With this video, we will be kicking off our study of the second domain of the CompTIA A plus Core 1 certification exam. This domain is all about computer networking. Networking in the context of IT refers to the practice of connecting two or more computing devices together by some form of transmission medium in order to share resources and information. This connection can be established over wired or wireless mediums and enables devices to communicate and transfer data efficiently. Networking forms the backbone of modern IT infrastructure, allowing for functionalities like internet access, file sharing, and collaborative work environments. Now, on to networking protocols. A network protocol is a set of rules and standards that govern the exchange of information between devices or systems. It defines how data is transmitted, received, interpreted, and acted upon during communication. Just as we follow social norms to interact with others effectively, 
Devices on a network adhere to specific protocols to ensure seamless communication. Think of protocols as a common language that devices use to understand and interpret each other's messages. Protocols also define how devices identify one another and how errors are handled. They provide a structured framework that allows devices to communicate in a reliable and standardized manner. Without protocols, communication across networks would be chaotic and prone to errors. Can you imagine trying to have a conversation where everyone is speaking a different language? Lastly, we'll discuss networking ports. A network port is a virtual point where network connections start and end. Ports are identified by port numbers, with each port number indicating a specific service or protocol. For instance, HTTP, the protocol for web traffic, typically uses port 80, while email sent by the SMTP protocol will use port 25 by default. Understanding ports is paramount in network configuration and security, as managing these ports can control the flow of data and protect against unauthorized access. By grasping these fundamental concepts of networking, protocols, and ports, you're well on your way to building a strong foundation in IT networking. This knowledge is not only important for your CompTIA A plus Core 1 exam, but also essential for a successful career in information technology. Exam Objective 2.1 Compare and Contrast Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, and User Datagram Protocol, or UDP, ports, protocols, and their purposes ports and protocols. In this video, we're going to explore some of the most common networking protocols and port numbers. Whether you're new to this topic or looking to refresh your knowledge, you're in the right place. My goal isn't to make you an expert by the end of this video, but to provide you with a basic understanding of each protocol's main purpose and their associated default port number as that will be sufficient enough knowledge for this stage in your certification journey. To kick things off, let's start with the File Transfer Protocol, commonly known as FTP. This is a standard network protocol designed for transferring files between devices over a network connection. Essentially, FTP enables users to upload files from their local computer to a remote server or download files from a server to their computer. While FTP is a popular choice for its efficiency in file transfer, it's important to note that it has significant security limitations, particularly because it does not encrypt data. FTP typically uses two ports, port 20 and port 21. Port 21 is used for establishing a connection between the client and the server, often referred to as the control port. Through this port, commands and responses are exchanged. Port 20, on the other hand, is known as the data port, and it's used for the actual transfer of files. The lack of encryption in FTP means that data, including potentially sensitive information like usernames and passwords, is transmitted in plain text. This makes it vulnerable to interception and unauthorized access. Moving on to the next protocol in the CompTIA A plus Core 1 exam objectives, we have Secure Shell or SSH. This protocol provides a secure method for accessing a remote computer or server. It's widely used for executing remote commands through the command line interface or CLI. SSH stands out for its robust security, encrypting all data to prevent unauthorized access. It primarily operates on port 22, which handles both the secure connection establishment and encrypted data transfers. This encryption ensures the confidentiality of all communications, including login details. Next up is Telnet, a protocol that shares many similarities with SSH, but with a key difference. It lacks security features. Telnet is another method used for accessing remote computers or servers, allowing users to remotely log into another computer over a network and execute commands. However, Telnet transmits all data, including login credentials, in plain text, making it susceptible to eavesdropping and unauthorized access. 
This lack of encryption starkly contrasts with SSH, which secures data transmission. Typically, Telnet operates on port 23. Its unsecured nature makes it less ideal for sensitive operations, especially in environments where data security is a priority. Continuing on, we have Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, or SMTP. This protocol is used for sending emails from a client to a server or between servers. When you compose an email and click send, your email client uses SMTP to transfer the email to the desired email server for delivery. There it is stored until the recipient checks their inbox. While SMTP effectively handles the sending of emails, it does not encrypt them, which can be a concern for confidentiality. As for the protocol's default port, it operates primarily on port 25. Next, we have Domain Name System, or DNS, which is a fundamental protocol of the Internet, often likened to a phone book for the World Wide Web. Its primary function is to translate domain names, which are easy for humans to remember, into IP addresses, which computers use to identify each other on the network. DNS operates mainly on port 53. This port is used for both querying DNS servers and receiving responses. For instance, when you type a website URL into your browser, DNS servers use port 53 to find the corresponding IP address and direct your request to the correct server. Let's now explore DHCP, or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. This network management protocol is used to, to automate the process of configuring devices on IP networks. Essentially, DHCP allows network devices, like computers and printers, to automatically obtain IP addresses and other necessary network configurations. This makes it much easier to manage large networks, where assigning IP addresses manually would be impractical. DHCP operates primarily on two ports port 67 and 68, and utilizes a four-step process known as DORA, discover, offer, request, and acknowledge to automate network configuration. Initially, a client device seeking network access sends a discover message on port 68, signaling its need for an IP address. A DHCP server, listening on port 67, responds with an offer message, proposing an available IP address and other configuration details. The client device then sends back a request message, essentially accepting the offered settings. Finally, the DHCP server completes the process by sending an acknowledge message, confirming the IP address and network settings assignment. Another protocol worth mentioning is TFTP, or Trivial File Transfer Protocol. TFTP is a simpler version of the traditional file transfer protocol, or FTP. It's designed to transfer files over a network in a more lightweight manner. TFTP is commonly used for tasks that require less complexity, like transferring small files or booting network devices. One of the key characteristics of TFTP is that it operates without guaranteed data packet delivery, which is a built-in feature of FTP. This makes TFTP faster, but less reliable. TFTP uses port 69 for transferring data. And for one more detail, just like FTP, TFTP lacks security features. It doesn't offer authentication or encryption, meaning the data transferred is vulnerable to interception and unauthorized access. Shifting our focus once again, we now have the Hypertext Transfer Protocol or HTTP. This protocol is the foundation of data communications across the World Wide Web. It's used for transmitting web content from web servers to web browsers. Whenever you enter a website URL or click on a web link, HTTP is the protocol facilitating that web page retrieval and display. HTTP typically operates on port 80 and is another protocol that does not offer encryption for its data which means that information sent and received through HTTP can potentially be intercepted and viewed by others. Next in our exploration of network protocols, 
we have another email protocol. This one is POP3, short for Post Office Protocol version 3, and is used for email retrieval. It's one of the oldest methods used by email clients to retrieve messages from an email server. When you set up your email account on a client, POP3 can be one of the protocols you choose for downloading your emails. Operating on port 110, POP3 is designed for simplicity and supports basic email functionalities. It allows the email client to download all messages from the server to the local device, and once downloaded, these emails are deleted from the server. This makes it a good option for users who prefer to access their emails from a single device. It's important to note that in its standard form, POP3 does not encrypt the email data it retrieves. This can pose a security risk, especially when accessing emails over unsecured or public networks. As we continue our exploration of network protocols, we turn our focus to NetBIOS, or Network Basic Input-Output System. This protocol is a key player in local area networks, primarily facilitating tasks like file sharing and printer access within smaller networks. NetBIOS operates using multiple ports, with each serving a specific function. Port 137 is designated for name services, essential for the identification of networked computers. Meanwhile, Port 139 is involved in session services, enabling the establishment and maintenance of network connections between devices. While NetBIOS is highly useful in small-scale network environments, it is not designed to handle the complexities of modern, large-scale internet networking. Now we have one more email protocol to cover. IMAP, or Internet Message Access Protocol, is a modern, synchronized way of handling emails. When you use IMAP, your email client remains connected to the email server. Instead of downloading and removing the emails, IMAP keeps your emails stored on the server while syncing them with your email client or multiple clients. If you haven't deduced this already, the main advantage of IMAP is that you can access your emails from multiple devices, like your workstation, laptop, or smartphone, and they'll always be in sync. Any changes you make on one device, like reading, replying, or deleting emails, are reflected on all your devices. Next, we have SNMP, or Simple Network Management Protocol. This protocol is used for monitoring and managing network devices and is instrumental in gathering information from and configuring various network devices like routers, switches, servers, printers, and more. SNMP is particularly valuable in large-scale network environments where constant monitoring and adjustments are necessary for maintaining network health and performance. SNMP primarily operates on ports 161 and 162 for sending requests from the manager to the managed devices or agents and receiving responses from these agent devices. Another protocol available for use is LDAP, or Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. This is a protocol used for managing and accessing information in a network. It's like a phone book for a network helping to organize and find information about network resources such as users and services. LDAP uses port 389 to communicate. It allows network administrators to quickly find and manage information about users and resources on their network. This is especially useful in large organizations with lots of users and network services. Now it is time to take another look at HTTP which is the protocol that facilitates communications across the World Wide Web or Internet. But this time we will add some security. HTTPS stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. It's essentially HTTP with an added layer of security. This protocol is used for secure communication across the World Wide Web. HTTPS encrypts the data being sent and received which is crucial for protecting sensitive information like logging credentials, personal information, and payment details. The primary port for HTTPS is port 443. 
When you visit a website with HTTPS, the connection between your browser and the web server is encrypted. This encryption helps to prevent eavesdroppers from being able to intercept the data being transferred, ensuring that your browsing and personal data remain private and secure. Great job for making it this far. Just two more protocols to go for this video. Next is SMB. SMB, which stands for Server Message Block, is a network communication protocol used primarily for providing shared access to files, printers, and serial ports among devices on a network. It's most commonly seen in Windows environments, where it facilitates the easy sharing of files and printers within a local area network. SMB commonly operates on port 445 with modern network configurations. One of the key features of SMB is its ability to allow computers within the same network to read and write to files and to request services from servers in a computer network. The protocol can also authenticate and authorize access to network resources, making it a versatile protocol for network administrators. And for our last protocol, we have RDP or Remote Desktop Protocol. This is another method used for accessing remote computers or servers, much like SSH and Telnet. It allows users to remotely log into another computer over a network connection. However, RDP stands out by providing a graphical user interface or GUI for the remote connection. This means that users can see and interact with the desktop environment of the remote computer as if they were sitting right in front of it. RDP is extensively used in corporate environments for remote administration, remote work, and providing IT support. RDP primarily operates on port 3389. It facilitates the full desktop experience, including support for Windows, graphics, and devices over a network connection. Exam Objective 2.1 Compare and Contrast Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, and User Datagram Protocol, or UDP, ports, protocols, and their purposes. TCP versus UDP. In the last video, we touched upon various network protocols which fall under the category of application protocols. Application protocols in networking dictate how data is exchanged between applications across a network. These protocols enable different software applications, often running on different machines, to communicate and share data seamlessly. To facilitate these application protocols, transport protocols like TCP and UDP come into play. These are more fundamental protocols that handle the actual process of data transmission over the network. They work by breaking down the data from application protocols into smaller data packets, transmitting these packets across the network, and then reassembling them at the destination. In essence, they provide the necessary infrastructure that enables application protocols to function effectively across diverse network environments. Although TCP and UDP share the common role of being transport protocols for network data transmission, their approaches to performing this task differ significantly. I will start by explaining a bit about TCP, also known as Transmission Control Protocol. When a device sends information using TCP, it establishes a connection with the recipient using a process referred to as a three-way handshake. This connection process is just like a phone call. You want to make sure the other person is on the line before you start talking. Once the connection is established, TCP checks whether all data packets are received and in the right order. If something is missing, the protocol is designed to request a resend. This check process ensures complete data integrity and guarantees data delivery. UDP, or User Datagram Protocol, on the other hand, is more like sending a postcard. It's fast and efficient, but doesn't guarantee that the postcard will reach its destination. UDP sends packets without establishing a connection, making it faster but less reliable than TCP. It's used when speed is more critical than accuracy, like live video streaming or online gaming.
where receiving data quickly is more important than getting every single packet. In conclusion, our exploration of TCP and UDP as transport protocols in networking reveals distinct differences in their functionalities. TCP is connection-oriented, establishing a reliable connection before data transmission, ensuring guaranteed delivery. This makes it ideal for application protocols that require data integrity and security, such as HTTPS for secure web browsing and SSH for secure remote connections. On the other hand, UDP operates in a connectionless manner where data is sent without establishing a connection, leading to non-guaranteed delivery. This is suitable for applications where speed is more critical than reliability such as DHTP for network configuration and TFTP for simple quick file transfers. Understanding these differences is crucial in choosing the right protocol for specific networking tasks, balancing the trade-offs between reliability and efficiency. Exam Objective 2.2 Compare and Contrast Common Networking Hardware this video is designed to give you a foundational understanding of key network devices and the knowledge essential for anyone aspiring to pass the CompTIA A plus Core 1 certification exam. To kick things off, I will start with a rather antiquated or outdated device, the Network Hub. The Hub is a basic networking device that connects multiple computers or other network devices together. When a hub receives data from one device, it broadcasts that data to all the other connected devices. As a visual, you can imagine a hub as a speaker making a public broadcast announcement, thus sending the same message to everyone in a room. By sending the same data to all computers inside a network, without distinguishing which device the data is meant for, the hub is inherently less efficient and less secure compared to more advanced devices like network switches. Due to these limitations, hubs are mostly obsolete. At the heart of any modern local area network, you are likely to find a network switch or maybe multiple switches if the network is large and complex. A switch is a network device that connects multiple devices within a local area network. It acts similarly to a network hub allowing devices like computers, printers, servers, or other end devices to communicate with each other by forwarding data packets on the same LAN, but with a few improvements. Think of a network switch as a traffic controller in a network. It receives data packets from one device and intelligently forwards them to the intended recipient, ensuring efficient and direct communication between devices within the network. Network switches commonly use Ethernet cables or CAT cables to connect end devices to the ports on the network switch and communicate using the Ethernet protocol. When a device wants to send data to a specific device within the LAN network, it encapsulates the data into a data packet. This data packet will contain the destination address, the sender's source address, and the actual data or payload being transmitted. This encapsulated data packet is then given the name Ethernet frame. The switch then receives the data packet and examines the destination address. It then uses this information to determine the best path or port to forward the packet to the intended device. This direct forwarding allows for fast and efficient communication between devices. Network switches fall into two primary categories unmanaged and managed switches. Unmanaged switches are the simpler option, providing basic connectivity without requiring any configuration. These plug-and-play devices are especially suitable for small networks, such as those in small office or home office environments. Typically, they come with a limited number of ports, with configurations of four or eight ports being the most common. This simplicity makes unmanaged switches an ideal choice for straightforward networking needs. Managed switches, on the other hand, are designed for larger, more complex networks. While they can function like unmanaged switches out of the box, they offer a significant advantage in terms of configurability. 
Administrators have the ability to access and configure these switches, allowing for the implementation of advanced features such as security protocols, network traffic control, and the segregation of different types of network traffic, like voice communications. This feature is particularly important in networks where ensuring the quality and reliability of specific traffic, like voice traffic, is paramount. Managed switches are frequently used in corporate environments and typically come equipped with a higher number of ports, often including 24, 48, or more, to accommodate a larger scale of network devices. Now, let's talk about the access point, or AEP. An access point, also called a wireless access point, is a network device that allows wireless communications between devices in a network. It connects Wi-Fi-enabled devices, such as laptops or smartphones, to the network. Access points are used to provide wireless connectivity in homes, offices, and public spaces, enabling mobility and flexibility in network access. It may be easier to think of a network access point as a wireless version of a switch. It acts as a bridge between devices and the network creating a wireless connection for them to communicate with each other. But how does a wireless access point work with other wired networks? Well, it's quite simple. The wireless access point takes the data packets it receives from devices such as smartphones, tablets, and laptops and transmits it wirelessly to the network. Similarly, it receives data from the network and sends it wirelessly to the devices connected to it this two-way communication allows devices to access the network and share information with each other seamlessly. Now, you might be wondering how devices connect to a wireless access point. Well, it's as easy as connecting to a Wi-Fi network. When you turn on your device's Wi-Fi, it scans for available wireless networks. And when it detects a wireless access point, it prompts you to connect to it. Once connected, you can access the network's resources and communicate with other devices in the network, just like you would in a wired network. So if an access point sounds a lot like a switch, you are right. An access point is just a wireless version of a switch that provides local device connectivity. By now, you may be realizing that computer networks are basically a digital highway connecting devices together to facilitate communication and resource share. And just as highways have intersections and signs to guide traffic, networks have switches to direct data packets. But switches are not the only devices used to control traffic. We also have network routers. A network router is a network device that directs data packets between different computer networks. Yes, this is similar to a switch, with the exception that a switch directs traffic within a local area network, and a router controls data packets entering or leaving a local area network. But how does a network router actually work? Well, when a device wants to send data to another device in a different network, it compiles a data packet. These data packets will contain a source IP address and a destination IP address. If the data packet has a destination IP address that is not located within the current network, the data packet will then seek out the router. The router examines the packet's destination address, much like reading a street sign, and determines the most efficient path for the data to reach its intended destination. To sum up a router, a router is a gateway sitting at the edge of a network's broadcast domain controlling inbound and outbound connectivity to other networks. These could be other directly attached local area networks, or more commonly, they are installed between a local area network and a wide area network connection like the one provided by an internet service provider or ISP. To close out this video, I have one more device to cover, the Sobo router. Having just covered the topics of network switch, access point, and router. I figured now would be a great time to discuss how these devices fit into a smaller setting of a home or a small business environment. The type of networking equipment used in a home or small business environment can be described as SOA, where SOMO stands for small office, home office. 
This particular type of network will commonly utilize a multifunction network device referred to as a Soho router, but don't let the name fool you. Though similar in some aspects, this is not like the enterprise-grade router we studied earlier in this exam objective. A Soho router can perform routing functions, but that is not all it can do. So let's break down the main components that make up a Soho router. First up, we have the network switch. You may recall that a network switch is a network device that connects multiple devices within a local area network. And yes, the Soho router has a built-in network switch. It may not have as many ports as an enterprise switch, but it will still function the same. The Soho router displayed here can only connect four computing devices together in an Ethernet LAN. The switch ports are the yellow RJ45 ports, located inside box number one. Next, we have the access point. As a refresher, the access point is a network device that allows wireless communications between devices in a network. And yes, the Soho router has a built-in access point too. It may not support as many wireless clients as an enterprise access point, but it will still function the same. The Soho router displayed here has an antenna inside box number two that can transmit and receive Wi-Fi signals. Lastly, let's talk about the router itself. The router is the gateway between your Soho network and the internet or ISP. That is where box number three comes in. This is your wide area network or WAN connection. Pretty cool how a Soho router seamlessly integrates all these components into one compact device. If you are dealing with a limited number of computing devices in your network, a Soho router would be the perfect choice to provide network connectivity. Exam Objective 2.2 Compare and Contrast Common Networking Hardware Patch Panel this video will cover an unsung hero in the networking world, the patch panel. A patch panel is a device containing ports used to manage and organize cable connections. It is a central location in a building's network system where all the network cables converge. It's typically a flat panel with numerous ports where network cables are plugged in. These panels provide a convenient and organized way of managing cable connections from different rooms or areas in a building in order to provide a connection to network devices like switches and routers. So, how does a patch panel function? Think of it as a switchboard operator. When a network cable from a computer or another device is connected to the panel, it doesn't directly communicate with other devices. Instead, it connects to another port that leads to a network switch or router. This setup allows for easy management of cable connections. If a device needs to be moved or connected to a different network segment, it's simply a matter of changing the patch cable connections of the panel, rather than rerunning the entire cable. In the realm of networking, a patch panel is a key component in ensuring both organization and flexibility commonly found in server rooms or network closets. Its primary role is to centralize all network cables from various endpoints into a single manageable location. This centralization simplifies many aspects of network management. Firstly, it streamlines the troubleshooting process. With all cables leading to one point, identifying and resolving issues becomes much easier and quicker as there's no need to trace individual cables through complex and often inaccessible routes. Secondly, when it comes to network maintenance or reconfiguration, a patch panel is invaluable. Adjustments, whether adding new devices or changing network layouts, can be done efficiently at the panel without the need to disturb the entire cable setup. Moreover, a patch panel helps in protecting the network's physical integrity by reducing the frequency of handling the actual network cables and devices, wear and tear are minimized. This leads to a more stable and durable network setup, enhancing overall network performance and longevity. Exam Objective 2.2 Compare and Contrast Common Networking Hardware Power over Ethernet 
Power over Ethernet, or POE, is a technology standard that allows network cables to simultaneously transmit data and power using a single network cable. In simpler terms, POE enables a single cable to provide both a data connection and electrical power to devices, such as wireless access points, IP cameras, and voice over IP phones. This means that instead of needing two separate cables, one for power and one for data, POE allows you to use just one cable for both purposes. So how does POE function? There are two primary ways, through a POE switch or a POE injector. A POE switch is a network switch that has the ability to provide power over ethernet to connected devices. When a compatible device is connected to a POE-enabled port, the switch detects it and automatically provides the appropriate power. On the other hand, a PoE injector is used when you don't have a PoE switch. It's a small device that adds power to the Ethernet cable and can be placed between the switch and the device to provide power along with the data. Now, when working with PoE, there are various PoE standards that you should be aware of, with the most common being 802.3AF, 802.3AT, and 802.3BT. The 802.3AF standard, often referred to as just POE, can deliver up to 15.4 watts of power per port. In contrast, the 802.3AT standard, known as POE+, provides up to 30 watts per port. More recently, the 802.3BT standard, also known as POE++, has been introduced. This latest standard can deliver even higher power over Ethernet, up to 60 watts per port with Type 3 devices and up to 90 watts with Type 4 devices. These varying standards are designed to ensure that devices and power sources can work together safely and effectively. Just be sure to match the power source with the power requirements of the connected device to avoid any compatibility issues and to ensure efficient operation. Exam Objective 2.2 Compare and Contrast Common Networking Hardware Network Firewall Let's imagine our computer network is a fortress. Just like a fortress has protective barriers and guards, a computer network needs a way to safeguard against unwanted intrusions and threats. This is where network firewalls come into play. A network firewall is a network security device that monitors and controls incoming and outgoing network traffic. So, how does a network firewall work? Well, it performs a data packet inspection for each packet that tries to pass through it, inspecting its source address, destination address, and content. It compares this information against a set of predefined security rules and policies. When a data packet arrives at the firewall, it undergoes a thorough evaluation against these security rules. If the data packet aligns with the allowed parameters set in the security rules, the firewall permits it to pass through. This enables legitimate data to flow uninterrupted towards its intended destination, maintaining the network's operational efficiency and communication needs. Conversely, if a data packet is found to be in violation of any of the established security rules, the firewall blocks the offending packet from entering or exiting the network. By preventing these harmful data packets from penetrating or leaving the network, the firewall plays an integral role in maintaining the overall security and integrity of the network infrastructure. The security rules and policies used by network firewalls are often implemented using a mechanism known as an Access Control List, or ACL. An ACL defines the specific criteria that determines whether network traffic will be allowed or denied by the firewall. Access Control Lists are essentially a set of rules that dictate what types of network traffic are permitted and what types should be blocked. As a data packet is received by a network firewall, the network firewall will compare the data packet against the security rules listed in its access control list. If the data packet does not match any of the allow rules in the access control list, the data packet will be denied. Then the next packet can be processed. 
The network firewall will again compare the data packet against the security rules listed in its access control list. If the data packet matches an allow rule in the access control list, the data packet will be permitted and forwarded on. Exam Objective 2.2 Compare and Contrast Common Networking Hardware Modern Modems Hold on one second while I try to connect. Just kidding. Some of you may have recognized that sound, but if you didn't, that was an old-school dial-up modem attempting to connect to an internet service provider. Dial-up used to be very common and very slow. Fortunately, today we have a few more modern connection methods available to us, each using their own special type of modem. Depending on the transmission medium and service connection type in use, there are many different types of modems that can be deployed. To ease into this topic, I will start with a basic definition. In networking, a modem, short for modulator demodulator, is a network device that converts data between digital formats used by computers and analog formats used over telephone lines or other communication channels. Now, before I go any further, I want to remind you that this course builds upon the topics covered in the CompTIA ITF Plus Certification Exam. Specific to this video, you should have the prerequisite knowledge of electrical signals as well as a basic understanding of cable, DSL, and fiber optic communications, all of which can be found in our free CompTIA ITF Plus Complete Training Course. With that said, I will now talk about cable modems. A cable modem modulates and demodulates cable TV signals to provide internet access. Your internet service provider sends internet data in one format that the cable modem then converts into another format that your computer or network can understand. This also happens in reverse for outgoing data. As for making a connection, a cable modem connects to your home through the same coaxial cable that brings in cable TV. It plugs into a cable outlet on one end and to a computer or router on the other end, usually via an Ethernet cable. Next, we have a digital subscriber line or DSL modem. DSL uses a separate frequency band on a traditional phone line for internet data transmissions so you can use the internet and phone simultaneously. The DSL modem modulates internet data into high-frequency signals for transmission over the telephone lines and demodulates incoming signals back into a format that your computer or network can comprehend. Hooking up a DSL modem involves connecting to the internet through your home's telephone line. It plugs into a telephone jack using a DSL filter and to a computer or router via an Ethernet cable. Lastly, we have an optical network terminal, or ONT. An ONT converts the optical signals transmitted via a fiber optic cable into electrical Ethernet signals that your computer network can utilize. This is similar to how DSL and cable modems work, but uses light signals instead of electrical signals over copper lines. An ONT is used exclusively with fiber optic internet connections. In order to provide a connection, the ONT connects to the ISB fiber optic network on one end and to your computer network on the other end. Exam Objective 2.2 Compare and Contrast Common Networking Hardware NIC A NIC or Network Interface Card is a common networking component that allows a computing device to connect to a network or another computing device and acts as a communication link, enabling the transfer of data. The primary function of a NIC is to convert the digital data generated by a computing device into an electrical or optical signal that can be transmitted as an output. Also, they need to be able to receive data by converting electrical and optical signals back into digital data as an input. NICs are diverse in form and function, offering different methods of connecting devices to networks. These cards are typically classified into two main categories, wired and wireless. 
Wired NICs rely on physical cables, such as Ethernet cables, to establish a network connection. This direct physical link generally allows for faster and more reliable data throughput rates. The use of cables ensures a stable connection, less susceptible to interference and signal loss, which is particularly important in environments where consistent and high-speed data transfer is critical. Wired NICs are commonly used in settings like corporate offices, data centers, and gaming where maintaining a robust and uninterrupted connection is a priority. Wireless NICs, on the other hand, utilize various wireless technologies like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC, or cellular networks. These technologies enable devices to connect to networks without the need for physical cabling, offering greater flexibility and mobility. While wireless NICs provide the convenience of untethered access to networks, they may face challenges such as signal interference, varying signal strength, and potentially lower data transfer rates compared to wired connections. They are ideal for devices where mobility is essential, such as laptops, smartphones, and tablets, and in environments where running cables is impractical or impossible. You can also classify NICs into two more groups. They can be integrated into the motherboard of a computer. We refer to these as onboard NICs, or they can be added as a separate expansion card or add-on card. An integrated NIC is built directly into the motherboard of the computer. It is already present and does not require any additional installation. This may seem like a benefit, but it does pose some restrictions as we lose the ability to upgrade in the future. Add-on NICs, however, can be easily replaced or upgraded. If you want to change or upgrade your network connection, you can simply remove the existing add-on NIC and install a new one. Exam Objective 2.2 Compare and Contrast Common Networking Hardware Software-Defined Networking Software-Defined Networking, or SDN, is an approach to computer networking that allows network changes to be implemented using software applications. Instead of manually adjusting the physical devices that make up the network, SDN allows network administrators to use software programs to manage the network. This makes it easier and faster to adjust and control various aspects of the network as needed. In the context of networking, and especially relevant to our current topic of software-defined networking, the concepts of the data plane and control plane are fundamental. So let's break them down. The control plane is the part of a network that decides where the data should go. In traditional networks, each networking device, like a router or switch, has its own control plane, which means they make their own decisions about where to send data based on the device's configuration and network protocols. In software-defined networking, the control plane is separated from the individual devices and is centralized, typically in a controller or a set of controllers. This centralized control plane makes decisions about the network traffic and then instructs the devices on how to handle this traffic. As for the data plane, this is the part of the network that is actually responsible for moving data packets from one point to another. In other words, it's the part that does the work of transferring data based on the instructions it receives. In traditional networks, the data plane is integrated into the network devices and is responsible for both forwarding data and making decisions about where to send it. In software-defined networking, however, the data plane is simplified and only focuses on the forwarding of data based on the instructions it receives from the centralized control plane. In an SDN environment, this separation of the control and data planes allows for more flexible and efficient network management. The control plane can make global, network-wide decisions and then use the data plane to carry out these decisions, leading to a more responsive and adaptable network infrastructure. Exam Objective 2.3 Compare and Contrast Protocols for Wireless Networking Wireless Frequencies Imagine wireless signals as invisible waves carrying data through the air. These waves have different frequencies, which determine how they behave and what tasks they excel at. 
A signal frequency is a measurement of how fast a wave moves up and down. Think of a bouncing ball. And you counting how many times it bounces up and down in one second. Signal frequency is similar. It measures how many times a wave goes up and down in one second. If it moves up and down quickly, it has a high frequency. But if it moves up and down slowly, it has a low frequency. Signal frequencies are usually measured in hertz, which represents the number of cycles per second. The electromagnetic spectrum chart behind me shows the entire range of electromagnetic frequencies. This is just to give you an idea of the vast nature of wireless signal frequencies. But we are going to hone in on the two main ranges or frequency bands used in wireless networking. These frequency bands are the 2.4 GHz band and the 5 GHz band. The first frequency band we will discuss is the 2.4 GHz band. It's like a slow but steady marathon runner. The 2.4 GHz band offers better range, meaning it can travel further. This characteristic makes it ideal for providing Wi-Fi coverage in larger spaces. The 2.4 GHz band can also penetrate solid objects like walls more effectively. However, since it's quite popular, the 2.4 GHz band can get crowded, leading to potential interference from other devices that also use this frequency. Now, let's meet our speedy sprinter, the 5 GHz band. It may not travel as far as the 2.4 GHz band, but it offers faster and more reliable connections over shorter distances. Due to its higher frequency, the 5 GHz band can handle more data, making it ideal for higher bandwidth tasks like HD video streaming, online gaming, and file transfers. Additionally, since the 5 GHz band is less crowded, it experiences less interference, providing a smoother and more consistent Wi-Fi experience. Exam Objective 2.3 Compare and Contrast Protocols for Wireless Networking Wireless Channels In this video, we will further break down the 2.4 GHz band and the 5 GHz band into wireless frequency channels. Imagine tuning into a radio station where each station is set to a specific frequency for clear reception. Similarly, in wireless networking, a wireless frequency channel is a designated band of frequencies used for transmitting and receiving data, each separated in order to prevent interference and ensure smooth communications. In wireless computing, we primarily deal with two frequency ranges. 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz ranges. When it comes to the 2.4 GHz range, it is divided into 14 separate channels, each 22 MHz wide, with typically only channels 1 through 11 being available for use in most countries. This range is widely used due to its compatibility with numerous devices and its ability to penetrate solid objects, offering a good range. A key aspect of the 2.4 GHz band is the width of its channels. Since each channel is 22 MHz wide and the frequency separation between each channel is only 5 MHz, adjacent channels overlap. This overlap can lead to interference and degraded wireless performance. However, the following channels in the 2.4 GHz range, labeled as channels 1, 6, and 11, are uniquely spaced so that they do not overlap with each other. By using these non-overlapping channels in areas with multiple wireless networks, such as densely populated residential or commercial areas, interference can be significantly reduced, ensuring more stable and efficient wireless communication. Now with the 5 GHz band, we experience faster data transmissions and less signal interference. This band depending on your country, will have 20-plus non-overlapping channels available for use, with each channel being 20 MHz wide. However, through channel bonding, these 20 MHz channels can be merged to form wider channels of 40, 80, or even 160 MHz. This channel bonding process enhances data throughput, making it ideal for applications that require high bandwidth.
With these frequency bands, it is also important to understand that various regions around the world have distinct regulations and restrictions on these frequency ranges. This is primarily to manage and minimize interference between different wireless services. Additionally, these regulations are in place to ensure public safety by preventing disruption in critical communication services, such as those used by emergency responders. These regulations may include broadcast power limits or channel restrictions, and adhering to these regional regulations is essential for the optimal and legal operation of wireless networks and devices. Exam Objective 2.3 Compare and Contrast Protocols for Wireless Networking Why FOT? When discussing wireless networks, the technology that most commonly comes to mind is Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, short for wireless fidelity, is a technology that allows computing devices, such as smartphones, laptops, and tablets, to connect to and communicate with other devices wirelessly. It facilitates the transmission of data over short distances using radio waves. Typically, this occurs within the confines of a home, a small office, or in public spaces, like cafes and airports. The process begins when a device connects to a wireless access point, which serves as a bridge between the device and a larger network. This connection is established using specific frequency bands, primarily the 2.4 GHz or 5 GHz frequency bands, which are part of the electromagnetic spectrum reserved for Wi-Fi communications. Now that we have a definition for Wi-Fi, we can move on to wireless standards. There have been multiple standards since Wi-Fi came onto the scene in 1997, with each standard being developed by the IEEE. So I guess the next thing to do is to explain what IEEE is. IEEE is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. They're a professional association known for developing technical standards and they do so across various industries, including networking and telecommunications. Now we know who develops the standards for Wi-Fi. I guess we are getting warmer. But we don't have the complete picture yet. Out of all the standards compiled by the IEEE, the numerically labeled 802 set of standards are the standards that pertain to local area networks or LAN communications. From here, we need to break open and look at a small subset of the 802 standards. This subset of standards that we will be focusing on for now is labeled 802.11. 802.11 is all about Wi Fi, how it works, and what makes it tick. Or, more technically speaking, 802.11 is an evolving family of specifications for wireless local area networks or WLANs. With that in mind, the next video in this training course will have us stepping through each of the 802.11 standards that you are going to need to know about for your CompTIA A plus Core 1 certification exam. Exam Objective 2.3 Compare and Contrast Protocols for Wireless Networking 802.11 The first Wi-Fi standard came about in 1997 with the introduction of the IEEE 802.11 standard. With Wi-Fi, we could now connect to the internet and communicate with each other without the need for physical cables. And over the past few decades, this has completely transformed the way we live and work. So let's briefly journey through the evolution of Wi-Fi as we explore the timeline of 802.11 standards that have shaped the wireless connectivity we know today. After the most basic 802.11 standard was released in 1997, demand skyrocketed and newer, more robust Wi-Fi standards were needed. So naturally, we got an upgrade. In 1999, the 802.11a standard was released. This Wi-Fi standard, though not the first, was responsible for solidifying Wi-Fi as the predominant communication standard for short-range wireless computer networking. This standard operates in the 5 GHz frequency band and was one of the first to offer higher throughputs, capable of reaching up to 54 megabits per second. 
Not even a year later, in the fall of 1999, we were given 802.11b. This standard uses the 2.4 GHz frequency band, which is more prone to interference but offers better range than 5 GHz. As for its maximum throughput, it taps out at 11 megabits per second. Following 802.11b, the 802.11g standard was released in 2003. It also operates in the 2.4 GHz band but brought a notable increase in throughput, up to 54 megabits per second, matching the speed of 802.11a while retaining the better range of the 2.4 GHz frequency band. This was followed by the 802.11n standard, which was introduced in 2009. This standard offers more versatility than its predecessors, operating in both the 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz frequency bands. It also came with a huge improvement in throughput, due to the introduction of multiple input, multiple output, or MIMO technology. MIMO is a groundbreaking Wi-Fi technology that uses multiple antennas to enable simultaneous data streams at once. This technology fundamentally changes how data is transmitted and received. MIMO works by transmitting different data packets over multiple antennas simultaneously, effectively creating several parallel streams of data. This results in a substantial boost in throughput and efficiency. The 802.11n standard can support up to four MIMO streams, with each stream capable of a theoretical maximum throughput of 150 megabits per second. Therefore, with four streams, the total potential throughput can reach up to 600 megabits per second, blowing away the previous standards. The next standard we will cover is 802.11ac. This may also be referred to as Wi-Fi 5, as it represents the fifth generation of Wi-Fi technology. This standard was released in 2013 and operates exclusively in the 5 GHz frequency band, but is often paired with 802.11n to support the 2.4 GHz frequency band as well. Additionally, with this new generation of Wi-Fi, we received another massive increase in throughput with theoretical maximums now reaching 6.9 gigabits per second. And if that weren't enough, this standard also received an upgrade to MIMO as well. This upgrade was labeled as multi-user MIMO. While MIMO allows a single device to communicate with multiple antennas on an access point, multi-user MIMO extends this by enabling the access point to communicate with multiple devices simultaneously. This means that the wireless network can transmit data to several devices at once without having to switch between them, leading to more efficient use of the network's capacity. Now we move on to one of our newest standards, 802.11ax, or Wi-Fi 6. This standard was released in 2019 and operates in both the 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz frequency bands. 802.11ax brings a significant increase in throughput, reaching speeds of up to 9.6 gigabits per second. And if that was not enough, this standard also has an increased range over other standards. As the landscape of wireless technology advances, the horizon of Wi-Fi is expanding with developments like Wi-Fi 6E, Wi-Fi 6E builds upon Wi-Fi 6 by tapping into the 6 GHz band, promising even more bandwidth and reduced congestion for future networking needs. Thus, the progression of the 802.11 standards continues from the earliest to the most recent, ensuring that Wi-Fi technology keeps pace with the increasing demands of users around the world. Exam Objective 2.3 Compare and Contrast Protocols for Wireless Networking Long-Range Fixed Wireless This video will focus on a special type of wireless communication called Long-Range Fixed Wireless. Firstly, let's demystify what Long-Range Fixed Wireless is. Imagine connecting two points, like two buildings or towers, without the need for physical cables like fiber optics or copper wires. 
That's what long-range fixed wireless does. It uses radio waves to transmit data over significant distances. This technology is particularly useful in areas where laying cable is impractical or too expensive, like rural or remote locations. Now, how is this technology used? Think of scenarios like connecting a remote office to the main corporate network, providing internet access to rural communities, or linking surveillance cameras to a central monitoring station. The applications are broad, covering both commercial and public services. Diving deeper, we encounter two types of long-range fixed wireless connections, licensed and unlicensed. Licensed connections require authorization from regulatory bodies. You're essentially renting a portion of the radio spectrum. This exclusivity means less interference and more reliable connections, often used by businesses for critical communications. Unlicensed connections, on the other hand, are free to use without a license like Wi-Fi. While they are more accessible, they are also more susceptible to interference from other devices using the same frequency bands. Another essential aspect of long-range fixed wireless is transmission power. This is the strength of the signal sent by the transmitter, measured in decibels relative to 1 milliwatt of energy, or dBm. dBm is a standard unit of measurement for signal strength. A higher dBm indicates a stronger signal. For instance, a signal strength of 0 dBm corresponds to a power level of 1 milliwatt, while a signal at negative 90 dBm is much weaker. However, it's not just about cranking up the power. Higher power can cause more interference and requires more energy. This brings us to regulatory requirements. Each country has its own regulations governing the use of radio frequencies and transmission power. In the United States, the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, sets these rules and might include what channels are reserved for licensed and unlicensed use or the allowable limits for transmit power. And adhering to these regulations ensures that different wireless systems can coexist without causing harmful interference to each other. Exam Objective 2.3 Compare and Contrast Protocols for Wireless Networking Bluetooth As mentioned previously in this course, with Exam Objective 1.4, Bluetooth is a wireless technology that allows the exchange of data between different devices. With Bluetooth, you can connect devices like smartphones, computers, headphones, speakers, and even car audio systems without the hassle of wires. It's a technology that's all about convenience, enabling things like listening to music on wireless headphones or sharing files quickly between devices. But how does it operate as a wireless networking technology? Bluetooth works like most other wireless technologies by using radio waves. Specifically, it operates using the 2.4 GHz band similar to many of the Wi-Fi standards. As for the evolution of Bluetooth, it has grown a lot since it was first released in 1999. In the early days, Bluetooth had some issues with getting devices to talk to each other, but with each new version, it got better. For example, Bluetooth 1.2 helped devices avoid interference from other gadgets. Then, Bluetooth 2.0 increased data transfer from 1 megabit per second to 3 megabits per second, and 2.1 made pairing devices easier. With Bluetooth 3.0, things got even faster as it could now negotiate a Wi-Fi connection for transferring large files as fast as 24 megabits per second. Then came a big game changer, Bluetooth 4.0. This version introduced something called Bluetooth Low Energy, making it possible for devices like fitness trackers to run a long time on a tiny battery. Bluetooth 4.1 and 4.2 continued to improve the experience, especially for smart devices in your home. The latest versions, like Bluetooth 5.0 and beyond, are even more powerful. These versions are sending data faster than ever and covering areas in excess of 100 meters for certain devices. 
Exam Objective 2.3 Compare and Contrast Protocols for Wireless Networking NFC Near Field Communication, or NFC, is a wireless networking interface standard that was released in 2003. It is an innovative technology that uses radio frequencies to allow two devices to share data when they are in close proximity to each other, typically over a short distance of a few centimeters. This technology operates at a frequency of 13.56 MHz and offers data transfer speeds up to 424 kilobits per second. While these speeds might seem slow compared to other wireless technologies like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, they are perfectly suited for the types of data NFC is designed to handle, such as exchanging digital access keys or processing mobile payments. One application of NFC is in building security systems. In these systems, an NFC-enabled device, like a smartphone or a security badge, is tapped against a reader to gain entry. This method is increasingly popular in modern offices and hotels due to its enhanced security and convenience. NFC short-range capabilities makes it a more secure option compared to traditional magnetic stripe cards as it is harder to intercept or duplicate the signal. NFC has also become a cornerstone in the world of mobile payments, transforming how we conduct transactions in our daily lives. Services such as Apple Pay, Google Wallet, and Samsung Pay utilize NFC to facilitate contactless payments, providing a seamless and efficient user experience. This technology enables users to complete purchases with a simple tap of their NFC-enabled phone or smartwatch against a payment terminal. Moreover, the role of NFC in mobile payments is bolstered by its underlying technology. It provides a one-to-one -one connection with bi-directional communication, meaning that two devices can send and receive data to and from each other. This two-way communication capability is essential in transactions, allowing for not just the transfer of payment information, but also the confirmation of transaction details and receipts. Additionally, NFC incorporates built-in security protocols, which are critical in safeguarding sensitive information like credit card numbers and personal identification data. These protocols often include encryption and secure channels, ensuring that the data transmitted during a transaction is protected against potential threats. Exam Objective 2.3 Compare and Contrast Protocols for Wireless Networking RFID RFID is an acronym for Radio Frequency Identification and is a wireless networking device interface technology used to communicate and interact with our FID-enabled peripherals. This interface allows for wireless identification, tracking, and data exchange between the peripheral devices and a source computing device. This standard is best suited for enhancing automation and efficiency in various industries and applications. When using our FID, an RFID reader scans a tag. The tag then responds back with information that has been programmed into it. RFID systems can be either passive or active in nature. Passive RFID systems consist of an RFID tag and reader, where the tag relies on the reader's energy, in the form of electrical inductance, to power and transmit its stored information. Active RFID systems, on the other hand, Use battery-powered tags that actively send signals to the reader, allowing for longer ranges and continuous tracking. Passive RFID is cost-effective and suitable for short-range applications, while active RFID offers greater range and real-time tracking capabilities, making it ideal for scenarios like asset management or vehicle tracking. RFID technology is widely utilized for inventory control and tracking due to its ability to provide accurate and efficient identification and monitoring of assets. By tagging items with our FID tags and deploying our FID readers, businesses can automate inventory management, streamline supply chain operations, and gain real-time visibility into stock levels, 
location tracking, and movement history. RFID technology is also commonly employed for security access control systems. By utilizing our FID cards or key fobs embedded with our FID tags, Individuals can easily gain authorized access to secured areas by presenting their credentials to our FID readers. Using our FID in this manner assists in ensuring only authorized personnel can enter restricted areas. Exam Objective 2.4 Summarize services provided by network hosts. Server roles. This might be a bit of a review for some of you but I'm going to start this video off with a quick definition of what a server is. A server, in a logical sense, is a computing device that provides a service to other computing devices known as clients. Now a server can perform many roles within a network, and that is what this video is really about. Firstly, let's talk about DNS servers, or domain name system servers. Imagine them as the Internet's phone book. When you type a website name, like www.certificationsynergy.com, into your browser, this name is actually a fully qualified domain name, or FQDN. The FQDN is a more user-friendly version of an address, making it easier to remember and use. The DNS server takes this FQDN and translates it into an IP address, which is a unique set of numbers that acts like a precise address telling your device exactly where to find the website. Without a DNS server, we would have to memorize the complicated IP addresses for every website we want to visit, much like having to remember everyone's phone number instead of just their name. Next, we have DHCP servers, which stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. These servers are like the organizers of a network, responsible not only for dynamically assigning IP addresses to each device on the network, but also for providing other essential configuration details. When a device connects to a network, the DHCP server assigns it a unique IP address, allowing it to communicate with other devices and access the internet. In addition to IP addresses, DHCP servers also provide other important configuration options, like a subnet mask, which helps in identifying the network segment a device is on. The default gateway, which is the device that routes traffic to destinations outside the local network. And DNS server addresses, which ensures a device can translate human-friendly domain names into IP addresses. This automatic provisioning of network settings greatly simplifies the process of connecting and configuring new devices in a network. Then there are file servers. As the name suggests, these servers provide a central location on a network where users can store and access files. This makes it easy for multiple users to collaborate and share data as they can all access the same files from different devices. Print servers play a crucial role in managing print requests within a network. They receive print jobs from various users and send them to the appropriate printer. This helps in efficiently managing multiple print jobs and printers in a large organization. Mail servers are responsible for sending, receiving, and storing emails. When you send an email, it goes through a mail server to reach the recipient. Syslog servers are used for monitoring and logging. They collect logs and diagnostic information from different devices on a network. This information is crucial for troubleshooting and ensuring the network is running smoothly. Web servers are what make websites accessible on the Internet. They store the data of websites and serve this content to users' browsers when a website is accessed. Without web servers, there would be no way to view or interact with websites Lastly, we have servers that handle authentication, authorization, and accounting. These are known as triple 80 servers, and they are a key component in network security. They are tasked with verifying who is trying to access the network, authentication, determining what they are allowed to do, authorization, and keeping track of their activities, accounting.
Two common implementations of a AAA service would be RADIUS or TACAX+. Exam Objective 2.4 Summarize services provided by networked hosts. Internet Appliances Internet appliances are specialized devices focused on specific internet-related functions. Their dedicated nature contrast with general-purpose computers offering more efficiency in handling particular tasks. One critical type of internet appliance is the spam gateway. This tool plays a vital role in filtering out unsolicited emails or spam, which not only clutters your inbox, but also poses significant security threats. To maintain their effectiveness, spam gateways use a range of techniques such as blacklisting, whitelisting, and content analysis. By regularly updating the rules and keyword filters on these internet appliances, you ensure the spam gateway can adapt to the ever-evolving nature of spam emails, which frequently change their content and tactics. This adaptability is key in safeguarding users from malicious emails. By continuously updating the keywords and rules for filtering, spam gateways provide a dynamic and robust defense against the influx of spam making them an indispensable tool in email security management. Another pivotal appliance is the Unified Threat Management, or UTM, device. UTM devices offer a multifaceted security solution by combining several protective measures into a single platform. These measures include firewall protection, antivirus programs, anti-spam tools, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, VPNs, content filtering, and more. UTM are especially beneficial for small and medium-sized businesses, providing a cost-effective, streamlined approach to comprehensive network security. An all-in-one security device, if you will. Now we will turn our attention to load balancers. These devices distribute network or application traffic across several servers, preventing any single server from becoming overloaded. This distribution ensures smoother, more reliable network service access by ensuring each server is utilized efficiently. Lastly, we have proxy servers. A standard internet connection provides direct access between a local network and resources across the internet. So where does a proxy server fit in? A proxy server interrupts the standard connection in order to establish a monitored connection. That is why we can refer to it as a middleman. The proxy server can then intercept network traffic, allowing only approved traffic to pass through. Conversely, the proxy server will deny network traffic that violates any security rules. Additionally, if you find something is being blocked that shouldn't be, no problem. Just configure a traffic exemption. Exam Objective 2.4 Summarize services provided by networked hosts, legacy and embedded systems. Let's begin this video with defining what a legacy system is. In the realm of IT, a legacy system refers to outdated computer systems, software, or technology that is still in use, despite newer versions being available. These systems are often critical to an organization's daily operations, making upgrading or replacing them a complex, risky, or costly endeavor. They may lack support, updates, or compatibility with newer technologies, which can pose challenges in terms of security and efficiency. However, their continued use is usually due to the system's pivotal role in specific business processes or the high cost and effort required for an upgrade. Now, let's shift our focus to embedded systems. An embedded system is a specialized computing system that performs dedicated functions. Unlike a general-purpose computer, an embedded system performs specific tasks and is designed with a very specific set of requirements. These systems are ubiquitous in everyday life, found in devices like microwaves, traffic lights, and thermostats. They are known for being highly reliable, efficient, and optimized for their particular application, often running for years without the need for intervention. Finally, 
To keep in step with the CompTIA A plus Core 1 exam objectives, let's discuss how these concepts apply to SCADA systems. SCADA or Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Systems are designed to monitor and control industrial environments. These systems often rely on a combination of legacy and embedded systems. Legacy systems are common in SCADA environments due to the longevity and stability required in critical infrastructures like power plants or water treatment facilities. Embedded systems, on the other hand, are used within SCADA for specific control tasks like regulating the pressure in pipelines or maintaining temperatures in industrial processes. Their reliability and efficiency make embedded systems ideal for these critical control functions. Exam Objective 2.4 Summarize Services Provided by Networked Hosts IoT Devices In previous videos, we have talked about servers, workstations, smartphones, tablets, and even SCADA systems. But what about the myriad of other devices equipped with processing and networking capabilities? These fall under the broad category known as IoT devices, where IoT stands for the Internet of Things. Essentially, IoT refers to a vast network of physical devices, objects, and sensors that are connected to the Internet. These devices have the capacity to collect, exchange, and transmit data. They encompass a wide array of items, from common household objects to sophisticated industrial equipment. Each IoT device is typically equipped with sensors, an embedded operating system, and networking capabilities, which facilitate communication and data exchange. The Internet of Things enables these devices to interact not only with each other, but also with humans. This interactivity allows for the gathering and analysis of data, automation of processes, and remote monitoring and control. The applications of IoT devices are remarkably diverse. In the realm of home use, they include appliances and home automation systems. In the automotive industry, modern cars are increasingly IoT enabled. Other examples include IP cameras, streaming media devices, and even medical devices. Each of these IoT applications plays a crucial role in enhancing efficiency, convenience, and the overall quality of life, making them an integral part of our technologically driven world. Force. Exam Objective 2.5 Given a scenario, install and configure basic wired and wireless SOHO networks. IP address. By the end of this video, you will have a basic understanding of what an IP address is and how it functions in the world of networking. So let's get to it. First up is to define what an IP address is. IP stands for Internet Protocol, and an IP address is a unique numerical identifier assigned to every device connected to a network. Within this definition, the key word is assigned as an IP address is logically assigned, can be changed, and even reassigned as needed. Currently, there are two versions of IP addresses in use. IPv4 and IPv6. IPv4, which stands for Internet Protocol version 4, is the older and more widely adopted version. An IPv4 address identifies a device in an Internet Protocol version 4 or an IPv4 network. It is worth noting that IPv4 addresses use a specific type of notation called dot decimal notation. Dot decimal notation is a way of displaying a big number in manageable chunks. In the case of an IPv4 address, each address is 32 binary digits long. This is a bit difficult to understand, so let's group this 32 binary digit address into different containers that are separated by dots. This will create four sets of eight binary digits, also known as octets. Next, we will convert each octet from binary to their decimal value equivalents, resulting in a dot decimal notation that is much easier to read. With this dot decimal notation, each octet can range from 0 to 255, providing us with over 4.2 billion numerical combinations. IPv6 addresses are considerably longer than an IPv4 address, at 128 binary digits long. IPv6 addresses also use a different addressing scheme. 
IPv6 addresses include eight groups of four hexadecimal digits, separated by colons. Each group of four hexadecimal digits can also be called a hextet. Next, let's explore how IP addresses are assigned to devices. There are two main methods, static and dynamic. A static IP address is manually assigned to a device and remains constant over time. This is often used for servers, printers, or other devices that need a persistent, unchanging address in order to be consistently located by other devices. On the other hand, dynamic IP addresses are automatically assigned by a service called DHCP, which stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. With dynamic addressing using DHCP, a device receives an IP address from a DHCP server when it connects to the network. This dynamic addressing using DHCP allows for efficient assignment and use of IP addresses. Additionally, dynamic IP addressing using DHCP simplifies the process of getting connected to a network for non-technical users. Instead of manually configuring IP addresses, DHCP automatically assigns an IP address to a device when it connects to the network. This eliminates the need for users to have prior knowledge of networking or IP addressing, making it more user-friendly and convenient. Non-technical users can simply connect their devices to the network and DHCP takes care of the rest. Now let's talk about private and public IPv4 addresses. Private IPv4 addresses are used within local networks such as your home or office. They are not routable on the internet and are meant for internal communications, such as between a workstation and a printer or for an internal corporate web server known as an intranet. These addresses fall within specific reserve ranges. These private IP address ranges are displayed just above me. Any IPv4 addresses falling within these ranges will be considered a private IPv4 address and will be restricted to use within a LAN or private network. It will be a good idea to remember these ranges as they will show up again and again throughout your IT journey. Public IPv4 addresses behave a bit differently. They are assigned to devices that connect directly to the internet. These addresses are unique globally and allow devices to communicate with each other across the internet. Internet service providers, or ISPs, Assign public IP addresses to devices connected to their network. Now, this is a video that might be worth watching a couple times. We covered the definition of an IP address, the different IP protocols version 4 and version 6, static and dynamic IP address assignment, and the difference between private and public IP addresses. Great job! Exam Objective 2.5 Given a scenario, Install and configure basic wired and wireless SOO networks. APIPA APIPA stands for Automatic Private IP Addressing. It's a mechanism used to automatically assign a self-configured IP address to a computer. This happens when the computer fails to obtain an IP address from a Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP server. When a computer tries and fails to get an IP address the usual way, through DHCP, it activates APIPA, which then assigns a temporary, self-generated IP address. This is a bit like a backup plan to ensure that the computer's network interface is always operational. This automatic assignment is vital in networking, as it keeps devices connected and able to communicate with each other, even when there are issues with the DHCP server. The range of IP addresses reserved for APIPUD extends from 169.254.0.1 through 169.254.255.254. This range is set aside specifically for this automatic addressing and is recognized across all systems that support APIPA. It ensures that devices can assign themselves an address that's unlikely to conflict with addresses assigned by a DHCP server. Now, let's discuss one of the most common reasons why a device obtains an APIPA address. 
The primary reason is the inability to reach a DHCP server. This could be due to the server being offline, network congestion, or issues with the network infrastructure such as faulty cables or incorrect network settings. When a computer boots up and requests an IP address but receives no response from a DHCP server, it defaults to assigning itself an OPIP address. However, having an OPIP address will come with certain restrictions. The most significant limitation is the lack of internet connectivity. Devices with OPIP addresses can communicate with other devices on the same local network segment that also have OPIP addresses, but they cannot access external networks, including the internet. This is because OPIPA is designed for local network communication only, and routers typically do not forward traffic originating from OPIPA addresses to other networks. Exam Objective 2.5 Given a scenario, install and configure basic wired and wireless Soho networks. Default Gateway A default gateway, in the context of a computer network, is a router or networking device that connects a local network to the internet or other networks. It acts as a doorway, allowing your computer or other network devices to send or receive data from outside the local network. The function of a default gateway is straightforward yet vital. When a device on your network wants to access a website, stream a video, or download a file from the internet, it sends that request to the default gateway. The gateway then takes this request and forwards it to the destination outside of your local network. When the data or response comes back, the gateway receives it and then routes it back to the original requesting device on the local network. Devices on a network are usually configured with a default gateway setting, either manually or automatically. The automatic configuration is often done through DHCP, the same protocol that assigns IP addresses to devices on the network. When a device connects to the network, the DHCP server provides it with an IP address, summed at mask, and the IP address of the default gateway, among other things. This process is seamless and happens behind the scenes, ensuring devices can communicate both internally and externally without user intervention. For manual configuration, the process involves going into the network settings of the device and specifying the IP address of the default gateway. Exam Objective 2.6 Compare and Contrast Common Network Configuration Concepts DNS The Domain Name System, or DNS, is a networking service that translates domain names into IP addresses that computers use to communicate with each other. Think of DNS as a phone book, allowing us to use easy-to-remember domain names such as www.certificationsynergy.com instead of complex IP addresses. These user-friendly names are known as fully qualified domain names or FQDNs. The DNS server takes this FQDN and translates it into its corresponding IP address, directing your device to the precise location of the resource you wish to access. This conversion from FQDN to IP address is essential for navigating the internet, as it spares us from having to memorize the numerical addresses for every website we want to access. Now, how exactly does DNS convert a fully qualified domain name into an IP address? Let's break it down, starting with what makes up an FQDN. An FQDN is a complete address used to access a specific device across the internet, like a web server. It's composed of several parts, including an optional subdomain or subdomains, a domain name, and a top-level domain. For an example, Let's take the URL https colon forward slash forward slash www.example.com forward slash info forward slash about us dot html and slice out a portion of it. The FQDN will include the www as the subdomain, example as the domain, and .com as the top level domain. When you use this FQDN in an attempt to search for a device, it sends a request to a DNS recursive server. 
This recursive server, also known as a DNS resolver, is specifically designed to handle DNS queries. The DNS recursive server then starts the process of finding the IP address that matches the FQDN you're searching for. Now, let's dive into this lookup process, step by step, to understand how it translates an FQDN, like www.example.com, into a numeric IP address that leads you to your desired resource. When you start your lookup, it sends a request to a DNS recursive server, which begins the process of looking up the IP address associated with the domain name you enter. The first stop is a root server. A root name server provides a referral to the appropriate top-level domain server. For our scenario, the .com TLD server. The DNS recursive server then reaches out to the TLD server, which then directs the DNS recursive server to the domain name server responsible for the specific domain. The domain name server will then return the IP address associated with the domain to the DNS recursive server. The DNS recursive server will complete the lookup process by providing the requested IP address back to your browser. Now that we know how the DNS lookup process works, we will probe deeper into the topic of domain name servers and the many different types of information we can request from them. See you in the next video. Exam Objective 2.6 Compare and Contrast Common Network Configuration Concepts DNS records. In this video, we will be taking a closer look at domain name servers, or name servers for short. For IT professionals, understanding the operation and significance of DNS servers is fundamental. These servers not only facilitate the basic function of connecting users to web servers, email servers, or other online resources, but also play a key role in network security and efficiency. Named servers can be configured to block access to malicious sites, redirect traffic for load balancing, and even implement custom domain name rules within private networks. So how do these named servers work? Well, simply put, they house a database of DNS records. A DNS record is a database entry on a domain name server that links a domain name to various types of information. These records are stored in the server's database and play a critical role in controlling the behavior of internet traffic. They contain instructions on how to route requests for a domain, including IP addresses, mail server configurations, and other essential data. One of the most common types of DNS records is the AD record, also known as an address record. An AE record maps a fully qualified domain name directly to its corresponding IPv4 address, which is the standard protocol for the majority of internet traffic. For example, when you enter a website URL into your browser, the DNS lookup process takes the FQBN and sets out to find the AE record to resolve the domain name to its IPv4 address, guiding your request to the correct web server. Up next, we have quad A records. These records perform a function very similar to A records, but are used to map a fully qualified domain name directly to its corresponding IPv6 address, which is the newer internet protocol designed to eventually replace IPv4. Quad A records ensure that domains can be resolved and connected over the IPv6 infrastructure, future-proofing the internet's expansion. Moving on, we have the MX record or mail exchange record. These records are vital for email functionality, directing where emails that are sent to your domain should be delivered. Each MX record maps an email domain to an FQBN of a mail server and is accompanied by a priority set. This priority setting allows for a primary, secondary, and further backup mail servers to ensure email delivery even if one server goes down. TXT records are versatile DNS records that contain text-based application-specified values. They're often used for verifying domain ownership. Additionally, TXT records are crucial for implementing various security measures, which brings us to our next point. 
In the context of spam management, three significant TXT records come into play, DKIM, SBF, and DMAR. DKIM or Domain Keys Identified Mail verifies the sender's domain and ensures that the emails have not been tampered with in transit. SPF or Sender Policy Framework specifies which mail servers are authorized to send emails on behalf of your domain, preventing email spoofing. Lastly, DMARC, which stands for Domain-Based Message Authentication, Reporting and Conformance, builds upon DKIM and SPF, providing instructions on how to handle emails that fail DKIM and SPF checks, thus enhancing email security and integrity. Exam Objective 2.6 Compare and Contrast Common Network Configuration Concepts DHDP Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHDP, is a networking service that automates the configuration of devices on an IP network. Essentially, DHDP allows network devices, like computers and printers, to automatically obtain IP addresses and other necessary network configurations. This makes it much easier to manage large networks, where assigning IP addresses manually would be impractical. To simplify things, imagine every device connected to a network is like a house in a vast neighborhood. Just like every house needs a unique address to receive mail, every device needs a unique identifier known as an IP address to send and receive data on a network. Here's where DHDP steps in. It acts like the neighborhood's post office, dynamically assigning IP addresses to devices as they join the network, ensuring each one has a unique address and can communicate efficiently. Now, let's talk about how DHCP does its job. The secret to DHCP is Dora. No, not that Dora. Okay, much better. This DORA stands for Discover, Offer, Request, and Acknowledge, and is a four-step process. Here is a quick breakdown. The process begins with discovery. Imagine a new device, like a laptop or a smartphone, connecting to a network for the first time. This device doesn't yet have an IP address, so it broadcasts a discovery message across the network. This message is a digital shout-out saying, I'm new here, is there a DHCP server that can assign me an IP address? Upon hearing this call, a DHCP server on the network springs into action, entering the offer phase. The server selects an available IP address from its pool of addresses and sends an offer message back to the device. This message essentially says, Hello, device. I am the DHCP server and I propose this specific IP address for you to use. The device, upon receiving this offer, moves the process to the request phase. It evaluates the proposed IP address and finding it suitable, sends a request message back to the DHCP server. This message is the device's way of saying, I accept your offer of this IP address. May I use it? The final step in this dance is acknowledgement. The DHCP server receives the device's request and seals the deal by sending an acknowledgement message back. This message confirms the IP address assignment, effectively saying, the IP address is yours to use. Welcome to the network. With this exchange, the device is now a fully functional member of the network, able to communicate with other devices using its newly assigned IP address if only all communications in real life were this cordial. With that said, it is also important to note that DHCP does more than just handle IP addresses. It also configures other essential settings for network communications, such as the subnet mask, which determines the network size, the default gateway for connecting to other networks, and information on how to find the network's preferred DNS server or servers in order to resolve domain names into IP addresses. Another key concept in DHCP is the lease, which is the period of time for which an IP address is assigned to a device. Leases are temporary 
allowing for efficient reuse of IP addresses in environments where devices frequently connect to and disconnect from the network. Then there is the DHCP scope. The scope is the predefined range of IP addresses that the DHCP server is authorized to assign to devices. It's essentially the pool of addresses that the server can draw from when assigning addresses to network devices. Lastly, we have DHCP reservations. This is a handy feature that allows network administrators to reserve specific IP addresses for certain devices, ensuring they always receive the same IP address each time they connect to the network. This is particularly useful for devices like printers or servers that need a consistent IP address for network users to access them easily. So did you get all of that? I hope so. Because understanding DHCP and its components is necessary for anyone stepping into the IT field. It's a fundamental part of network management, ensuring devices can connect and communicate seamlessly in a dynamic network environment. Exam Objective 2.6 Compare and Contrast Common Network Configuration Concepts VLAN Let's start this video by circling back to a previously covered topic, the unmanaged switch. Imagine an unmanaged switch as a basic traffic director in a small town, where roads act as network cables that connect buildings, symbolizing computers and devices, to intersections which behave as switches. In this example, all traffic moves freely, with the switch directing traffic based on the destination address, much like a simple traffic light. This setup works well for smaller networks where the volume of traffic is manageable and all devices are trusted and secure. However, as the network expands, this simple system becomes less efficient and secure. Traffic congestion increases and it becomes challenging to manage different types of traffic that require varying levels of security and priority. This is where VLANs or virtual local area networks come into play. A VLAN is a technology that allows you to divide a single physical network into multiple separate virtual networks. In this setup, each VLAN functions as its own distinct network, enabling groups of devices to communicate as if they were on their own isolated network, even though they share the same physical infrastructure. This division helps improve security, manage network traffic more efficiently, and allows for better organization of network resources without requiring additional hardware. Essentially, VLANs provide a way to segment network traffic, ensuring that devices within the same VLAN can communicate with each other, but not with devices in different VLANs, unless specifically configured to do so. Tying this back to our small town metaphor, think of a VLAN as a sophisticated traffic management system in a bustling city. It allows the city planner, acting as our network administrator equivalent, to create special use traffic lanes on existing roadways, allowing for the segregation of traffic based on type, purpose, or security clearance. For example, emergency vehicles can be routed through a dedicated fast lane that separates them from regular traffic, ensuring they reach their destination quickly and securely. In summary, as networks grow and become more complex, the need for efficient, secure, and manageable networking solutions becomes paramount. VLANs offer a powerful way to meet these needs by providing the ability to segment a physical network into multiple virtual networks. This not only enhances security and performance, but also offers greater flexibility in managing network resources. Exam Objective 2.6 Compare and Contrast Common Network Configuration Concepts VPN A VPN, or Virtual Private Network, creates a secure, encrypted connection between your device and a remote server, acting as a protective tunnel for your data. This is especially vital for secure remote access to servers, allowing users to retrieve or send information without exposing sensitive data to potential threats. Imagine a secure, invisible tunnel that connects your computer to another remote network across the internet, 
allowing you to send and receive data with an added layer of privacy and security. That, in essence, is what a VPN provides. It's a tool that has become increasingly important in our digital age, where data privacy and secure communications are paramount. At its core, a VPN is a technology that creates a secure, encrypted connection over a less secure network, such as the public internet. This encrypted connection is often referred to as a VPN tunnel, and it enables you to access data across the internet privately and securely. Think of the internet as a bustling highway where information travels openly. A VPN, in this analogy, acts like a private tunnel on this highway that, that only authorized vehicles, or data packets in this case, can use. When you connect to a VPN, your data is encrypted before it leaves your device, making it unreadable to anyone who might intercept it. This means that even if you're using a public Wi-Fi network, your data remains secure and private. Exam Objective 2.7 Compare and Contrast Internet Connection Types, Network Types, and Their Features Internet Connection Types An Internet Service Provider, or ISP, is a company or organization that provides individuals, businesses, and other entities with access to the Internet. ISPs are responsible for connecting customers to the Internet through various technologies, Wired technologies include fiber optics, cable, and DSL. Wireless technologies include satellite and cellular. With each option, there are typically a range of subscription plans that vary in terms of throughput speeds and pricing designed to meet the needs of different users. Another consideration is location. Not all connection types are available in all areas. Now that we know what an ISP is, Let's discuss each of the available connection types, one at a time. Fiber optic is a type of wired internet connection that utilizes fiber optic cables to transmit data. It is considered one of the fastest and most reliable forms of internet connectivity available today. Fiber optic cables are made of thin strands of glass or plastic, known as optical fibers. These fibers are designed to transmit data using pulses of light. Fiber optic internet connections can be relatively more expensive compared to some other types of internet connections and are commonly deployed by ISPs in urban areas. Cable internet is a type of wired internet connection that utilizes the same coaxial copper cabling that is used for cable television transmission to deliver high-speed internet access to homes and businesses. It provides sufficient speeds for most homes and small businesses, but falls short of the speeds possible with fiber optic connections. As a plus, cable internet is usually cheaper than fiber optic connections and has a larger coverage area. As a slight downside, the copper cable medium does result in a shared customer bandwidth. DSL or Digital Subscriber Line, is a type of wired internet connection that uses existing copper telephone lines, traditionally known as POTS or plain old telephone service, to transmit data. It is a popular alternative to cable and fiber optic connections in areas where these options may not be available. To establish a DSL connection, a DSL modem is required. The modem connects to the telephone line and translates the digital data from the user's devices into signals that can be transmitted over the copper telephone lines. DSL is relatively slow compared to fiber optic and cable connections, but DSL tends to be more cost efficient. And since it uses the existing telephone network, coverage is pretty widespread. Satellite internet is a type of wireless internet connection that uses communication satellites and satellite antennas to provide internet access to users. It is a viable option for areas where traditional wired connections like fiber optic, cable, or DSL are not available or practical, usually due to a lack of existing infrastructure. While satellite may be your only option in a remote location, it is probably going to be expensive and slow. This connection type is expensive because a satellite internet service provider operates a network of communication satellites in geostationary orbit around the Earth. 
and this connection type is slow because these satellites are positioned approximately 35,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. It takes a fair amount of time for a radio signal to travel 35,000 kilometers to the satellite and then back down again, causing data latency. And if you have bad weather like a rainstorm interfering with your radio signals, just forget it. Cellular Internet, also known as Mobile Internet, is a type of wireless internet access that utilizes cellular networks to provide connectivity to devices such as smartphones, tablets, and laptops. It enables users to access the internet while on the go or traveling without relying on fixed wired connections. Each device will have an antenna that allows it to connect to a cellular network infrastructure. This infrastructure consists of a system of interconnected base stations or cell towers that are strategically placed to provide coverage over a specific geographic area. Lastly, I would like to add one more wireless connection type to the mix. This one is Wireless Internet Service Providers, also known as a WISP. A WISP uses fixed wireless technology to provide internet access in areas that might not be served by wired connection options. With this connection type, a small dish or antenna is installed at your location to connect to the provider's tower. WISPs can be a great option in rural or underserved areas. The setup is relatively simple and doesn't require extensive infrastructure. However, like satellite internet, it can be susceptible to weather conditions and might offer lower speeds compared to wired connections. Exam Objective 2.7 Compare and contrast internet connection types, network types, and their features. Network types Networks of different sizes can be categorized in different ways based on their coverage and scale. In this video, we will cover the most common network types, starting with a PAN or personal area network. A PAN is the smallest of the network types we will cover. It's designed for individual use within a range of a few meters. Imagine the wireless connectivity between your smartphone, your Bluetooth headset, and your smartwatch. That's a perfect example of a PAN. It's primarily used for personal devices to connect and communicate over short distances, often using wireless technologies like Bluetooth. Next, we have local area networks or LANs. A LAN is a wired network that covers a small geographical area, typically within a building, small office, or home. This type of network allows devices to share resources, such as files or printers, within a single, contained environment. LANs are typically wired using Ethernet cables to connect computers and other devices to a central router or switch, but they can also be wireless. Speaking of wireless, we also have WLAN networks. WLAN stands for Wireless Local Area Network. A WLAN is similar to a LAN, but the key difference is the use of wireless technology for connectivity. Instead of relying on physical cables, WLANs use wireless signals, such as Wi-Fi, to connect devices within a localized area. A WLAN may also be connected to a LAN. In this way, a WLAN can extend a LAN by providing a method for wireless devices to connect to and share resources with the wired LAN network. Now, let us expand our horizon to wide area networks, or WANs. WANs cover a much larger area than LANs, or WLANs. A WAN is a network that spans a large geographical area, typically connecting multiple LANs or remote locations. WANs are used to connect networks across cities, countries, or even continents. They enable long-distance communications and data exchanges between geographically dispersed sites. The Internet itself can be considered a massive WAN, connecting networks worldwide. Metropolitan Area Networks, or MANs, cover an area larger than a LAN but smaller than a WAN, typically spanning a city or a metropolitan area. They are used to connect multiple lands within a geographical area, allowing organizations and buildings to share resources at high speeds. Lastly, we'll cover storage area networks, or SANs. 
A SAN is a dedicated high-speed network that interconnects and presents shared pools of storage devices to multiple servers. SANs are designed to handle large volumes of data and are typically used in server rooms or data centers. They allow for more efficient storage management and access in complex environments. Exam Objective 2.8 Given a scenario, use networking tools. Networking tools are the essential instruments that IT professionals use to build, analyze, and maintain the vast and intricate world of computer networks. They range from simple handheld devices for wiring tasks to sophisticated software that monitors and optimizes network traffic, each serving a specific purpose in the life cycle of a network infrastructure. In this video, we will cover some more common networking tools, starting with cable strippers. The cable stripper is a precision tool designed to remove the outer jacket of a cable to reveal the delicate wires inside. This tool is indispensable for anyone looking to install or repair cables. Its precise blades allow for the stripping of various cable thicknesses without nicking the internal wiring, ensuring that your data transmissions remain intact and reliable. Moving on, we have a crimper. This tool is the cornerstone of creating physical network connections. It's used to affix RJ11, RJ45, and F-type connectors to corresponding cables, be it telephone, Ethernet, or coaxial cables, respectively. The crimping tool must apply just the right amount of pressure to secure the connector without damaging the delicate wires inside. Whether you're crafting a custom-length Ethernet cable for a network setup or attaching a connector to a coaxial cable for a television or internet connection, the crimping tool ensures a snug, stable connection that won't loosen over time. The cable tester is an analytical tool essential for verifying the integrity of network cables. It checks for proper wire pinouts, essential for communication between devices, evaluates signal quality by measuring resistance, signal attenuation, noise, and interference, and can even estimate the length of a cable. This tool is crucial not just for troubleshooting, but also for certifying that a cable meets the required performance standards before it becomes part of a critical network infrastructure. The punch-down tool is another fundamental instrument for network technicians. It allows for the insertion and trimming of wires in one motion, making it perfect for organizing and connecting wires to patch panels and blocks, a common scenario in large network installations. A toner probe set, affectionately known as a fox and hound, is the go-to for tracing cables. When you have a mess of wires and need to find a specific one, the tone generator sends a signal down the wire, which is then detected by the probe. This is incredibly useful for locating specific cables within a bundle or identifying the termination point of a cable on a patch panel which is often a challenge in complex network environments. A loopback plug is a simple but powerful diagnostic tool. It is primarily used to test network ports and the functionality of the network interface card, or NIC, by redirecting the output signal back into the system as a return signal. This self-communication verifies that the port and NIC can send and receive data correctly which is a fundamental check for network troubleshooting. A network tap, short for network test access point, is a dedicated hardware tool designed to facilitate the monitoring of network traffic. It serves an essential role in settings where maintaining high security and conducting thorough traffic analysis are paramount. By integrating a network tap into a specific segment of a network, it can duplicate all the data traversing that segment and redirect the copies to a separate monitoring device for detailed examination. This capability enables in-depth observation and analysis of network activities while ensuring that the regular flow and function of the network remains unaffected. Lastly, a Wi-Fi analyzer is a modern necessity in the arsenal of network tools. This software can be downloaded onto a smartphone or operate as a standalone device, 
and is used to assess the quality of Wi-Fi signals. It can even help create a signal heat map to visualize signal strength across different areas, as well as identify channels with less traffic for optimal performance and reduced latency. This is particularly beneficial when optimizing a wireless network to ensure the best possible connectivity for users. In summary, each tool described is an essential component of a network technician's toolkit, playing a pivotal role in the successful setup and maintenance of network infrastructures. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain basic cable types and their connectors, features, and purposes. Copper Network Cables in this video, we'll explore the fundamental types of copper network cables and how they're utilized. Network cabling, along with associated interfaces, serves the crucial function of linking network devices to facilitate data sharing. These cables are integral to the infrastructure of most wired networks and are available in several forms. The copper cabling options include phone cables, coaxial cables, and Ethernet or CAT cables. Copper phone cables, although originally designed for voice communication, have evolved to support various data communication applications. While they still play a crucial role in landline telephone connections, phone cables are also commonly used for dial-up and DSL internet connections. Both these technologies allow data to be transmitted over existing phone lines, enabling internet access for homes and businesses without the need for additional infrastructure. Next, we have coaxial cables. These copper cables are commonly used in broadband internet connections, particularly in cable internet services. These cables enable the delivery of high-speed internet access to homes and businesses, supporting activities such as web browsing, video streaming, online gaming, and file downloads. As for Ethernet or CAT cables, where CAT is short for category, they are indispensable in modern networking, facilitating crucial connections such as linking a modem to a Soho router or connecting a Soho router to a desktop PC. And given their widespread use in networking setups today, it only makes sense that we should explore this copper cable type in more depth. We'll begin our in-depth exploration of CAT cables by first examining their specifications. Over time, the evolution of CAT cables has been driven by an ever-increasing demand for network speed and reliability. This has led to many different CAT cable standards over time. While it's not necessary to memorize every CAT cable standard ever created, we do need to know a few specific ones for the CompTIA A Plus Core 1 certification exam. Here are a few cable specifications you should memorize. CAT5 cables support 100 megabits per second of throughput for a distance of up to 100 meters. This conforms to the 100 base TX standard. CAT5 e cables support 1000 megabits per second of throughput for a distance of up to 100 meters. This conforms to the 1000 base T standard. CAT6 cables also support 1000 megabits per second of throughput for a distance of up to 100 meters and conforms to the 1000 base T standard just like a CAT 5E cable, but they also support 10 gigabits per second of throughput at a shorter distance of 55 meters. This conforms to the 10G base T standard. Last, we have the CAT 6A cable. This cable supports 10 gigabits per second of throughput for a distance of 100 meters, improving upon the CAT 6 cable. This cable also conforms to the 10G base T standard. Now that you have promised to commit these CAT cable specifications to memory, I can move on to CAT cable construction. CAT cables are twisted pair cables. That means cables consist of pairs of insulated copper wires twisted together. This twisting of wires helps to mitigate electromagnetic interference, or EMI. One key term to understand in this context is crosstalk. Crosstalk refers to the interference caused when the signals transmitted on one wire pair affect the signals on an adjacent wire pair. By twisting the wires together in pairs, crosstalk is minimized, ensuring that data can be transmitted more reliably. Next, 
We have two main types of twisted pair cables, unshielded twisted pair, or UTP, and shielded twisted pair, or STP. UTP cables do not have any additional EMI protection beyond the twisting of the wire pairs. STP cables, on the other hand, feature an extra layer of shielding, such as foil or braided metal, that is wrapped around the outside of the wire pairs, providing further protection against interference. These STP cables are commonly used in environments where there are high levels of electromagnetic interference, such as industrial settings or areas with heavy machinery. Another construction consideration is a plenum rate. Plenum rated cables are specifically designed for use in plenum spaces within buildings. A plenum space is an area used for air circulation in HVAC or heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, typically found above suspended ceilings or below raised floors. These spaces serve as pathways for air to circulate throughout the building, helping to maintain proper airflow and temperature regulation. What sets plenum rated cables apart is their construction and materials. These cables are manufactured using fire retardant materials that are capable of withstanding high temperatures without emitting toxic fumes or spreading flames rapidly. This is crucial in plenum spaces as any fire hazard poses a significant risk to the entire building. Additionally, Plenum rated cables undergo stringent testing and certification processes to ensure they meet specific safety standards and building codes. This includes testing for flame spread, smoke generation, and toxicity levels. Using plenum rated cables in plenum spaces is not only a matter of compliance with building regulations, but also a crucial safety measure. In the event of a fire, these cables help to minimize the spread of flames and reduce the release of harmful gases, providing occupants with valuable time to evacuate safely. And to wrap up our study of CAT cables, let's delve into connector pinouts, specifically the T568A and T568B standards. Connector pinouts define the arrangement of wires within Ethernet connectors, ensuring consistency and compatibility across network installations. T568A and T568B are two commonly used pinout standards for Ethernet cables, dictating the order in which wires are terminated at the connector ends. T568A and T568B standards differ in their wire arrangement primarily in the positioning of the green and orange wire pairs. T568A features a green pair on pins 1 and 2 and an orange pair on pins 3 and 6. In contrast, T568B reverses this arrangement, placing the orange pair on pins 1 and 2 and the green pair on pins 3 and 6. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain basic cable types and their connectors, features, and purposes. Fiber Optic Network Cables In this video, we will discuss the fundamental aspects of fiber optic network cables. These cables are at the forefront of modern networking and are revolutionizing the way data is transmitted across vast distances with unparalleled speed and reliability. Unlike traditional copper cables, which rely on electrical signals to transmit data, fiber optic network cables harness the power of light pulses to convey information. This innovative approach not only ensures faster transmission speeds, but also significantly enhances the efficiency of data transfer processes. By leveraging light signals, fiber optic cables mitigate many of the limitations associated with copper-based counterparts such as signal degradation and electromagnetic interference, thus offering a superior solution for modern networking needs. Now, let's explore the two main types of fiber optic cables, single-mode fiber and multi-mode fiber. For this, we will start by exploring single-mode fiber, a type of fiber optic cable designed for transmitting a single mode of light through a very small tube known as a core. This method of light transmission results in remarkably lower signal attenuation, 
allowing for longer distance transmissions with superior bandwidth capabilities. Single mode fiber stands out as the preferred choice for long haul telecommunications, where reliability and high performance data transmission over extensive distances are paramount. It serves as the backbone of intercontinental network infrastructure, seamlessly connecting locations worldwide and facilitating high-speed data transmission applications with unparalleled efficiency and reliability. On the other hand, multimode fiber, as the name suggests, accommodates multiple modes of light propagation simultaneously within its core. This characteristic makes it an ideal choice for short-distance transmissions, typically found within buildings or campus environments. With its larger core diameter, multimode fiber facilitates easier alignment of light signals, simplifying installation and making it more cost-effective for shorter distances. It finds widespread use in local area network setups, data centers, and multimedia applications, owing to its affordability and versatility in accommodating various networking needs. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain basic cable types and their connectors, features, and purposes. Peripheral Cables As a starting point in the field of information technology, understanding peripheral cables is fundamental to your grasp of hardware components and their connectivity. So let's dive in. Peripheral cables serve as the vital links between various devices and your computer. They enable the transmission of data, power, and signals, facilitating seamless communication and functionality. These cables come in different types, each tailored to specific purposes and technologies. One of the most well-known peripheral cables is the USB. USB, short for Universal Serial Bus, is a standard interface used for connecting peripherals to computers and other devices, and this cable type has revolutionized connectivity since its inception in 1996. They facilitate data transfer, power supply, and device connectivity. With USB cables, you can transfer files, connect peripherals like keyboards and printers, or charge your devices. USB cables have undergone significant evolution since their introduction with USB version 1.0. Initially, USB 1.0 provided modest data transfer speeds, reaching up to 12 megabits per second, suitable for basic peripherals. However, with the demand for faster and more efficient connectivity, USB 2.0 emerged, representing a significant advancement. USB 2.0 brought about notable improvements in data transfer rates, offering speeds of up to 480 megabits per second, making it the preferred choice for connecting peripherals like keyboards, mice, and printers to your computer. This upgrade allowed for smoother and more responsive interaction with these essential devices, enhancing overall user experience. As technology continued to advance, the need for even faster data transfer became apparent. Enter USB 3.0, a groundbreaking development in USB technology. USB 3.0 cables, easily distinguishable by their blue connectors, revolutionized data transfer with substantially increased speeds compared to their predecessors. These cables are designed to handle high bandwidth applications, offering speeds of 5 gigabits per second or more depending on the 3.0 version making them ideal for connecting high-speed devices such as external data drives and high-definition webcams. With USB 3.0, users can transfer large files and multimedia content swiftly and efficiently without experiencing bottlenecks or slowdowns. This enhanced performance has transformed how we interact with peripheral devices, providing seamless access to vast amounts of data and multimedia content. Transitioning from USB cables, another type of peripheral cable is the serial cable. A serial cable is a type of connection used for serial transmission of data between devices. Although less common in contemporary computing environments, it maintains relevance for specific applications 
where its unique characteristics are advantageous. Serial cables are recognized for their method of serial data transmission, which involves sending data one bit at a time over a single wire or pair of wires, in contrast to parallel transmission used in interfaces like USB. While serial transmission generally results in lower data transfer speeds compared to USB, it offers advantages in certain scenarios, such as long-distance communication and simplicity of implementation. Now, let's shift our focus to another remarkable peripheral cable technology, Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt is a high-speed peripheral standard that enables rapid data transfer and versatile connectivity. This cable standard was developed by Intel in collaboration with Apple. Probably why you will find at least one of these interfaces on any new Apple laptop, or more likely, any laptop period these days. It enables blazing fast data transfer rates and supports a wide array of peripherals, including displays and storage devices. One of the defining features of Thunderbolt is its ability to handle multiple types of data streams simultaneously, making it ideal for demanding applications that require high bandwidth. At its core, a Thunderbolt cable is a high-performance connection solution designed to deliver unparalleled speed and flexibility. It combines data transfer, video output, network connectivity, and power delivery into a single compact cable, streamlining connectivity for users. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain basic cable types and their connectors, features, and purposes. Video Cables Video connectivity in the realm of information technology involves a wide array of cable options each capable of transmitting visual and sometimes audio signals between various devices such as computers, monitors, TVs, and projectors. These cables play a crucial role in ensuring seamless communication and display of digital content. In this video, we will discuss several different types of video cables, their purposes, and how they have evolved over time to meet the demands of modern technology. And first up, we have VGA cables. VGA is short for Video Graphics Array and is a graphic device interface standard that was released in 1986. It was very popular with older computing devices. This standard is not the oldest graphic interface standard, but is the oldest one we will cover in this video. Some useful facts about this standard are that it uses a 15-pin connector that is often signified by the color blue. The standard is designed to transmit video only. So if you want audio, you are going to need another interface and cable for that. VGA also uses analog signals to transmit data. Now, when it comes to electrical signals, analog signals do not transmit as fast as digital signals. As a byproduct, the use of analog signals with the VGA graphic interface standard causes it to be incapable of supporting higher resolutions or the amazing graphics that we have become accustomed to. No HD or high-definition images with this standard. Additionally, the VGA standard also separates and individually transmits the colors of red, green, and blue, or the RGB color values. Next, we have the Digital Video Interface, or DVI for short. This is a graphic device interface standard that was released in 1999. That was over a decade after the release of the VGA standard. DVI had the main job of bridging the gap between old and new. Older display devices were using analog signals, while manufacturers were pushing to release newer display devices that utilized digital signals in order to provide higher resolutions or output better quality graphics. Improving upon VGA, the DVI connector came with a possible 29 pins. With more pins came more possibilities, including the ability to solve the problem manufacturers were faced with. With these additional pins, DVI was able to transmit and receive both analog and digital signals. Still no audio, though. With up to 29 pins at its disposal, the DVI standard comes with five different variants. As I stated previously, DVI supports both analog and digital signals. 
So here is how we keep things organized. DVI A is the analog variant. DVI A transmits only analog signals. It is designed to transmit video signals in a manner similar to a VGA connection. DVI D is the digital variant. DVI D transmits digital signals only, and its connectors can come in different configurations, such as single link or dual link. In single link DVI, there is only one channel or pathway available for transmitting data, and dual link has two channels. With a second channel, higher quality graphics can be achieved. It sure seems like we are always on a quest for bigger and better graphics. Okay, now for the last variant. DVI I. With DVI I, the second I stands for integrate. This variant is a hybrid interface that combines both analog and digital signals in a single connector. DVI I also offers single link and dual link configuration options but these options are only supported by the digital half of this variant. That was a lot of information and worthy of a quick summary. So remember, DVI-A transmits analog signals, DVI-D transmits digital signals, and DVI-I transmits both analog and digital signals. Moving forward from DVI in 2004, the HDMI Graphic Device Interface Standard was released. HDMI stands for High Definition Multimedia Interface, and it comes with a 19-pin connector. Now the name High Definition Multimedia really says it all. HDMI supports multimedia or audio and video in one interface. No longer do we need a second cable to transmit audio data. This standard was immediately adopted by television manufacturers and then quickly spread to all display devices. Today, it is the most widely used graphic device interface. Also, as the name implies, it supports high-definition resolutions or high-quality graphics. The HDMI standard also dropped analog signaling altogether and is fully digital. Now, I have saved the best for last. Well, that is merely an opinion and certainly debatable, so I will invite you to comment with your personal thoughts. Anyways, a few years after the release of HDMI, in 2008, we were given the DisplayPort Graphic Device Interface Standard. Since 2008, DisplayPort and HDMI have been battling it out for top spot. So let's cover the basics of DisplayPort. It comes with a 20-pin connector, provides audio and video data streaming, and uses digital signal. Sounds a lot like HDMI, doesn't it? So how are these two standards different? Well, the DisplayPort standard is free to use, or open source, while the HDMI standard charges the manufacturers a small fee per device for its use. Also, DisplayPort has a higher throughput speed for now. I say for now, as updates to these standards are always in the works. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain basic cable types and their connectors, features, and purposes. Hard drive cables. Continuing with our learning of various cable types, this video has us focusing on hard drive cables. And the first hard drive cable type I will cover is the Small Computer System Interface, or SCSI. SCSI is an older interface technology, originally designed for connecting multiple internal and external hard drives to a computer. And although SCSI was once widely used in servers and high-performance workstations, it has largely been replaced by other newer technologies due to cost and complexity. At its core, SCSI operates by connecting multiple SCSI devices together in a chain-like fashion. Each SCSI device has two SCSI ports, one for incoming data and one for outgoing data. To string multiple SCSI drives together, you typically connect the out port of one device to the in port of the next device. This creates a sequential connection, allowing data to flow from one device to the next. Next, let's discuss Integrated Drive Electronics, or IDE. IDE, also known as Parallel ATA, or PADA, 
was once the standard interface for connecting older storage devices to a computer's motherboard. IDE cables are wide, flat ribbons with multiple connectors for attaching older hard disk drives, optical drives, and other devices. However, IDE has largely been replaced by SATA due to its slower data transfer speeds and limited support for newer technologies. IDE is now mostly found in older computers and legacy systems. Moving on, we have Serial Advanced Technology Attachment, commonly known as SATA. SATA is a type of interface used to connect newer storage devices, such as newer hard disk drives and solid-state drives, to the motherboard of a computer. It's the most common type of interface found in modern computers due to its high-speed data transfer rates and ease of use. SATA cables typically have a thin, flat design with a small L-shaped connector. They are widely used in desktops, laptops, and servers for internal storage connections. Lastly, let's cover external SATA or eSATA. eSATA is an extension of the SATA interface designed specifically for connecting external storage devices. It provides the same high-speed data transfer rates as internal SATA connections but allows for the connection of devices outside of the computer case. eSATA cables resemble internal SATA cables but have stronger connectors to withstand the rigors of external use. Common use cases for eSATA include connecting external hard drives, SSDs, and optical drives to a computer for additional storage or backup purposes. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain basic cable types and their connectors, features, and purposes. Connector types and adapters. In the context of IT, wired interfaces require a cable to extend between two devices. These cables will terminate with a connector and these connectors will plug into a port on the device. These connectors facilitate the transfer of data, signals, power, or other forms of information between different entities within a computer network or between computer peripherals. In the last few videos of this course, we have discussed many different cable types and interface standards. Now it is time to discuss the connectors that sit at the end of those cables. And to get the ball rolling, we will begin with the RJ11 connector. RJ11, where the RJ stands for registered jack, is a common network cable connector used in telephone communications, dial-up internet, and DSL. The RJ11 connector can support up to six pins or positions into which wires can be inserted, but most use cases for the RJ11 connector only utilize two or four of those pins. Another registered jack connector is the RJ45 connector. RJ45 is a common network cable connector used to terminate Ethernet CAT cables, which are the most common network cables in use today. The RJ45 connector has eight pins or positions into which wires can be inserted. When placed side by side with an RJ11 connector, the RJ45 connector will appear similar in design to the RJ11 connector but will be noticeably larger. The F-type connector is a network cable connector that provides a termination point in coaxial cable systems. It embodies a threaded design that ensures steadfast connections. Designed specifically for coaxial cables, it facilitates seamless transmission of signals in various applications, such as cable television, satellite broadcasting, and broadband internet. Its threaded construction not only guarantees a secure fit, but also minimizes signal loss and interference. ST, or straight tip connectors, are an integral component in fiber optic networks, particularly in setups utilizing multi-mode fiber for shorter distance transmissions within local area networks. With their cylindrical design and push-pull connectivity, SD connectors offer a reliable solution for seamlessly connecting networking equipment in environments such as office buildings, data centers, and educational institutions. The cylindrical design ensures precise alignment between fiber optic cables and devices, 
while the push-pull mechanism facilitates swift installation and removal. The SC, or subscriber connector, is another fiber optic network connector used particularly in systems employing single-mode fiber for long-distance transmissions. Characterized by its square shape and push-pull mechanism, SC connectors provide a robust and efficient solution for interconnecting networking equipment in diverse settings such as telecommunications, enterprise networks, and internet service provider infrastructures. The LC or Lucent connector is found in more modern fiber optic networks, particularly in setups utilizing single mode fiber for high speed and long distance transmissions. With its compact and versatile design, the LC connector offers a reliable solution for interconnecting networking equipment in various environments, ranging from telecommunications and data centers to enterprise networks. Its small form factor and push-pull latch mechanism make it well-suited for high-density installations where space is limited. Punch-down blocks serve as fundamental components in telecommunications and network infrastructure, providing a reliable and efficient means of terminating and connecting copper cables. Commonly utilized in structured cabling systems, punch-down blocks offer a straightforward solution for organizing and distributing incoming and outgoing cables within a network environment. Their simple yet robust design features a series of insulation displacement contacts arranged in rows allowing cables to be securely terminated. This ease of termination makes punch-down blocks particularly suitable for quick installations and field configurations. With their ability to accommodate various cable types, including twisted pair cables commonly used in Ethernet networks, punch-down blocks facilitate the creation of organized and easily manageable cable runs. Additionally, punch-down blocks are known for their reliability and cost-effectiveness, making them a preferred choice for telecommunications infrastructure in a wide range of applications, from small offices to large-scale data centers. Next, we have USB connectors. USB connectors come in many different form factors, and since most of these should be recognizable, I will only cover some of the most common form factors. First, there's the USB Type-A connector, which has a rectangular shape and is commonly found in computers and laptops. It's used for connecting peripherals like keyboards, mice, printers, and external storage devices. Next is the mini USB connector, which is smaller and is often used in portable devices such as digital cameras, MP3 players, and older smartphones due to its compact design. Then there's the micro USB connector, which is even smaller and has become very common in mobile devices like smartphones and tablets. Finally, the USB Type-C, or just USB-C connector, has emerged as the latest standard. This USB-C connector is reversible or non-keyed, meaning you can insert a USB Type-C connector into its port with either side facing up. It also boasts higher data transfer speeds, increased power delivery, and supports various protocols. Heck, this connector is so awesome, even the Thunderbolt standard is using it. The Lightning Connector, developed by Apple, is exclusively used in devices such as Apple iPhones, iPads, and iPods. Similar to the USB-C connector, the Lightning Connector features a reversible or non-key design. Again, this means you can insert the connector into its port with either side facing up. The Lightning cable and connector offers fast data transfer speeds and supports various functionalities, including charging, data transfer, and audio output. The Lightning connector has become a standard feature in Apple's product lineup since its introduction in 2012, offering a compact and durable upgrade to Apple's outdated 30-pin connector. The DB9 connector, also known as a D-subminiature 9-pin connector, is a common interface used for serial communication in computer systems and peripherals. Named for its 9-pin configuration, the DB9 connector is characterized by its D-shaped metal shell and screw-locking mechanism, 
which ensures a secure connection. It is often found on devices such as computer serial ports, modems, printers, barcode scanners, point-of-sale systems, and industrial equipment for transmitting data over serial communication protocols. Despite being larger and less common in modern computing, the DB9 connector remains relevant in specific industries and applications where serial communication is still widely used. For one last connector, we have a power connector called a Molex connector. The Molex connector offers a robust solution for transferring electrical power within electronic devices and systems. Characterized by its versatile design and secure locking mechanism, the Molex connector ensures reliable power distribution in various applications, ranging from computers and servers to industrial machinery. With its standardized four-pin configuration and compact form factor, the Molex connector facilitates easy installation and maintenance, making it a preferred choice for computing components worldwide. Whether delivering power to hard drives, fans, or other components, the Molex connector plays a crucial role in powering the modern technological landscape. Now that we have covered all the connector types that we need to know about for the CompTIA A Plus Core 1 certification exam, let's cover one more topic, adapters. Adapters serve as indispensable tools for bridging connectivity gaps between devices with different ports and interfaces. Whether it's converting between digital and analog signals, adapting proprietary connectors to universal standards, or facilitating legacy device compatibility with modern systems, adapters play a crucial role in ensuring seamless connectivity in the ever-evolving landscape of technology. To give a few examples, we have adapters that convert from DVI to HDMI, DVI to VGA, or even DB9 to USB. Whether you're connecting monitors, printers, keyboards, or other devices, Adapters provide a flexible solution for overcoming compatibility challenges and unlocking the full potential of your devices. Exam Objective 3.2 Given a scenario, install the appropriate RAM. RAM RAM or Random Access Memory is a form of computer memory that stores working data or programs currently in use by a computer. RAM is also the type of memory used for the system memory of most computing devices. Unlike storage devices such as hard drives or SSD, RAM is volatile memory, meaning that its contents are lost when the computer is powered off. RAM allows the CPU to quickly access and manipulate data, making it essential for running programs and multitasking on a computer. It acts as the computer's short-term memory providing fast read and write speeds to support the efficient execution of tasks. The amount of RAM in a computer is an important factor in determining its performance. More RAM allows the computer to store and access larger amounts of data, which is particularly useful when running memory-intensive programs or when several applications are open simultaneously. On the other hand, insufficient RAM can lead to slower performance as the computer may not be able to store all the data it needs in system memory all at the same time. Luckily, when our physical RAM is not enough, most systems will allow us to use virtual RAM. Virtual RAM is a memory management technique used by operating systems to extend the available memory beyond the physical RAM installed on a computer. It allows the system to use a portion of the computer storage, typically a hard drive, as an extension of RAM. Virtual RAM is needed because some programs and tasks may require more memory than the physical RAM available. And without virtual RAM, the system may become limited in its ability to run multiple programs simultaneously or handle large processes. Now let's take a look at virtual memory in action and discuss each of its parts. First up, virtual memory involves a page file also known as a swap file or virtual memory file. This file is a designated area on the hard disk that acts as a repository when the physical RAM becomes fully occupied. 
When a program requires more memory than there is available RAM, the operating system temporarily stores the less frequently used or inactive pages of that program in the page file. This frees up space in the physical RAM to accommodate the more actively used pages of other programs. Next, we have page swapping. As the user switches between different programs, the operating system uses a technique called page swapping. It moves pages in and out of the physical RAM and the page file as needed. When a program that has pages stored in the page file becomes active again, its pages are moved back to the RAM for faster access. While virtual memory enables the system to handle larger processes and multitasking effectively, using the page file on the hard drive is slower than accessing data directly from the RAM. This is because drive access times are significantly slower compared to RAM access times. Excessive reliance on virtual memory due to insufficient physical RAM can lead to performance slowdowns where the system spends more time swapping pages in and out of the page file than executing actual tasks. Exam Objective 3.2 Given a scenario, install the appropriate RAM. RAM types. In computing, the need for innovation and adaptation is constant. This principle rings especially true in the world of computer memory. As computing demands continue to evolve, so too must the technologies that support them. Hence, we find ourselves presented with a wide range of RAM types, each tailored to meet specific requirements. As we journey through the diverse landscape of RAM types, we'll first explore the evolutionary realm of dual inline memory modules, or DIMMs. These memory modules come in various form factors and are designed to fit into corresponding slots on the motherboard. It is important to note that DIMMs are keyed, meaning they have notches in specific locations to ensure proper alignment during installation. Attempting to force a DIMM into place can cause damage to both the module and the motherboard. Therefore, it is best to avoid that by verifying the memory requirements of the motherboard prior to any installation. Now a DIMM is merely the physical packaging for a memory type known as DDR, or Double Data Rate Memory. It provides a standardized form factor and interface, allowing for easy installation and integration of DDR memory into a computer system. DIMMs feature a series of electrical contacts along both edges of the module, which align with corresponding slots on the motherboard. This design enables a secure and reliable connection between the memory module and the system, ensuring efficient data transfer and memory operation. Additionally, DIMMs are available in various configurations to accommodate different DDR standards. Some of these DDR standards include DDR3, DDR4, and DDR5. DDR3 RAM was a prevalent standard known for its commendable performance and efficiency, catering to various computing needs from around 2007 to 2015. However, with the advancement of technology, DDR4 emerged around 2014, offering higher data transfer rates, lower power consumption, and increased memory capacity support. DDR4 gradually replaced DDR3 as the mainstream memory standard. Now, DDR5 RAM started to appear in the market around 2020, taking this evolution further. It promises even higher speeds, greater bandwidth, and improved power efficiency. DDR5 represents the future of memory technology, shaping the landscape of modern computing, at least for now. Transitioning onwards, we'll cover another type of DIMM, the small outline dual inline memory module. These compact yet powerful memory modules, commonly referred to as SO DIMMs, are specifically engineered for use in laptops and other space constrained devices. Despite their smaller size, SO DIMMs offer performance and functionality comparable to their larger DIMM counterparts, making them indispensable components in portable computing solutions. Next up, we have ECC RAM. In server environments where data integrity is paramount, error correction code 
or ECC RAM stands out as an indispensable component. Unlike standard RAM modules, ECC RAM incorporates additional circuitry specifically designed for error detection and correction. This sophisticated technology, for an increased fee of course, enables ECC RAM to identify and rectify memory errors on the fly, ensuring that data remains accurate and reliable, even in the face of potential hardware glitches or transient faults. In highly critical systems, where even the smallest data corruption could have significant consequences, such as financial transactions or medical records, the robust error handling capabilities of ECC RAM provide peace of mind and safeguard against potential data loss or corruption. Therefore, ECC RAM emerges as the preferred choice for servers where reliability and data integrity are non-negotiable priorities. Lastly, what good is it to go out and purchase some RAM if you can't decipher its specifications? Luckily, I got you covered. Using this example RAM module behind me, I will walk you through its specifications piece by piece. The 8GB on the left refers to the capacity of the RAM, which is 8 gigabytes in this example. This specification tells you how much data the RAM can hold at once. More gigabytes means you can store more data simultaneously. Next, DDR4 stands for Double Data Rate Fourth Generation. This is the type of RAM technology used. 2666 indicates the speed of the RAM, and the unit of measure is megahertz. Specifically, it's 2666 million cycles per second. A higher megahertz rating means the RAM can transfer data faster leading to better overall performance. Lastly, we have PC4-20-1300. This is another way of expressing the speed of the RAM, particularly in terms of its theoretical maximum bandwidth. The PC4 part denotes that it's DBR4 memory. As for the 21300, this indicates that the RAM can theoretically transfer up to 21300 megabytes per second of data. Now to put it all together, this stick of RAM has a capacity of 8 gigabytes, uses DDR4 technology, is capable of operating at a speed of 2,666 megahertz, and has a bandwidth of 21,300 megabytes per second. Exam Objective 3.2 Given a scenario, install the appropriate RAM. RAM Memory Channels as we have discussed previously in this course, RAM, or Random Access Memory, is the component in your computer that stores data temporarily for quick access by the CPU. Now, when we talk about RAM slots on a motherboard, we're referring to the physical slots on the motherboard where you install your RAM modules. Each RAM slot is strategically positioned on the motherboard to ensure efficient communication between the RAM modules and the CPU. The number of RAM slots varies depending on the motherboard's design and form factor. Some motherboards may have two slots, while others can have four or more. These slots are not interchangeable, as they are designed to accommodate specific types of RAM modules, such as DDR3, DDR4, or DDR5, and may have different capacities and speeds. It's essential to consult the motherboard specifications to ensure compatibility when selecting and installing RAM modules. Next, let's discuss the memory bus or memory channel between the CPU and the memory slots. This pathway determines how efficiently data can be transferred between the RAM and the CPU. Imagine your computer system as a bustling city with the CPU acting as the central command center and the RAM as a storage facility. The memory bus or channel can be likened to a highway that connects and facilitates the smooth flow of traffic or data between the RAM and CPU. This pathway is absolutely crucial because it determines how efficiently data can be transferred between the RAM and the CPU, which are the two most vital components of your computer system. Just like a well-designed transportation network enhances the city's productivity and connectivity, 
An optimized memory bus ensures that data can be accessed and processed swiftly, leading to faster overall system performance. Now, let's break down the different RAM memory channel configurations based on the number of channels. In a standard single-channel configuration, data travels along a single pathway between the CPU and RAM, much like a single-lane road. While the setup is functional, it can sometimes lead to bottlenecks, especially when the CPU demands a high volume of data. You can recognize a single-channel configuration by observing that only one RAM module is installed, or if multiple modules are present, they will not be installed with any significant pairing. A dual-channel configuration doubles the data transfer rate by utilizing two pathways between the CPU and RAM. Think of it as upgrading from a single-lane road to a dual-lane highway, effectively doubling the capacity for data traffic. To implement dual-channel configuration, you typically install a single RAM module or identical RAM modules in pairs, such as two sticks of the same capacity and speed, into specific slots on the motherboard. These slots are often color-coded, one color per channel or labeled to indicate where the modules should be placed, in order to achieve dual-channel operation. When the computer system detects at least one RAM module in each channel, it automatically engages dual channel mode, allowing for synchronized communication between the CPU and RAM. This synchronization ensures that data is distributed evenly across the channels, maximizing throughput and minimizing latency. Triple channel configuration takes it a step further by employing three pathways between the CPU and RAM. You can picture this as a major highway with three lanes, capable of handling substantial data traffic with ease. Although less common than dual-channel setups, it offers even higher bandwidth for data transfer. Identifying a triple-channel setup is relatively straightforward. Just look for RAM slots to be in multiples of three. These slots are often situated next to each other and may be color-coded or labeled to indicate their purpose in facilitating triple-channel operation. Finally, we have quad-channel configurations. In the world of memory, a quad-channel configuration stands as the epitome of efficiency, boasting four dedicated pathways or channels for data to seamlessly traverse between the CPU and RAM. This configuration can be pictured as an expansive four-lane highway. When identifying a quad-channel setup, it's important not to confuse it with a dual-channel configuration. In a quad-channel setup, you will typically observe a motherboard with RAM slots in multiples of four. These slots are strategically positioned and may or may not be color-coded, depending on the motherboard's design. For instance, if there are eight slots, they may or may not be color-coded to indicate proper slot pairing for quad-channel operation, while a motherboard with only four slots may not utilize color coding at all. If you found this all a bit confusing, there is no need to worry. Each motherboard, when purchased, will come with documentation that can provide guidance on the proper installation and configuration of RAM modules. Exam Objective 3.3 Given a scenario, select and install storage devices. Hard Disk Drives Storage drives are computing components that are designed to store digital data. In contrast to the temporary or short-term storage offered by RAM, storage drives provide the long-term memory of the system, holding everything from the operating system and software applications to personal files and documents, even when the system is powered off. A hard disk drive, commonly abbreviated as HDD, is one such type of storage drive. Essentially, an HDD is a storage device where digital data is stored magnetically on a spinning disk. HDDs are known for their large storage capacities and relatively lower cost compared to other storage technologies. They are widely used in desktop computers, laptops, and servers. However, HDDs are mechanical devices and are susceptible to wear and tear over time. 
They can also be slower in terms of data access when compared to other storage drives. The basic structure of an HDD consists of one or more magnetic disks or platters that rotate at high speeds. Each platter has a magnetic coating that stores the data. The platters are stacked vertically on a spindle, and the entire assembly is enclosed in a protective casing. To read or write data, an HDD uses a read and write head that hovers just above the surface of the rotating platters. The read and write head moves rapidly across the spinning platter's surface to access the desired data. When reading data, the head detects the magnetic changes on the platter's surface and converts them into electrical signals that can be processed by the computer. When writing data, the head applies a magnetic field to the platter to encode the information. It might go without saying, but keep these devices away from strong magnets as they could seriously damage an HDD drive. Now that we know how an HDD drive works, let's talk about read and write speeds. The speed of the rotating platter in a hard disk drive is measured in revolutions per minute or RPM. This measurement indicates the number of full rotations the disk completes within a minute. This metric serves as a critical factor in determining the performance of the HDD directly influencing its read and write speeds. The significance of RPM lies in its impact on data access times. With all other factors being equal, higher RPM generally translates into faster access times because the read and write head can traverse the spinning platter more swiftly, reaching the desired data on the disk more rapidly. For instance, consider a hard drive operating at 7,200 RPM. It typically boasts quicker read and write speeds compared to one spinning at 5,400 RPM. Similarly, HDDs with even higher speeds, such as 10,000 or even 15,000 RPM, further enhance access times, facilitating faster data retrieval and storage operations. Lastly, we have the form factors for hard disk drives. Form factors refer to the physical dimensions and specifications of the HDD, influencing its compatibility and usage in various devices. Among the array of form factors available, two of the most prevalent sizes are 3.5 inches and 2.5 inches, each catering to distinct computing needs and environments. The 3.5-inch form factor is a staple in desktop and server computing setups. Renowned for its larger size, this form factor accommodates spacious storage capacities, making it ideal for desktop computers that often require ample storage for applications or multimedia files, and in server and data center deployments where robust storage solutions are paramount. The generous physical dimensions of the 3.5-inch HDD allow for enhanced airflow and cooling within desktop computer cases, contributing to optimal performance and longevity. Conversely, the 2.5-inch form factor is predominantly associated with laptops and portable computing devices. Characterized by its compact size, the 2.5-inch HDD offers a space-efficient solution tailored to the sleek and slender designs of laptops and portable devices. Despite its smaller footprint, the 2.5-inch HDD maintains commendable storage capacities, striking a balance between performance and portability for on-the-go computing needs. Furthermore, it's worth noting the emergence of even smaller form factors, such as the 1.8-inch HDD. The 1.8-inch form factor embodies the epitome of miniaturization, catering to scenarios where space constraints dictate hardware specifications. Exam Objective 3.3 Given a scenario, select and install storage devices. Solid-state drives A solid-state drive, or SSD, is a type of storage device where digital data is stored on non-volatile flash memory chips. SSDs have many benefits when compared to HDDs. SSDs are faster, that means faster at accessing and storing data, including personal files, software applications, and operating system files. 
They are also more resistant to physical shocks, vibrations, and extreme temperatures due to their lack of mechanical components. Additionally, with no moving parts, SSDs can operate silent. While SSDs offer many advantages over traditional HDDs, they are generally more expensive per unit of storage. However, the cost of SSDs has been decreasing over time, making them more affordable and popular for both personal and professional use. The main component of an SSD is NAND flash memory, which is a type of non-volatile memory that can retain data for long periods without the need for power. Access to the NAND flash memory is provided by the SSD controller, which acts as the interface between the computer and the flash memory. The controller manages data read and write operations. The last piece of the puzzle is the cache. To enhance performance, SSDs often incorporate a cache or high-speed buffer that stores frequently accessed data for quicker retrieval. Solid-state drives communicate with the computer through different interfaces, each tailored to provide varying levels of performance and compatibility. SATA, or Serial Advanced Technology Attachment, stands as a widely utilized interface for SSDs, offering decent speeds and broad compatibility with most computers. This interface allows for efficient data transfer between the SSD and the system's motherboard. While SATA SSDs may not achieve the same blazing speeds as some other communication interfaces, they remain a popular choice due to their reliability and widespread support across computing platforms. In contrast, Peripheral Component Interconnect Express, or PCIe, represents a significant advancement in SSD connectivity, offering faster data transfer rates compared to SATA. PCID connected SSDs directly connect to the computer's motherboard through PCIe slots, which are dedicated pathways for high-speed communication. By bypassing traditional storage controllers, PCID connected SSDs leverage the inherent speed of the PCIe interface, unlocking greater bandwidth potential. This setup enables faster access to stored data, enhancing overall system performance, and is particularly favored in high-performance computing environments. Building upon the PCIe connection, Non-Volatile Memory Express, or NVMEs, is a specialized protocol designed explicitly to further optimize SSD performance. It is tailored for flash memory technology, reducing latency and maximizing bandwidth to deliver exceptional speed and responsiveness. NVMe SSDs typically utilize PCIe as their physical interface, meaning they connect directly to the motherboard via PCIe slots. By leveraging the high-speed capabilities of PCIe, NVMe SSDs achieve remarkable performance levels, making them highly suitable for demanding tasks such as data analytics, content creation, and gaming. This close relationship between NVMEs and PCIe ensures that the protocol fully exploits the high-speed communication pathways provided by PCIe slots, resulting in superior SSD performance. Furthermore, SSDs come in various form factors to accommodate different devices and configurations. Two form factors we need to know about for the CompTIA plus Core 1 certification exam are MSATA and M.2. MSATA, short for Mini SATA, is a compact form factor used for SSDs, primarily in laptops, ultrabooks, and small form factor PCs. Unlike traditional SATA SSDs, which use a larger connector and cable, MSATA SSDs feature a smaller rectangular form factor. This allows them to fit into tight spaces within the device while still providing high-speed storage capabilities. MSATA SSDs typically connect directly to the motherboard via an MSATA slot, eliminating the need for additional cables and connectors. As for M.2, this form factor is commonly used for solid-state drives in modern computing devices. 
Unlike traditional SATA or M-SATA SSDs, the M.2 SSD utilizes a slim and rectangular design, resembling a stick of gum in appearance. This compact form factor allows M.2 SSDs to be installed directly onto the motherboard or in dedicated M.2 slots without the need for cables or connectors. M.2 SSDs come in different lengths and widths, denoted by various key types, ensuring compatibility with different devices and motherboards. Exam Objective 3.3 Given a scenario, select and install storage devices. RAID At its core, RAID or Redundant Array of Independent Disks is a technology used to combine multiple hard drives into a single unit to improve data performance, reliability, or both. It operates by distributing or replicating data across these disks in a strategic manner, offering various configurations tailored to specific needs within IT infrastructures, ranging from personal computers to enterprise-level servers. Additionally, each of these RAID solutions also referenced as RAID levels, will have its own unique approach to redundancy and performance. RAID 0, for instance, prioritizes speed while also maintaining a maximum storage capacity. In this setup, data is striped across two or more disks, where stripe refers to the method of dividing up and distributing data across multiple hard drives. Or to state this another way, each block of data is sequentially written to each disk in the array. RAID 0, however, does not offer redundancy. Worse, if one disk fails, all data is compromised. If you are following along with the image behind me, each blue cylindrical column represents a hard drive. Each letter, A through E, represents a block of data, and the numbers, 1 through 5, are used to represent the sequential order in which the divided parts of a block of data are written to the drive array. Our next RAID level, RAID 1, operates like a mirror. Data is duplicated or mirrored across two disks, ensuring that if one fails, the other retains all the data. While this type of RAID configuration offers redundancy, it doesn't enhance performance in the way RAID 0 does. Then there is RAID 5, which strikes a balance between RAID 0 and RAID 1. It employs striping, just like RAID 0, but introduces an element called parity. Parity provides a means to reconstruct data if a single disk in the array fails or becomes degraded. This RAID level offers a bit of both performance and redundancy, but does require a minimum of three drives to configure. Lastly. RAID 10, often referred to as RAID 1 plus 0, merges the striping technique of RAID 0 with the mirroring capabilities of RAID 1. This combination allows RAID 10 to deliver both fast performance and data redundancy. You will, however, need a minimum of four drives for this type of configuration. Exam Objective 3.3, given a scenario, select and install storage devices. Removable Storage Removable storage devices offer users a convenient way to store and transport data. One common type of removable storage is the flash drive. A flash drive is a type of portable storage device where digital data is stored on non-volatile flash memory chips. This definition may look similar to the definition of an SSD drive. Well, it should. Flash drives and SSDs use the same flash memory chips to store data. The difference is that flash drives are small and compact, making them portable. A flash drive may also be called a thumb drive or a USB flash drive if it has a USB connector. Flash drives have a connector or interface on one end, which plugs into a computer, laptop, or other compatible device. The interface provides both data transfer and power to the flash drive, eliminating the need for additional cables or power adapters. Once connected to a computer, the flash drive appears as a removable storage device in the operating system. 
From there, you can simply drag and drop files or folders onto the drive to store them. Similarly, you can copy files from the flash drive to your computer for accessing or editing. Another type of removable storage is memory cards. These cards also use flash memory technology to store and transfer data. However, there are some differences in terms of form factors. With memory cards, each form factor has its own unique characteristics and applications. For example, secure digital or SD cards are among the most widely used memory card formats. They come in a standard size and are commonly found in devices like digital cameras and camcorders. SD cards offer moderate storage capacities and are renowned for their reliability and compatibility across a wide range of devices. They are suitable for storing photos, videos, music, and other multimedia files. Mini SD cards are a smaller variant of the SD card format, designed for use in compact electronic devices where space is limited. While they offer the same functionality as standard SD cards, their smaller size makes them ideal for devices like smartphones and GPS units. However, mini SD cards are less common nowadays as they have largely been supplanted by the even smaller micro SD format. But don't let their compact dimensions fool you. Micro SD cards offer impressive storage capacities and are widely used in smartphones, tablets, and wearable devices. Another form factor is Compact Flash, or CF for short. These cards are a different type of memory card commonly used in professional-grade digital cameras and other high-performance devices. CF cards are larger and thicker than SD cards, featuring a robust design that offers increased durability and reliability, making them well-suited for demanding environments. And then there are XD cards, short for Extreme Digital. These memory cards were developed by Olympus and Fujifilm as a proprietary memory card format for digital cameras. While they were popular for a time, XD cards have become less common in recent years, largely replaced by SD and micro SD cards. They offer moderate storage capacities and are generally compatible with devices that support the XD format. Last up for our removable storage types, we have optical drives. An optical drive is a type of storage device where digital data is stored optically on a spinning disk. Optical drives are classified based on the type of optical disks they can read and write to. The three main types of optical disks are CDs or compact disks, DVDs or digital versatile disks, and Blu-ray disks. As for how an optical drive works, they consist of a tray or slot where you insert the disc. When you insert a disc, the drive uses a laser beam to read the data stored on the disc's surface. The laser scans the disc, reflecting off its surface, and the drive interprets the reflected signals as digital data, such as audio, video, or computer files. Similarly, when writing data to a disc, the optical drive uses a laser to etch, or burn information onto the disk surface. This process creates pits and lands on the disk that represent the data being written. Once the data is written, it can be read by any compatible optical drive. Another topic worth discussing with regard to optical disks is their storage limits. According to the CompTIA official study guide, the maximum storage limit for a CD is 700 megabytes. That is roughly 74 minutes of uncompressed stereo digital audio. The maximum storage limit for a DVD is approximately 17 gigabytes, and the maximum storage limit for a Blu ray disc is 128 gigabytes. Exam Objective 3.4 Given a scenario, install and configure motherboards, central processing units, and add on cards motherboard connector types. This video will have us exploring the various types of connectors found on motherboards. Some of these we have covered earlier in this course, but there will be a few new details and a few new connector types that will be included as well, so it is best to pay attention to avoid missing anything. With that said, 
Our first motherboard connector type will be PCI. Peripheral Component Interconnect, or PCI for short, is a standard expansion connector or slot that is commonly found on older computer motherboards. These slots enable users to connect various expansion cards. Examples include sound cards for improved audio output, network adapters for seamless internet connectivity, and graphics cards for enhanced visual performance. While PCI slots are gradually becoming less prevalent in modern motherboard designs, they retain significance in legacy systems and specific niche applications where older hardware configurations persist. Moving on, we have PCI's more contemporary replacement, PCIe or PCI Express. In recent years, PCIe has risen as the leading standard for expansion slots in modern motherboard designs, replacing the traditional PCI architecture. The PCIe interface boasts several advantages over its predecessor, notably providing significantly higher bandwidth and faster data transfer rates. This enhanced performance makes PCIe particularly well-suited for demanding computing tasks ranging from immersive gaming experiences to resource-intensive multimedia editing projects. Moreover, PCIe's scalability and versatility are evident in its various slot sizes, including by 1 by 4 by 8 and by 16 configurations. Each designation corresponds to the number of lanes allocated for data transfer, allowing for tailored connectivity solutions that cater to diverse hardware requirements. Among the essential power connector types for motherboards, we have the 20-pin, 20 24-pin, and 20-plus-4-pin 20 connectors. The 20-pin connector was a standard for older motherboards, but has largely been replaced by the more robust 24-pin connector. This 24-pin connector provides additional power for modern systems with more advanced components and higher power requirements. As for the 20 plus 4 pin connector, this offers flexibility by combining the 20 pin and 24 pin configurations into a single connector. This design allows compatibility with both older and newer motherboards, ensuring seamless integration across a range of hardware configurations. Next, we have a few motherboard connector types that are used to connect hard drives to the system. Serial Advanced Technology Attachment, or SATA connectors, are one such connector type. They are used to connect storage devices such as hard disk drives, HDBs, and solid-state drives, SSDs, to the motherboard. SATA offers high-speed data transfer rates and is widely used in modern computers for connecting internal storage devices, providing reliable storage solutions for various applications. External Serial Advanced Technology Attachment, or eSATA ports, are external SATA connectors that allow users to connect external storage devices, such as external hard drives directly to the motherboard. eSATA offers faster data transfer speeds compared to USB connections, making it a preferred choice for users requiring high-speed external storage solutions. As for M.2, this connector type is used in conjunction with a cutting-edge interface that is revolutionizing storage solutions in modern computer systems. These compact and versatile connectors enable direct attachment of solid-state drives to the motherboard, offering unparalleled performance and flexibility. Additionally, their diminutive size and low profile make them ideal for compact builds and portable devices. Last up, we have motherboard header connectors. Headers on the motherboard serve as vital connectors that link various internal components, offering a versatile platform for integrating peripherals and accessories into the computer system. These connectors, often located along the edges of the motherboard, establish connections with components mounted within the computer case. One of their primary functions is facilitating the connection of USB ports enabling seamless integration of external devices such as keyboards, mice, printers, and storage drives.
These headers typically connect to ports located on the front or top panel of the computer case, allowing for easy access and convenient connectivity. Moreover, headers play a pivotal role in linking audio jacks, establishing a pathway for transmitting audio signals between the system and external speakers, headphones, microphones, and other audio devices. These connectors typically link to audio ports located on the front or top panel of the computer case, providing users with immersive audio experiences while engaging in gaming, multimedia playback, and communication. Front panel headers on the motherboard enable the connection of essential controls, including power buttons, reset buttons, and LED indicators directly to the case. By linking these components to the motherboard, Users can conveniently manage system power, perform resets, and monitor system status from the front panel of the case. Additionally, headers for fans provide a means of connecting case fans, CPU fans, and other cooling components directly to the motherboard. These connectors facilitate system cooling and optimize thermal performance by regulating fan speeds based on temperature sensors located throughout the case. Exam Objective 3.4. Given a scenario, install and configure motherboards, central processing units, and add-on cards. Motherboard Form Factors. As a refresher, a motherboard is the main circuit board in a computing device that connects and allows communication between all the other computing components. Another way of saying that is to refer to the motherboard as the backbone that ties a computer's components together. Without it, none of the computer's components could interact. It sits at the heart of the system, and all other components must align with it in terms of compatibility. Among the diverse array of motherboards available, two prominent form factors are the Advanced Technology Extended, or AETX, and the Information Technology Extended, or ITX. Each of these form factors is uniquely tailored to suit specific computing needs. ATX motherboards, renowned for their widespread adoption, are favored for their versatility and expansive capabilities. These motherboards typically boast larger dimensions, providing ample space for accommodating multiple connectors. Their generous size also allows for the integration of various components and peripherals, making them well-suited for larger desktop computing environments. A distinguishing feature of AETX motherboards lies in their extensive support for multiple expansion slots. These slots facilitate the installation of additional components such as graphics cards, network adapters, and other add-on cards, thereby enhancing the system's capabilities and versatility. Furthermore, ATX motherboards commonly feature four or more memory slots, or DIMM slots, enabling users to populate their systems with ample RAM for optimal performance. Additionally, they offer multiple SATA ports, facilitating the connection of storage drives such as HDDs and SSDs alongside various onboard headers for peripherals and accessories, ensuring comprehensive connectivity options. In contrast, ITX motherboards embody a compact and space-efficient design, tailored for environments where size constraints are paramount, such as small form factor PCs, while they may only offer a single expansion slot and often only two memory slots, they are still likely to offer more than enough SATA ports for connecting multiple storage drives. Exam Objective 3.4 Given a scenario, install and configure motherboards, central processing units, and add-on cards. Motherboard compatibility. CPU socket compatibility is an important factor when selecting a motherboard, particularly in desktop computing where performance and functionality requirements vary wildly. At the forefront of the CPU market are Intel and AMD, each offering their distinct lineup of processors tailored to various computing needs. Motherboards are intricately designed to cater to the specific requirements of these processors, whether from Intel or AMD. Therefore, an Intel CPU cannot be installed in a motherboard intended for an AMD CPU, and vice versa.
This is primarily due to the different CPU socket types they used. Intel processors typically use an LGA type socket, which is short for LAND grid array. In this configuration, the CPU underside is devoid of pins, featuring instead a flat surface with an array of contact points or pads. This corresponds to the motherboard socket, which contains tiny holes where metal contacts reside. When installed, these contacts align precisely with the pads on the CPU, creating a direct and secure connection. This design facilitates easy installation and removal of the CPU, reducing the risk of damage during handling. Conversely, AMD processors commonly utilize PGA, or pin grid array sockets. In this configuration, the CPU itself contains a grid of pins that align with corresponding holes on the motherboard socket, creating a grid-like pattern for connection. When the CPU is installed, these pins penetrate into the motherboard's holes, establishing electrical contact with the circuitry beneath. This arrangement ensures a secure and stable connection between the CPU and the motherboard, facilitating efficient communication and data transfer. Transitioning to server environments, multi-socket motherboards become essential to meet the demands of intensive workloads and multitasking. Unlike single-socket motherboards prevalent in desktop computing, server environments require increased processing power and scalability. Multi-socket motherboards, capable of accommodating multiple CPUs, are engineered to support the installation and operation of two or more processors simultaneously. Whether they are equipped with LGA or PGA sockets, server motherboards are meticulously designed to deliver enhanced processing capabilities and unparalleled reliability, making them indispensable in enterprise settings and data centers. Mobile devices, in stark contrast to their desktop and server counterparts, operate on a distinct architecture, commonly incorporating ARM-based CPUs. These processors are renowned for striking a delicate balance between performance and energy efficiency, making them particularly well-suited for the demands of mobile computing, engineered to deliver robust processing capabilities while consuming minimal power ARM-based CPUs are encapsulated within a compact footprint. This compactness is paramount in the design of mobile devices, where space constraints and portability are critical considerations. Consequently, ARM-based CPUs have become the cornerstone of mobile computing, enabling devices like smartphones and tablets to deliver optimal performance while prolonging battery life, thereby enhancing the overall user experience. Exam Objective 3.4. Given a scenario, install and configure motherboards, central processing units, and add-on cards. CPU Architecture. CPU architecture influences the performance and functionalities of computing devices. At its core, CPU architecture encompasses various structural elements and design principles that govern the operation of processors. One of the fundamental components of CPU architecture lies in its instruction sets, which determines the different operations that a processor can perform or execute. Within this realm, two primary families emerge as prominent players, x86 and x64. The terms x86 and x64 refer to different types of instruction sets used by CPUs. x86 also known as a 32-bit processor, was the predecessor to x64. It laid the groundwork for modern computing but had limitations in terms of overall performance. Despite its shortcomings, the x86 architecture was the standard for a considerable period, powering countless computers and devices around the world. x64, on the other hand, is a 64-bit architecture that has become very common in today's computers. This newer architecture offers significant improvements in overall performance compared to the older x86 architecture. Now that you understand the x86 and x64 designations, 
Let's take a closer look at the difference between 32-bit and 64-bit CPUs. 32-bit CPUs are appropriately named as they support instructions that are 32 bits in size. And since you are so smart, I am sure you have already deduced that 64-bit CPUs are designed to handle 64-bit instructions. This has a trickle-down effect. First up is the operating system. A 32-bit processor is compatible with a 32-bit operating system, while a 64-bit processor is compatible with both 64-bit and 32-bit operating systems. This trickles down a little further, with the same arrangement holding true for applications. A 32-bit operating system is capable of running a 32-bit application, while a 64-bit operating system is capable of running 64-bit applications and most 32-bit applications. Additionally, when it comes to memory, a 32-bit CPU will limit the amount of RAM that can be recognized by a computing system to 4 gigabytes. 64-bit systems also have a limit, but the number is super large and not a real concern. Another significant development in CPU architecture is the emergence of advanced RISC machine or ARM processors. ARM processors represent a departure from traditional CPU architectures, offering distinct advantages in energy efficiency and performance. These processors have garnered widespread adoption across various computing platforms, particularly in mobile devices. ARM processors are renowned for their energy efficiency, making them ideal for battery-powered devices like smartphones and tablets. Their design prioritizes power optimization, allowing for longer battery life without sacrificing performance. As a result, ARM-based devices can deliver impressive processing power while consuming minimal energy, enhancing user experience and mobility. When discussing CPU architecture, it is also important to consider the number of cores housed within a processor. A single core processor operates with just one processing unit, meaning it can only handle one task at a time. While single core processors were once standard in computing devices, they have gradually been replaced by multi-core alternatives due to their inherent limitations in multitasking and processing power. Now, let's turn our attention to multi-core processors. Unlike their single-core counterparts, multi-core processors incorporate multiple processing cores onto a single chip. These cores function independently of one another, enabling the processor to execute multiple tasks simultaneously. This parallel processing capability significantly enhances overall system performance and multitasking capabilities. By leveraging multiple cores, multi-core processors can distribute computing workloads more efficiently, resulting in faster task execution and improved responsiveness. Whether it's running demanding applications, handling numerous background processes, or multitasking between various tasks, Multi-core processors excel in managing diverse workloads with greater efficiency and speed. Multi-threading stands as another integral feature intertwined with CPU architecture, revolutionizing how processors handle tasks. Fundamentally, multi-threading empowers a processor core to simultaneously execute multiple threads or sequences of instructions thereby maximizing the utilization of CPU resources and bolstering responsiveness in multitasking environments. In a conventional setup, imagine a scenario where a processor core is tasked with handling two separate threads simultaneously, editing a document in Microsoft Word and loading web pages in Google Chrome. In this traditional configuration, the processor may experience idle periods while waiting for data retrieval or completing certain operations within each application. However, with the introduction of multi-threading capabilities, the processor can seamlessly switch between executing different threads, effectively filling these idle gaps with productive work. For instance, while one thread is processing text changes in Word, the processor can concurrently handle the task of loading web pages in Chrome. This agile multitasking ensures that the processor remains actively engaged, 
efficiently utilizing CPU resources even amidst diverse workloads. As a result, multi-threading optimizes CPU utilization and enhances overall system efficiency and responsiveness, allowing users to seamlessly navigate between editing documents and browsing the web without experiencing delays or slowdowns. Lastly, modern CPU architectures frequently incorporate support for virtualization, a technology that enables the simultaneous operation of multiple virtual machines, or VM, on a single physical CPU. This capability is particularly valuable in enterprise environments where there is a need to efficiently utilize hardware resources while maintaining flexibility in deploying and managing IT infrastructure. Virtualization support in CPUs, such as Intel's virtualization technology, known as VT and AMD virtualization, known as AMD-V, play a crucial role in enabling efficient virtualization solutions. These technologies provide hardware-level support for virtualization, enhancing the performance and security of virtualized environments. With virtualization support, the CPU can efficiently allocate resources to multiple virtual machines, ensuring optimal CPU utilization. Exam Objective 3.4 Given a scenario, install and configure motherboards, central processing units, and add-on cards. Expansion cards. Expansion cards, also known as add-on cards, are peripheral devices that can be inserted into the expansion slots of a computer's motherboard to enhance its functionality. These cards are essential components in modern computing systems, allowing users to customize and upgrade their machines according to their needs. One common type of expansion card is the sound card, which is responsible for processing audio signals and producing sound output. By adding a sound card to a computer, users can achieve better audio quality and support for advanced audio features such as surround sound and digital audio processing. Another important expansion card is the video card, commonly referred to as a graphics card. This card is tasked with rendering graphics and images on the computer's display. Now, let me warn you. The commonly used terms GPU, which stands for Graphical Processing Unit, and Graphics Card are often used interchangeably by those who are not lucky enough to be taking my course. But I will make sure you know better. A GPU and a graphics card actually refer to different aspects of a computing system. To demonstrate, let me strip off the cooling unit and the cover on the graphics card behind me. That's better. Okay, here is the GPU. It is just a part of the graphics card and only handles the processing. A graphics card is actually much more. A graphics card has its own circuit board, dedicated memory, the GPU of course, and interface ports. Additionally, you should know that the graphics card's dedicated memory also known as VRAM, which is short for video, random access memory is responsible for storing graphical data, ensuring rapid access by the GPU for rendering purposes. The quantity and speed of this VRAM has a significant impact on a system's graphics performance. Higher VRAM capacity allows for the handling of more complex and detailed graphics, resulting in a smoother visual experience. Next, we have capture cards. These sophisticated expansion cards serve a distinct purpose in the world of computing. Their primary function is to capture audio and video signals from a variety of external sources, including cameras, microphones, and gaming consoles, for the purpose of real-time recording. This versatility makes them invaluable tools for a diverse range of users, including content creators, gamers, and professionals seeking to create high-quality audiovisual content. Lastly, we have a NIC or Network Interface Card. These expansion cards enable computers to connect to a network and acts as a communication link enabling the transfer of data. The primary function of a NIC is to convert the digital data generated by the computer into electrical signals 
that can be transmitted as an output. Also, they need to be able to receive data by converting electrical signals back into digital data as an input. NICs come in various forms, including Ethernet cards for wired connections and Wi-Fi cards for wireless connections. By adding a NIC to a computer, users can establish reliable network connectivity and access resources and services available on the network. In summary, expansion cards are essential components in modern computing systems, allowing users to enhance their computer's functionality and performance by adding specialized features. Exam Objective 3.4 Given a scenario, install and configure motherboards, central processing units, and add-on cards. Cool it. Heat is a natural byproduct of electronic operations. As such, efficient cooling methods are needed to prevent damage and maintain safe operating temperatures. Within a computing device, you are likely to find one or more of the following cooling methods in use. First up, we have a heatsink. A heatsink is a metal structure that absorbs and disperses heat generated by electronic components, such as CPUs or GPUs. It helps prevent overheating by providing a larger surface area for heat dissipation into the surrounding air through the process of convection. Heat sinks are a passive cooling device capable of minimal heat dispersion, but they can be combined with cooling fans in order to increase their efficiency. Oftentimes, computing devices output too much heat for a passive heat sink to handle, so a more common cooling method is to utilize fans. Fans are considered active cooling and improve heat dissipation by increasing the airflow across computing components. The general logic is more fans will equal more cooling, but there will be a limit. If fans still come up short and things are getting hotter, there is one more option. You can use liquid cooling. Liquid cooling offers superior cooling but comes with a higher price tag. This type of cooling would be best suited for a high-end gaming PC. In a PC, liquid cooling involves actively circulating a liquid, typically water or a coolant, through a closed-loop system. This method provides the best cooling because liquids are more efficient than air convection at dispersing heat. In summation, heat sinks are good, fans are better, and liquid is best, unless cost is an issue. One more trick up our sleeves when it comes to heat dissipation is thermal paste. Thermal paste is a specialized substance designed to facilitate the transfer of heat between electronic components, such as the CPU, and its attached heatsink. Its primary function is to bridge the microscopic gaps and imperfections that naturally exist between the mating surfaces of the CPU and the heatsink. By filling in these irregularities, thermal paste effectively eliminates air voids, ensuring intimate contact between the two surfaces. Once the thermal paste is applied, just know it won't last forever. Regular maintenance, including periodic replacement of thermal paste, will be required to maintain an effective heat transfer over time. With that said, let's take a look at how to install a CPU properly and then replace the thermal paste once it gets old. First, we need to install the CPU in its socket. Then we apply the thermal paste. Not too much. After that, it is time to attach the CPU heatsink. Now, over time, the thermal paste will dry out. When that happens, detach the heatsink and remove the old thermal paste. Then apply fresh thermal paste. Again, not too much. Reattach the CPU heatsink, and you're done. Now, in the event that any of these cooling components fail to perform effectively, the system will be at risk of overheating. When a computer overheats, several detrimental effects can occur, potentially leading to system instability, performance degradation, and hardware damage. Initially, as temperatures rise beyond safe operating limits, the system may throttle down its performance to reduce heat generation, resulting in decreased processing power and slower operation. Continual overheating can cause components such as the CPU, GPU, and motherboard to degrade over time, 
shortening their lifespan and increasing the likelihood of premature failure. In severe cases, prolonged exposure to high temperatures can lead to thermal runaway, where components reach temperatures beyond their design limits, causing malfunctions, system crashes, and even permanent damage. Luckily, most computing devices have built-in safety mechanisms such as automatic shutdowns to prevent catastrophic failures, though this may still lead to interrupted workflows and data loss. Overall, computer overheating poses significant risks to system reliability, performance, and longevity, highlighting the importance of effective cooling solutions and proactive temperature monitoring and management. Exam Objective 3.4 Given a scenario, install and configure motherboards, central processing units, and add-on cards. Encryption Understanding the distinction between plain text and ciphertext is the very first step when venturing into the expansive realm of encryption and its study, termed cryptography. So let's take that first step and begin with a quick look into plain text. Picture yourself jotting down a message to a friend. This message, in its original, readable form, is what we term as plain text. In the realm of IT, plain text is any data or text that has not yet undergone encryption, making it readable by both humans and computers. But here's where the plot thickens. When we aim to safeguard our data or message, especially in the digital domain, we resort to encryption. This encrypted form of our plain text is what we refer to as ciphertext. Think of ciphertext as a coded message. To the untrained eye, it appears as mere gibberish. Now, please allow me to reiterate and further define this concept. Plain text is data presented in a format that is immediately understandable and accessible. It's in its most basic, unaltered state, free from any form of encryption or coding. This means that there are no protective layers or barriers concealing its content. As for ciphertext, it stands in stark contrast to plain text. It is the result of taking understandable, clear data and transforming it into a format that appears random and nonsensical at first glance. This transformation is achieved through a process called encryption, which employs an encryption key combined with a specific mathematical algorithm in order to jumble the original data. These algorithms rearrange the data in such a way that its original meaning becomes obscured. The primary purpose of this scrambling is to protect the data's integrity and confidentiality. Without the correct decryption key or method, which acts as a sort of digital password or blueprint to reverse the encryption, the ciphertext remains a puzzling array of characters, numbers, and symbols. Only those possessing the right key can revert the ciphertext back to its original plain text form. And that brings us to our next topic, the Trusted Platform Module. A Trusted Platform Module, or TPM for short, is a specialized microchip designed to provide hardware-based security functions. It serves as a secure repository for cryptographic keys, passwords, and pens. In simpler terms, Think of TPM as a small, secure vault inside your computer that stores important secrets, ensuring they can't be easily accessed or tampered with by unauthorized users or malicious software. The TPM works in conjunction with the motherboard by being integrated directly onto it or connected via a dedicated header. When the computer boots up, the TPM initializes and performs security functions such as generating and storing encryption keys, verifying the integrity of the boot process, and providing secure storage for sensitive data. It works closely with the computer's firmware and operating system to ensure that only authorized users and software can access critical resources and protects against various forms of attacks, including unauthorized access, tampering, and data theft. One crucial function of a TPM is its ability to store keys for hard drive encryption. When you encrypt your hard drive using technologies like BitLocker on Windows or FileVault on Mac OS, the encryption keys are generated and securely stored within the TPM. These keys are used to encrypt and decrypt data on the hard drive, 
ensuring that even if someone were to physically access your hard drive, they wouldn't be able to read its contents without the proper decryption key stored in the TPM. This brings me back to one essential fact. The TPM is integrated directly onto the motherboard. Therefore, removing or replacing the motherboard can potentially lead to complications. Since the TPM is a hardware-based security measure tied to the specific hardware configuration of your computer, changing the motherboard could result in the loss of access to the encrypted data stored on the hard drive. Additionally, the TPM establishes a unique relationship with the specific motherboard it's installed on. If you were to replace the motherboard without properly handling the TPM, this too would result in the loss of access to the cryptographic keys stored within the TPM. As a result, you might not be able to decrypt your hard drive and access your data, leading to data loss. Therefore, it's important to take precautions when dealing with systems equipped with a TPM. Before making any changes to the hardware, it's advisable to back up any important data and, if necessary, properly migrate or deactivate the TPM to avoid any potential issues with data access and cryptographic keys. Now, a TPM may excel at bolstering the security of individual devices, but will likely fall short when it comes to meeting the demands of enterprise-level security. In such scenarios, a hardware security module, or HSM for short, is often preferred as an alternative to TPMs. HSMs offer robust security for cryptographic operations and key management, making them ideal for environments requiring high levels of protection and scalability. Unlike TPMs, which are typically integrated into individual devices, HSMs are standalone units providing centralized management and control over cryptographic keys and operations. This feature makes them well-suited for large-scale deployments and stringent security requirements. Exam Objective 3.4 Given a scenario, install and configure motherboards, central processing units, and add-on cards, BIOS, and UEFI. Before we get into the intricacies of BIOS and UEFI, it's essential to grasp the concept of firmware. Firmware is a type of software that is embedded into electronic devices to control their operation. It resides in the hardware of the device and is responsible for managing its basic functions, such as booting up, controlling input and output operations, and facilitating communication between hardware components. Unlike general-purpose software applications that can be installed and uninstalled, firmware is designed to be more permanent and is essential for the basic functioning of the device. In the case of motherboards, the traditional firmware interface is called the BIOS. BIOS, or Basic Input-Output System, has been a staple in computers for decades. Its primary function is to initialize hardware components when you start up your computer. This process, known as the Power on Self-Test or POST, involves a series of diagnostic tests to ensure that critical hardware elements, such as the processor, memory, and storage devices are working properly. After completing the POST, BIOS then locates and loads the operating system from the storage device while also managing interactions with the computer's hardware. In recent years, UEFI has gradually replaced BIOS. UEFI, short for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, offers several advantages over traditional BIOS, including support for larger storage devices, faster boot times, and a more user-friendly interface. Unlike BIOS, which relies on a basic text-based interface, UEFI provides a graphical user interface that allows users to interact with firmware settings more intuitively. Additionally, UEFI supports Secure Boot, a feature that helps protect the system against malware by verifying the integrity of the operating system during the boot process. In order to access the BIOS or UEFI settings on your computer, you'll need to follow a few simple steps. Begin by restarting your device. During the startup process, Keep an eye out for a message or logo that indicates which key to press to enter the setup utility. Common keys include Delete, F1, F2, 
F10, or Escape, but the specific key may vary depending on your computer's manufacturer. Once you've identified the correct key, press it repeatedly as soon as you see the message or logo appear on the screen. Timing is important here, so be ready to press the key immediately upon startup. If successful, you'll be taken to the BIOS or UEFI setup utility. From the setup utility, you will find a range of options for configuring your computer's hardware and firmware settings. So, are you interested in covering a few common scenarios with me? Well, all right then. Scenario 1. Picture yourself installing a new hard drive into your computer to expand storage capacity. However, Upon booting up your computer, you notice that the new hard drive is not being detected. Concerned, you enter the BIOS setup utility to investigate the issue. You navigate to the storage configuration settings and verify that the new drive is recognized. If the drive is not listed, you may need to adjust the drive settings or boot order, which determines the sequence in which the computer accesses storage devices. This scenario also holds true for other hardware installations, like memory modules, expansion cards, or USB devices. Always check the devices are enabled and properly configured following an installation. Scenario 2. Suppose you're concerned about the security of your data and decide to enable drive encryption using technologies like BitLocker. However, you encounter an issue where the drive encryption process is not proceeding smoothly. Suspecting that the trusted platform module, TPM, may not be enabled, you access the BIOS setup utility to investigate. Within the security settings, you locate the option to enable the TPM, a hardware-based security feature that enhances data protection. With the TPM now enabled, the drive encryption proceeds seamlessly providing an additional layer of security for your sensitive data. Okay, one more scenario before moving on, and this time I will use the UVFI interface in my example. Imagine you want to set up a virtual lab environment to test different operating systems and software configurations. To accomplish this, you plan to use virtualization software. However, when attempting to create virtual machines, you encounter errors indicating that virtualization support is not enabled. Suspecting that virtualization support may be disabled in the UEFI settings, you access the setup utility to investigate. Within the UEFI interface, you would look for options such as Intel Virtualization Technology or AMD-V, which enables virtualization support. After ensuring that virtualization support is enabled, you restart your computer. Now with virtualization enabled, you can create and run virtual machines smoothly, facilitating your experimentation and testing processes. In each of the scenarios described, accessing the BIOS or UEF I setup utility played a pivotal role in resolving hardware-related issues and optimizing system performance. BIOS, and UEF, I provide users with direct control over essential hardware configurations, allowing them to adjust settings such as memory allocation, storage detection, security features, and virtualization support. By navigating through the BIOS or UEFI interface, users can fine-tune their computer's hardware settings to suit their needs, ensuring optimal performance and compatibility with various software configurations. In addition to controlling hardware configurations, BIOS and UEFI also play a role in managing peripherals such as USB devices. Within the BIOS or UEFI settings, users can configure USB permissions to control access to connected devices. This feature is particularly useful for enhancing security by preventing unauthorized access or malicious activities through USB ports. By adjusting USB permissions, users can mitigate potential security risks and safeguard their system against external threats. Lastly, BIOS and UEF I offer additional security features such as BIOS passwords and boot passwords. A BIOS password restricts access to the BIOS or UEF I setup utility, 
preventing unauthorized users from making changes to critical system settings. Similarly, a boot password adds an extra layer of security by requiring users to enter a password before the operating system boots up. These password protections help safeguard sensitive data and prevent unauthorized access to the system, enhancing the overall security posture. Exam Objective 3.5 Given a scenario, install or replace the appropriate power supply. In the context of information technology, a power supply unit, or PSU, is a vital component in desktop PCs. Its job is to convert the AC, or alternating current, from a wall outlet into DC, or direct current that the computer's components can use. When you plug your PC into a wall outlet, the electricity it receives is in the form of alternating current, which fluctuates rapidly in direction and amplitude. However, the delicate circuitry inside your computer requires a steady stream of direct current to function properly. This is where the power supply unit comes in. Its primary function is to convert the incoming AC power from the wall outlet into the stable DC power needed by the computer's various components. By performing this conversion, the PSU ensures that the computer operates smoothly and reliably, powering everything from the motherboard and CPU to the graphics card and storage drives. Thus, the power supply unit is truly the lifeblood of the desktop PC, providing the electrical energy necessary for its proper functioning. Moving forward with this topic, the next term we should know is voltage. Voltage refers to the measure of electrical potential difference between two points in a circuit. To state this another way, voltage is the force or pressure that pushes electrical charges through an electrical circuit. When you plug your desktop PC into a wall outlet, it receives electrical power in the form of alternating current. This alternating current typically comes in two primary voltage standards, 120 volt alternating current, or VAC, and 240 volt alternating current. These voltage standards dictate the level of electrical pressure that flows through the wires and into your computer's PSU. Within the computer, various components require specific voltages to operate effectively. For instance, the motherboard, CPU, graphics card, and storage drives each require different levels of voltage to function optimally. Common output voltages provided by the PSU include 3.3 volts, 5 volts, and 12 volts. It is important to note, once again, that these voltages are in the form of direct current. To deliver these various output voltages, the PSU comes with various connectors, the most notable being the motherboard connector. Depending on the age of the motherboard and the PSU, we have the 20-pin, 24-pin, and 20-plus-4 pin connectors. The 20-pin connector was a standard for older motherboards, but has largely been replaced by the more robust 24-pin connector. This 24-pin connector provides additional power for modern systems with more advanced components and higher power requirements. As for the 20 plus 4 pin connector, this offers flexibility by combining the 20 pin and 24 pin configurations into a single connector. This design allows compatibility with both older and newer motherboards, ensuring seamless integration across a range of hardware configurations. Now that you understand voltage and how it is applied to power supply units, the next term you will need in your vocabulary is watt. A watt is a unit of measurement for electrical power. It indicates how much energy is used or produced per second. Furthermore, wattage, in the context of computer hardware, refers to the measure of electrical power that a power supply unit can deliver to a computer system. It's a critical specification to consider when selecting a PSU for a particular computer bill. The wattage rating of a PSU indicates its maximum power output capacity, which determines the number and type of components it can reliably power. Components such as the CPU, graphics card, storage drives, and peripherals all draw power from the PSU to operate.
Therefore, it's essential to choose a PSU with an adequate wattage rating to meet the power demands of these components. When determining the appropriate wattage rating for a computer build, it's important to consider the power requirements of each component individually and then calculate the total power consumption. Factors such as the type and number of components, their power draw under load, and any potential future upgrades or expansions should all be taken into account. Selecting a PSU with an insufficient wattage rating can result in system instability, unexpected shutdowns, or even damage to components. Conversely, choosing a PSU with excessive wattage may lead to unnecessary expenses and inefficiencies, as the system will only draw the power it requires. Therefore, understanding wattage and accurately determining the power requirements of a computer build are essential steps in ensuring a stable and efficient system. This knowledge enables users to select an appropriate PSU that can adequately power their components while also accommodating any future upgrades or expansions. Now, given the fictional setup behind me, I have a few questions for you to ponder. What component requires the most power? What is the total wattage requirement for this system? Would a 500 watt PSU be sufficient for this build? Would a 500 watt PSU allow for future upgrades? You are welcome to leave your thoughts in the comments. Moving on with our discussion of power supplies, we now need to cover modular power supplies. Unlike traditional power supplies where all cables are permanently attached, modular power supplies feature detachable cables. This unique design allows users to connect only the cables they need for their specific configuration, leaving unused cables disconnected. As a result, modular power supplies significantly reduce cable clutter inside the computer case, creating a cleaner and more organized internal layout. This streamlined setup not only enhances the aesthetics of the build, but also improves airflow within the case, promoting better cooling performance. With modular power supplies, PC builders can easily customize their cable management to suit their preferences and optimize the airflow dynamics inside their system. Redundant power supplies is another power consideration when uninterrupted operation is paramount. Unlike traditional power supplies, which rely solely on a single unit, redundant power supplies offer a fail-safe mechanism by providing backup power in the event of a primary PSU failure. This redundancy ensures that even if one power supply unit malfunctions, the system can seamlessly switch to the backup power supply unit without interruption. As a result, critical operations can continue without disruption, minimizing downtime and potential data loss. Redundant power supplies are meticulously engineered to meet stringent reliability standards, offering peace of mind to organizations that rely on continuous operation for their business activities. Lastly, in situations where there are sudden and unexpected power interruptions, an uninterruptible power supply, or UPS, becomes an invaluable asset to ensure maximum uptime. A UPS is a device designed to provide immediate and uninterrupted emergency power to connected equipment when the main power source is lost. This seamless transition of power is especially important in IT environments, where servers are constantly processing and transmitting data. Even a momentary power disruption can lead to unsaved data being lost or systems shutting down improperly, which can cause potential damage. When there's a sudden loss of power, a UPS instantly kicks in, ensuring that there's no break in the electricity supply. This immediate response allows IT professionals the time to either switch to a longer-term power solution, like a generator, or to safely shut down systems and save critical data. Exam Objective 3.6 Given a scenario, deploy and configure multifunction devices, printers and settings, printer and scanner. In this video, we will cover printers and scanners together as they are fairly similar. In fact, 
It is very often that printers and scanners come packaged together as a single unit known as a multifunction device, or MFD for short. Starting with printers, a printer is a peripheral device which makes a physical rendering of digital data, usually on paper, or creates a physical object from a three-dimensional digital model, in the case of a 3D printer. Some of the most common printer types are laser printers, inkjet printers, thermal printers, impact printers, and 3D printers. While a printer outputs digital data, a scanner does the exact opposite. A scanner is a peripheral device that optically scans images or objects and converts them into digital data. The most common scanner types are flatbed scanners and sheet-fed ABF scanners. A flatbed scanner offers versatility and precision, allowing users to scan a wide range of documents, photos, and objects of varying sizes and shapes. Its flat glass surface accommodates delicate materials, books, or oddly shaped items. As a downside, each page or item needs to be manually placed on the flatbed for scanning, making it a slow process for a large volume of documents. On the other hand, the automatic document feeder of an ADF scanner streamlines the scanning process by automatically feeding multiple pages through the scanner. This feature is particularly beneficial for high-volume scanning tasks, such as digitizing lengthy contracts, reports, or stacks of paperwork. ADF scanners are designed for efficiency and convenience, allowing users to initiate the scanning process and attend to other tasks while the machine handles document feeding and scanning automatically. While ADF scanners excel in speed and efficiency for standard-sized documents, they may lack the versatility required for scanning delicate or oversized materials that a flatbed scanner can accommodate. Exam Objective 3.6 Given a scenario, deploy and configure multifunction devices, printers and settings. Printer settings and connectivity. When setting up a printer or a scanner, there are several important steps to consider. First and foremost, a connection type must be selected. For a printer or scanner that is directly connected to a computer, also referred to as a local connection, you would most likely use a USB interface and probably a USB type B connector. Though less common, the wireless Bluetooth interface can also be used as an alternative for a local connection setup. If the printer of scanner is to be made available to an entire network of devices, a wired network connection would be made with an Ethernet CAT cable that uses RJ45 connectors. And last up, the wireless alternative for a network connection would be Wi-Fi. Once the printer is connected, installing the appropriate drivers is essential for proper functionality. Drivers act as software intermediaries between the printer and the operating system, facilitating communication. Users may choose between generic drivers, which offer basic functionality but may not fully utilize the printer's capabilities, and manufacturer-specific drivers tailored to the printer model. Moreover, understanding print driver languages is important for efficient printing operations. Each printer interprets commands using various languages, each tailored to specific printing needs. Two prominent languages in this domain are Printer Control Language, abbreviated PCL, and PostScript, PCL. Known for its widespread support, is commonly utilized for basic printing tasks across a range of printers. This language streamlines the printing process by efficiently translating data into printable formats, ensuring compatibility with various hardware configurations. PCL offers versatility and reliability, making it an ideal choice for everyday printing requirements in office environments and other settings where simplicity and compatibility are of great concern. On the other hand, PostScript represents the pinnacle of printing languages, offering advanced features and unparalleled quality. Developed by Adobe Systems, PostScript is renowned for its ability to faithfully render intricate graphics, intricate fonts, and complex page layouts with precision.
This language excels in demanding printing environments, where exceptional print quality and fidelity are non-negotiable. With the printer connected and drivers installed, it is now time to move on to printer configuration settings. For now, I will just cover a few configuration options, starting with duplex printing. Duplex printing, also known as double-sided printing, is a feature that enables printers to automatically print on both sides of a sheet of paper. This capability not only saves paper, but also enhances efficiency and environmental sustainability in printing operations. In duplex printing, the printer is equipped with mechanisms that allow it to flip the paper and print on the reverse side. This process typically involves two steps, printing on one side of the paper and then flipping it over to print on the other side. Some printers achieve duplex printing through built-in duplexing assemblies, while others require manual intervention where the user flips the paper themselves. The benefits of duplex printing are multifaceted. Primarily, it significantly reduces paper usage, which translates to cost savings and environmental conservation. By utilizing both sides of the paper, duplex printing effectively halves the amount of paper required for printing tasks, making it an eco-friendly option for businesses and individuals striving to minimize their carbon footprint. In addition to duplex printing, Orientation settings play a vital role in ensuring the correct layout of printed documents. Users can choose between portrait and landscape orientations, depending on the content and format of the document. Portrait orientation is ideal for documents with predominantly vertical content, such as letters and reports, while landscape orientation is better suited for materials with horizontal emphasis, such as spreadsheets and presentations. Selecting the appropriate orientation ensures that printed documents are visually coherent and aligned with their intended purpose. Furthermore, trace settings allow users to specify the paper source for printing tasks, ensuring compatibility with different paper types and sizes. Printers typically feature multiple trays or paper feeders, each designated for specific paper sizes or types. By selecting the appropriate tray settings, Users can seamlessly accommodate varying printing requirements, from standard documents to specialized media, such as labels or envelopes. Lastly, the print quality setting on printers offers the user control over the level of detail and clarity in their printed materials. These settings typically include options such as draft, normal, and best definition, or similar variations thereof. The draft setting prioritizes speed, making it suitable for internal documents or drafts where print quality is less critical. Normal strikes a balance between quality and speed, making it suitable for everyday printing tasks like text documents or basic graphics. Then there is best, which offers the highest print quality but may require more time. This setting is ideal for printing high-resolution images or documents where exceptional clarity and detail are necessary. Users can choose the appropriate print quality setting based on their specific requirements, ensuring a balance between print quality and efficiency. Exam Objective 3.6 Given a scenario, deploy and configure multifunction devices, printers and settings printer sharing, and networking. Let's face it, in a world where space is limited and budgets are tight, it's just not practical for every device to have its own printer. Can you imagine a scenario where every computer, tablet, or smartphone in your office or home had its own dedicated printer? It would be like a printing apocalypse with paper jams and ink cartridges running amok at every turn. Thankfully, that's where the magic of printer sharing and networking comes into play. By setting up a printer to be shared or networked, you can transform a single printer into a communal hub accessible to all. It's the ultimate solution for conserving resources, reducing clutter, and fostering a sense of unity among devices. But how does it work? Well, there are a couple of ways we can go about this. First, I will discuss printer sharing, which is used for locally connected printers. 
This option is like hosting an intimate gathering among close friends in your own living room. Just as you might gather around a karaoke machine to belt out your favorite tunes, devices in your local area network can gather around a shared printer to fulfill their printing needs. With a few simple configurations, you can designate one computer as the host. Then, connecting the printer to it through a local connection like USB or Bluetooth, you can share its printing capabilities with other devices that also reside on the local area network. And let's not forget about print servers. These dedicated devices take the sharing burden away from host devices, managing print jobs, and ensuring smooth operations for all connected devices. Think of them as the guardians of printing efficiency, ensuring that every print job gets its moment in the spotlight without causing chaos or confusion. Now, let's take the printing party to the next level by exploring printers that are directly connected to a network via Ethernet or Wi-Fi. Just like adding a DJ booth to your karaoke party, these network-connected printers bring a whole new level of convenience and accessibility to the printing experience. Imagine a scenario where your printer is no longer tethered to a single computer, but instead sits gracefully on your network, ready to spring into action at a moment's notice. With Ethernet or Wi-Fi connectivity, these printers become like digital beacons, broadcasting their printing prowess to all devices within range. Setting up a network-connected printer is like giving it a VIP pass to the digital dance floor. Whether it's through a wired Ethernet connection or the magic of Wi-Fi, these printers seamlessly integrate into your network, allowing multiple devices to access them directly. All right, we've covered how printer sharing and networking allows for incoming print requests to reach the printer. But what happens in reverse? When it comes to sending scanned content out into the world, scanners offer a multitude of network scan services for connectivity and distribution. Take, for instance, the well-known email service, a staple of modern communication. With just a few clicks, scanned documents can be attached to an email and dispatched to recipients near and far, ensuring swift delivery and seamless collaboration. But email is just the beginning. For organizations that rely on centralized file storage, the Server Message Block Networking Protocol, or SMB, comes into play. By scanning documents directly to a shared folder using the SMB protocol, users can ensure that important files are accessible to everyone who needs them without the hassle of manual file transfers or email attachments. And then there's the cloud. With scanners equipped to upload documents directly to cloud storage services like Dropbox, Google Drive, or Microsoft OneDrive, the possibilities are endless. Scan documents become instantly accessible from any device with an internet connection, empowering users to collaborate and share information with ease, regardless of their physical location. Exam Objective 3.6 Given a scenario, Deploy and configure multifunction devices, printers, and settings. Printer security. Printers, like other devices connected to a network such as computers, servers, and routers, can be vulnerable to security breaches if not properly managed. This vulnerability arises from the fact that modern printers are no longer standalone devices, but integral components of complex network infrastructures. As such, they are subject to many of the same security risks and threats as other network-connected devices. Luckily, we have a few countermeasures available to combat these threats. User authentication is one of those countermeasures. It serves as the frontline defense against unauthorized usage and helps maintain the confidentiality and integrity of printed materials. Implementing user authentication requires users to verify their identity before they can access print resources. This verification process typically involves entering a username and password, similar to logging into a computer or online account. By requiring this authentication step, organizations can ensure that only individuals with valid credentials can utilize the printing functionalities.
Another important measure in printer security is badging. Badging systems are sophisticated solutions that seamlessly integrate with printer functionalities, leveraging employees' physical badges or ID cards to regulate access to printing resources. At its core, a badging system functions as a gatekeeper, allowing entry to printer functionalities, such as initiating or releasing a print job, only to those possessing valid credentials in the form of an employee badge or ID card. When an employee approaches the printer to initiate a print job, they are required to present their badge or ID card to the badging system. This action triggers a verification process wherein the system cross-references the presented credentials with a centralized database containing authorized user information. Next, we have audit logs. Audit logs function as a vigilant watchdog that meticulously monitors printer activity and provides invaluable insights into usage patterns and potential security incidents. These comprehensive logs meticulously document a wealth of critical information, including details such as who initiated a print job, the specific document printed, the timestamp of the printing activity, and the originating device. One of the primary functions of audit logs is to provide administrators with a comprehensive trail of printer usage, allowing them to track and monitor printing activities across the organization. By documenting every print job, audit logs offer a transparent view into the utilization of printer resources, enabling administrators to identify trends, analyze usage patterns, and allocate resources efficiently. Then there is secured printing. This measure is designed to prevent sensitive documents from being prematurely released into the printer's output tray. This functionality ensures that print jobs remain securely stored within the printer until the authorized user is physically present to authenticate. This can be tied in with badging or require a simple pen or password. The primary objective of secured printing is to mitigate the risk of unauthorized access to sensitive documents. Instead of immediately printing documents upon submission, secured printing temporarily holds print jobs in a protected queue or virtual print vault within the printer's memory or storage. This prevents confidential documents from being left unattended in the output tray, where they could potentially be intercepted, viewed, or taken by unauthorized individuals. Now, for one last threat countermeasure, you must keep the printer's firmware up to date. Printers are frequently overlooked when it comes to updates. Administrators may prioritize securing more prominent network devices, leaving printers vulnerable to exploitation. Without regular firmware updates that likely contain patches for known vulnerabilities, printers will be susceptible to malicious attacks. Exam Objective 3.7. Given a scenario, install and replace printer consumables. Inkjet Printer. Inkjet printers are widely used in both home and office environments to produce high-quality prints. These printers rely on ink cartridges to transfer ink onto paper, enabling the creation of text and images. The ink cartridge serves as a crucial component in the printing process, acting as a reservoir for the ink needed for printing operations. Engineered with specially formulated ink, the cartridge ensures vibrant and precise colors in printed output. Following the ink cartridge, the next component to discuss is the print head situated within the printer. The print head disperses ink onto the paper in precise patterns to form characters and images. Print heads can either be detached, where the ink cartridges are housed separately, or integrated, where the print head is built directly into the ink cartridge. Moving on, the pickup roller and feed rollers work together to facilitate the smooth movement of paper through the printer, ensuring accurate and efficient printing operations. The pickup roller grabs a single sheet of paper from the paper tray or input tray, using friction to guide it into the printer mechanism. Subsequently, the feed rollers assist in guiding the paper through the printer. Together, these components play a critical role in the paper handling process, helping to prevent misfeeds or paper jams. 
After discussing the pickup roller and feed rollers, the next component to explore is the carriage belt. The carriage belt is an integral part of the inkjet printer's mechanism, responsible for the precise movement of the print head assembly across the width of the paper. Connected to the print head assembly, the carriage belt allows for controlled back and forth movement along the paper path during printing. Now that we've examined the major components of an inkjet printer, it's important to understand the calibration process that helps keep these components operating in harmony and with precision. During calibration, the printer aligns various components, such as the print head and paper feed mechanisms, to ensure precise ink application and paper handle. This alignment assists in maintaining print quality. The calibration process typically involves printing a test page with alignment patterns or color gradients. The printer then analyzes the test page and makes adjustments as needed to ensure accurate printing. Depending on the printer model, calibrations may be performed automatically or manually through the printer's settings menu. Regular calibration is essential for maintaining print quality and preventing issues. It's recommended to calibrate the printer periodically, especially after replacing ink cartridges or performing maintenance tasks. With that said, some maintenance tasks that are specific to inkjet printers include cleaning the print heads, replacing ink cartridges, and clearing paper jams. Print heads can become clogged with dried ink or debris over time, leading to poor print quality or streaky prints. Regularly cleaning the print heads is necessary to maintain clear and consistent ink application. Many inkjet printers offer built-in cleaning utilities accessible through the printer's settings menu. Alternatively, users can use print head cleaning kits for more thorough maintenance. As ink levels deplete or cartridges become empty, it becomes necessary to replace them promptly to prevent interruptions in printing. Inkjet printers often feature ink level indicators to alert users when cartridges need replacement. Be sure to follow manufacturer guidelines for cartridge replacement, ensuring compatibility and proper installation to maintain print quality. Paper jams are common occurrences in inkjet printers and can disrupt printing operations if not addressed promptly. When a paper jam occurs, carefully remove the jammed paper from the printer following the manufacturer's instructions to avoid damaging internal components. Then clear any remaining paper fragments or debris from the paper path to prevent future jams by adhering to these maintenance tasks. Users can ensure that their inkjet printers operate smoothly and reliably, producing high-quality prints consistently. Exam Objective 3.7 Given a scenario, install and replace printer consumables. Laser Printer Laser printers are a common printer type found in various environments, ranging from homes to offices and commercial settings. Laser printers are known for their speed, precision, and ability to handle high-volume printing tasks making them ideal for environments requiring efficient and reliable printing solutions. However, they are generally more complex than inkjet printers due to their internal mechanisms and the print imaging process they employ. To begin, unlike inkjet printers that use liquid ink, laser printers use toner cartridges with fine powder. These cartridges are designed for accurate printing on paper and come in different types to match various printer models and printing needs. Moving on, we have the print imaging process. This process serves as the foundation of laser printing and consists of several stages or phases. These phases include processing, charging, exposing, developing, transferring, fusing, and cleaning. This intricate process involves multiple components working together to produce high-quality prints with exceptional clarity and detail. Now, I will explain this process step by step, so pay attention as CompTIA is known to favor laser printer questions in their A plus Core 1 certification exam. First up, processing. The printing process begins with the digital data being loaded into the printer's onboard memory. 
the data is converted into a format that the printer can interpret and use to create the desired output. It's worth noting that sufficient memory is necessary for this process, as the entire job must be loaded into the printer's memory before printing can begin. This ensures smooth and uninterrupted printing, as the printer has all the necessary data readily available to complete the job efficiently. The next step is charging. In the charging phase, the photosensitive drum or imaging drum gets ready to capture the image you want to print. Picture this. The drum is like a blank canvas waiting to receive a painting. But instead of using paint, it uses something called static electricity. You might have experienced static electricity before, like when you touch a metal object and feel a small shock. In the charging stage, the drum is uniformly charged with static electricity. This prepares the drum, almost like priming a canvas before painting on. Now, why does the drum need to be charged? Well, this static electricity helps the drum attract and hold onto the image that will be printed. It's like giving the drum a magnetic pull, so when the image is exposed onto it later, it sticks in all the right places. After charging, the next step is exposure. In the exposure phase, things get really interesting. Imagine the drum inside the printer, waiting patiently with its static electricity, all charged up from the previous stage. Now, it's time for the real magic to happen. Picture this. A laser beam in the printer acts like a spotlight. This spotlight shines onto the charged photosensitive drum, removing the static charge wherever it shines, creating a kind of secret, invisible image of what you want to print on the surface of the photosensitive drum. Now it is time for the developing phase. In this phase, the electrostatic image created during the exposing phase is transformed into a visible image on the drum. Here's how it works. Once the electrostatic image is formed on the drum, tiny particles of toner, which are positively charged, are attracted to the negatively charged areas of the drum where the image resides. It's like a magnetic attraction. Wherever there's a negative charge on the drum, the positively charged toner particles stick to it, forming the image. In other words, the toner particles fill in the invisible outline created during the exposing phase making the image visible on the drum surface. Moving on, we get to the transfer phase. During this step, the developed toner image on the drum is transitioned onto the paper. As the paper moves past the drum, the toner particles leave the drum and are attracted to the positively charged surface of either the transfer belt or the transfer roller. This process is similar to a stamp transferring ink onto paper, except in this case, it involves toner. Now don't think that we're all finished just because we've transferred the toner powder to the paper. To complete the print imaging process, we will need to take an extra step called fixing or fusing to ensure the toner image is firmly bonded to the paper's surface. To achieve this, the paper heads into a part of the printer called the fuser assembly. Inside, it meets a pair of heated rollers. These rollers apply heat and pressure to the paper, effectively melting the toner particles. As they melt, they fuse into the fibers of the paper, creating a permanent bond. Once the paper exits the fuser assembly, the toner image is now firmly fixed onto the paper. This ensures that the printout is durable and won't smudge or smear easily. That is also why the printouts exiting a laser printer are warm to the touch. In the final step of the laser printing process, we reach the cleaning phase. After the toner image has been successfully transferred and fused onto the paper, it's important to ensure that any remaining toner on the photosensitive drum is removed. This helps maintain print quality and prevents contamination in future print jobs during the cleaning phase, a cleaning blade or brush delicately removes any excess toner from the drum surface. This ensures that the drum is clean and ready for the next printing cycle. Wow, that is a lot going on for a single printed page. With all those moving parts, heat, and pressure, the need for maintenance is inevitable. 
to keep your laser printer running smoothly and producing high-quality prints, regular maintenance is essential. Here are some common maintenance tasks you should perform. Replacing the toner. When the toner cartridge runs low or empty, it's time to replace it with a new one. Keeping a spare toner cartridge on hand ensures that you can quickly swap it out when needed, minimizing downtime. Apply a maintenance kit. Periodically, it's recommended to apply a maintenance kit to your laser printer. These kits typically include replacement parts such as fuser assemblies, transfer rollers, cleaning blades, and other wearable components. By replacing these components as part of routine maintenance, you can prolong the life of your printer and maintain print quality. Additionally, some laser printers feature counters that keep track of the number of pages printed to signal when maintenance tasks are due. It's essential to reset these counters after completing maintenance tasks or replacing consumable parts to maintain accurate tracking and scheduling of maintenance activities. And then there is cleaning. Regularly cleaning the printer's exterior and interior components can help remove dust, toner residue, and other debris that can affect print quality and performance. Be sure to follow manufacturer guidelines and use lint-free cloths or swabs dampened with isopropyl alcohol for clean. By performing these maintenance tasks regularly, you can keep your laser printer in optimal condition, minimize downtime, and ensure that it continues to produce high-quality prints. Now that we've examined the major components of a laser printer, including the print imaging process and laser printer maintenance, it's important to understand the calibration process that helps keep these components operating in harmony and with precision. During calibration, the printer's internal sensors and mechanisms are adjusted to compensate for any variations or inconsistencies in print output. The calibration process typically involves printing a test page with alignment patterns or color gradients. The printer then analyzes the test page and makes adjustments as needed to ensure accurate printing. Depending on the printer model, calibrations may be performed automatically or manually through the printer's settings menu. Regular calibration is essential for maintaining print quality and preventing issues. It's recommended to calibrate the printer periodically, especially after replacing toner cartridges or performing maintenance tasks. Exam Objective 3.7 Given a scenario, install and replace printer consumables. Thermal Printer Thermal printers combine simplicity and efficiency when creating tangible copies of digital information. Have you ever been handed a receipt at the store? Chances are it was produced by a thermal printer. Unlike the traditional inkjet or laser printers you're familiar with, thermal printers have a unique trick up their sleeve. They use heat, not ink or toner, to bring images to life on specially coated paper. This cutting edge method isn't just a novelty. It boasts a host of benefits, including straightforward operation, fast printing speeds, and unparalleled durability. A typical thermal printer comprises several key components working in harmony. First, we have the feed assembly responsible for pulling the thermal paper through the printer. This component ensures a smooth and consistent printing process. Next, we have the true star of the show, the heating element. This component is the fiery core of the operation. It generates heat with pinpoint accuracy activating specific areas of the thermal paper with a delicate touch. And what about the thermal paper itself? It's no ordinary paper. This paper is coated with a special chemical layer that tingles with excitement at the mere whisper of heat. As the heating element activates, the heat-sensitive paper reacts, bringing forth crisp characters and images. Now, with heat being the catalyst, Let's take a closer look at heat sensitivity and thermal printing. The sensitivity of the paper to heat plays a pivotal role in achieving optimal print quality. Papers with varying levels of sensitivity react differently to the heat generated by the printer's heating element. Adjusting the temperature of the heating element is essential to strike the right balance. 
Manufacturers often provide guidelines for configuring the temperature to ensure a clear and crisp printout without compromising the integrity of the paper. Higher sensitivity papers require less heat to produce vivid images, but they may be more susceptible to fading over time. Moreover, proper storage conditions are paramount to maintain the sensitivity of thermal paper. Exposure to excessive heat or humidity can degrade the paper's performance over time. Therefore, it's important to store thermal paper in a cool, dry place, away from direct sunlight, to preserve its quality and ensure consistent printing results. Lastly, let's talk maintenance. Performing regular maintenance on a thermal printer helps in avoiding common issues and ensures consistent performance. This includes the timely replacement of depleted paper rolls to prevent printing interruptions and ensure seamless operation. When the paper rolls run low, replacing them promptly is essential to maintain workflow efficiency and avoid any downtime in printing tasks. Next, it's important to clean the heating element. Periodically cleaning the heating element is essential for removing any accumulated residue buildup. Over time, debris and residue from the printing process can accumulate on the heating element, potentially impairing print quality and even causing overheating issues. Regular cleaning ensures that the heating element operates at optimal efficiency, maintaining consistent print quality and preventing any potential overheating-related malfunctions. Furthermore, removing debris from the printer mechanism reduces the risk of jams and other mechanical malfunctions, thus prolonging the printer's lifespan. By adhering to these maintenance tasks, users can ensure that their thermal printers continue to operate smoothly and reliably. Exam Objective 3.7 Given a scenario, install and replace printer consumables. Impact Printer Impact printers are a class of printing devices that rely on mechanical force to transfer characters and images onto paper. This force is typically generated by a print head striking an inked ribbon against the paper, creating characters through a series of dots or lines. This traditional printing method offers several advantages, including the ability to print on multipart forms in carbon paper, making impact printers ideal for business applications such as invoice printing, service ticketing, and contract printing. While they may not match the speed or resolution of modern non-impact printers, impact printers continue to find their place in business environments. Impact printers operate through a series of key components working in tandem to produce printed output. At the heart of the operation is the print head a mechanism responsible for striking against an inked ribbon with precision. This impact creates characters or images on the paper by transferring ink from the ribbon onto the page. The ribbon, which is attached to the print head assembly, sits between the print head and the paper. It acts as the intermediary, carrying the ink and ensuring uniformity in printing. As the print head moves across the paper, it applies pressure at specific points resulting in the formation of characters or images. Guiding the paper through the printer is the tractor feed mechanism. This component moves the paper in a controlled manner, ensuring smooth and accurate positioning beneath the print head. By coordinating the movement of the paper, the tractor feed mechanism ensures precise alignment and consistent printing across the page. Together, these components work seamlessly to produce clear and legible prints with every operation. Impact printers also have specific paper requirements. They use impact paper, also known as continuous form paper. This type of paper plays a crucial role in the operation of impact printers. Unlike standard sheets used in inkjet or laser printers, impact paper typically comes in continuous rolls or stacks of perforated sheets joined together. This unique format enables uninterrupted printing of lengthy documents like invoices or receipts without the hassle of frequent reloading. Moreover, impact paper may feature a multipart construction known as carbon copies. Carbon copies function by utilizing pressure from the print head to transfer ink from the ribbon onto the top layer of paper, 
while subsequent layers are coated with carbon that is released by the physical pressure. This facilitates the creation of duplicate or triplicate copies with each printout. This streamlines the print process, allowing for efficient and convenient production of multiple copies without additional printing steps. Lastly, while impact printers are known for their robustness and reliability, they do require a bit of maintenance to ensure optimal performance. Regular maintenance tasks are essential to keep these printers running smoothly and to extend their lifespan. One such maintenance task involves replacing the printer's ribbon. Over time, the ribbon becomes worn out, leading to faded or illegible prints. By replacing the ribbon when necessary, users can ensure that print quality remains consistent. Additionally, the print head, which plays a central role in transferring ink onto the paper, may also require replacement. As with any mechanical component, the print head can wear out over time, affecting print quality and consistency. Regularly replacing the print head ensures that the printer continues to produce clear and legible prints. Furthermore, it's important to always have additional paper stock on hand. Though it is continuous feed paper, it won't last forever. By performing regular maintenance tasks, such as replacing the ribbon, print head, and paper, users can ensure that their impact printers continue to operate smoothly and reliably. Exam Objective 3.7 Given a scenario, install and replace printer consumables. 3D Printer A 3D printer creates objects layer by layer based on a digital design, utilizing materials such as plastics or metals. These printers find utility across diverse sectors like prototyping, manufacturing, education, healthcare, and art, offering versatility, customization, and cost effectiveness. They represent a transformative force in traditional manufacturing methods. 3D printers operate by building objects layer by layer from a digital design. The process begins with a digital model created using computer software or obtained from a 3D scanner. This digital blueprint serves as the foundation for the physical object. Next, the digital model is sliced into thin horizontal layers. Each layer is then translated into instructions, which directs the 3D printer on how to deposit or extrude material to create that layer. The 3D printer follows these instructions meticulously. It deposits material according to the design, often melting or softening it before application. Various types of materials can be used for 3D printing, including plastics, metals, ceramics, carbon fiber, and even food-grade materials. As the printer progresses, it builds up the object layer by layer, with each layer fusing or adhering to the previous one. This layer-by-layer -layer approach ensures the structural integrity and dimensional accuracy of the final object. The filament, extruder, and print bed are integral components of a 3D printer, each playing a vital role in the printing process. The filament acts as the raw material for 3D printing, available in various types such as plastics, metals, ceramics, and composites. It is fed into the extruder, where it is guided into the printer and melted for application. The extruder comprises a motor-driven gear mechanism that pushes the filament through a heated nozzle. As the filament passes through the extruder's hot end, it softens or melts ready to be extruded onto the print bed or previous layers. The extruder's precise control over filament flow and temperature is paramount for achieving accurate and consistent print results. Alternatively, resin can serve as another material used in 3D printing. Resin printing involves using liquid resin that is cured layer by layer using UV light, producing high-resolution prints with smooth surface finishes. Lastly, Acting as the foundation, the print bed provides a stable surface upon which the object is constructed. Its primary function is to ensure the initial layer of material adheres securely during printing, preventing warping or detachment. Together, these components work harmoniously to transform digital designs into physical objects.
Now, maintaining a 3D printer is essential for optimal performance and longevity, involving several key tasks. One such task is greasing moving parts like rails, rods, and gears to reduce friction and prevent mechanical failures. Using grease ensures smooth movement without compromising print quality. Additionally, regular cleaning of the extruder is crucial to prevent clogs and contamination, which can affect filament flow and print quality. This involves heating the extruder to the recommended temperature and carefully removing any residual filament or debris. Periodically disassembling the extruder for a thorough cleaning can further maintain its functionality. By regularly performing these maintenance tasks, 3D printer owners can prolong their machine's lifespan and achieve consistent, high-quality prints. Exam Objective 4.1 Summarize Cloud Computing Concepts This video marks the start of our exploration into Domain 4 of the CompTIA A plus Core 1 exam objectives. I'm thrilled to see you are still with me and wanted to take a moment to congratulate you for reaching this point in the course. It's no small feat, and you should be proud of what you have accomplished thus far. With that said, let's dive head first into this new domain and learn about a few cloud computing concepts. Cloud computing is defined as a model for enabling convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources, for example, networks, servers, storage, applications, and services. Additionally, these resources can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. In simpler terms, cloud computing refers to using remote servers on the internet to store, manage, and process data rather than relying on a local server or personal computer. To assist with understanding this concept, I will compare cloud computing to renting a storage unit. Instead of needing to build and maintain your own storage space at home, which would require a lot of effort and resources, you can simply rent a storage unit from a company. Similarly, with cloud computing, instead of setting up and maintaining your own servers and infrastructure, you can use remote servers provided by cloud service providers like Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, or Google Cloud Platform. It's like outsourcing the storage and management of your data and computing resources to a specialized company that takes care of everything for you. With cloud computing, there are various cloud models that exist. Among these cloud models are public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud, and community cloud. Each model presents distinct characteristics and benefits tailored to address specific requirements and challenges. A public cloud, owned and operated by third-party providers, offers scalable resources on demand, making it suitable for a wide range of applications and workloads. With a public cloud, organizations can access computing resources, such as servers, storage, and applications, over the internet without needing to invest in or maintain their own infrastructure. This model allows for flexibility and agility, as resources can be provisioned or scaled up and down quickly based on demand. Additionally, public cloud providers handle tasks such as infrastructure management, security, and maintenance, relieving organizations of these responsibilities and allowing them to focus on their core business activities. Conversely, a private cloud offers dedicated infrastructure solely for one organization, ensuring enhanced control and security over data and applications. This isolation from others minimizes the risk of unauthorized access and data breaches. With complete control over data management, compliance with regulatory requirements and internal policies is ensured. Private clouds also guarantee reliability and availability, maintaining access, even during local internet outages. The limited attack surface increases security, making private clouds ideal for storing sensitive information. Hybrid clouds blend public and private cloud features, providing flexibility in workload deployment and data storage. Organizations can host sensitive data on-site while utilizing the scalability of public cloud resources for other tasks. 
This integration enables seamless data movement between environments, optimizing resource utilization based on performance, security, and cost considerations. Overall, hybrid clouds offer a versatile solution for organizations seeking to balance control, security, scalability, and cost effectiveness in their IT infrastructure. Finally, community clouds serve a defined group of organizations with shared interests or requirements, fostering collaboration while maintaining autonomy and control. These various cloud computing models empower organizations to tailor their IT infrastructure to align with their unique objectives, regulatory constraints, and operational needs. Exam Objective 4.1 Summarize Cloud Computing Concepts Cloud Characteristics Cloud computing has revolutionized the way organizations manage and utilize their IT resources, offering a plethora of benefits such as flexibility, scalability, and cost effectiveness. At the heart of cloud computing lie several key characteristics that underpin its functionality and value proposition. These characteristics, including shared resources, metered utilization, rapid elasticity, high availability, and file synchronization, collectively contribute to the efficiency, reliability, and accessibility of cloud services. Understanding these fundamental aspects is essential for organizations seeking to leverage the full potential of cloud computing in their operations. So let's define each characteristic and add them to our vocabulary. Shared resources in cloud computing refers to the pooling of computing resources, such as servers, storage, and networking, to serve multiple users or tenants. That is probably why this is also known as resource pooling. These pooled resources are dynamically allocated and reassigned according to demand. In cloud computing, shared resources enable efficient utilization of infrastructure, as multiple users can access and utilize the same physical resources. This pooling of resources allows for cost savings, scalability, and optimization of resource utilization. Metered utilization refers to the capability of cloud computing systems to measure and charge only for resources that are used. This provides transparency and accountability for both providers and consumers. Usage is typically measured on a pay-as-you-go basis. Cloud service providers track resource consumption by users, allowing them to charge based on actual usage. This pay-as-you-go model allows organizations to optimize resource allocation and budgeting based on their actual needs. Rapid elasticity is the ability of cloud computing systems to scale resources up or down quickly and automatically in response to changing demand. This scalability is often achieved through the dynamic provisioning and deprovisioning of resources. Cloud environments can rapidly scale resources to accommodate fluctuations in workload demand, such as adding resources during the peak usage times and automatically removing it when the peak is over. For example, with an e-commerce website, more web servers can be quickly added to handle increased traffic. Overall, rapid elasticity enables cloud systems to be provisioned according to demand allowing organizations to efficiently manage their resources and adapt to changing workload requirements without manual intervention. High availability refers to the ability of cloud computing systems to ensure that services and resources are accessible and operational for users when needed, typically through redundancy and fault tolerance. Cloud providers implement redundancy and fault tolerance across their infrastructure to minimize downtime and ensure continuous availability of services. This includes measures to prevent a single point of failure, ensuring that if one component fails, redundant systems can immediately take over without interrupting service. Additionally, cloud environments can quickly fail over to another server, data center, or region in the event of an outage, further enhancing availability and resilience. These failover mechanisms provide organizations with confidence in relying on cloud services for critical operations, knowing that their applications and data will remain accessible 
even in the face of hardware failures or maintenance activities. Last up, we have file synchronization. This is the process of ensuring that files and data are consistently updated and mirrored across multiple devices or locations, allowing users to access the latest versions of files from any device or location. Cloud storage services often include file synchronization capabilities, allowing users to sync files across devices and access them from anywhere with an internet connection. This facilitates collaboration, data sharing, and remote access to files, improving productivity and efficiency for users and organizations. Exam Objective 4.1 Summarize Cloud Computing Concepts Cloud Service Types Building upon our previous discussion of the diverse cloud deployment models, public, private, hybrid, and community, it's now time to learn about the various service types that comprise the cloud computing landscape. Cloud services fall into three primary categories. Infrastructure as a Service or IaaS, Platform as a Service or PaaS, and Software as a Service or SaaS. These service types represent distinct levels of abstraction and functionality, each offering unique benefits and use cases. Let's explore each of these service types in detail to gain a comprehensive understanding of their functionalities and advantages. IaaS serves as the foundational layer. It grants organizations access to fundamental computing resources like servers, storage, and networking infrastructure. Here, users have the autonomy to build and manage their virtual machines and networks remotely, allowing for seamless scalability according to demand. IS liberates businesses from the burden of investing in costly hardware and alleviates the complexities of maintenance, providing a flexible environment for building and hosting their data and applications. Building upon the infrastructure layer, PAST elevates cloud computing by offering a comprehensive software development and deployment environment. Imagine PAST as a streamlined construction site where software developers are empowered to build and deploy applications without worrying about the underlying infrastructure. PaaS platforms abstract away the intricacies of configuring servers and managing networking resources, enabling software developers to focus solely on coding. This model accelerates the development lifecycle, fostering rapid application delivery and facilitating collaboration among development teams. At the pinnacle of cloud services lies SaaS, SaaS can be likened to a fully furnished home, where users simply consume ready-made applications over the internet. With SaaS, organizations can access a plethora of software applications, from productivity suites to customer relationship management systems, via web browsers or dedicated clients. This consumption-based model eliminates the need for installation, maintenance, or updates, providing unparalleled convenience and accessibility for users. In essence, cloud services empower organizations to leverage modern computing technologies while minimizing operational overhead and capital expenditures. Whether it's the flexibility of IaaS, the agility of PaaS, or the convenience of SaaS, cloud computing serves as a catalyst for innovation, collaboration, and business growth in today's digital landscape. Moving forward with this topic, you should also understand how responsibility is shared between users and cloud service providers across different service types. In managing a cloud environment, this shared responsibility encompasses various components, including the data center, networking, storage, servers, virtualization, operating system, data, and applications. For infrastructure as a service, Users bear more responsibility for managing the operating system, applications, and data. The cloud provider handles infrastructure-related tasks such as data center management, networking, storage, server maintenance, and virtualization management. In platform as a service, the cloud provider takes on more responsibility for managing the underlying infrastructure by including the operating system. Users are primarily responsible for developing, deploying, and managing their applications and data. With software as a service, 
the cloud provider assumes the majority of responsibility, including managing the entire stack from infrastructure to applications. Users are typically responsible for configuring the application settings and managing user access. This division of responsibility allows users to focus on their core business functions while leveraging the expertise and resources of the cloud service provider. By understanding the shared responsibilities across different service types, organizations can effectively manage their cloud environments and maximize the benefits of cloud computing. Exam Objective 4.1 Summarize Cloud Computing Concepts Desktop Virtualization Desktop virtualization fundamentally changes how we interact with computers by decoupling or separating the content displayed on your screen from the physical hardware of the machine itself. Picture a scenario where your computer's operating system, all the applications you use, and your files are not stored directly on your device. Instead, they reside on a server that's accessible over a network connection. This means that regardless of the device you're using or where you are, you can access your desktop environment with all your familiar applications and files intact. This paradigm shift embodies the core of desktop virtualization, providing unmatched flexibility, accessibility, and convenience in our technological interactions. Virtual Desktop Infrastructure, or VDI, takes this concept further. For the purpose of this training course, I will be simplifying this concept down to three main parts, the client, the server, and the virtual machines that house our virtual desktops. The client is your computer or device that you use to connect to the virtual machine. It could be a laptop, workstation, or even a tablet or smartphone. The server is the central hub that stores and manages all the virtual machine setups. This server can be local, referred to as on-premises or located in the cloud. Then there are the virtual machines, which house our virtual desktops. These virtual machines reside on the server and are controlled by a special piece of software known as a Type 1 hypervisor. With VDI, each user will have their own virtual machine, complete with an operating system, applications, and their personal files. Just imagine each virtual machine as a personalized workspace, tailor-made for each user. Together, these components form the backbone of VDI. Now, let's walk through how a connection works. Imagine you're at home or in the office and need to do some work. You grab your laptop, which acts as the client device, and turn it on. Now it is time to connect to the server. To do this, you would open up a program or website on your laptop designed to connect you to your virtual desktop. This program acts like a special door that takes you to your virtual desktop. Next, the program will prompt you to enter your username and password. Once you do, it knows who you are and where to take you. The program then communicates with the server, saying, Hey, someone wants to use their virtual desktop. Can you help them out? The server looks up your details and locates the virtual machine that contains your virtual desktop. The server says, sure thing, and sets up a special connection just for you. And that's how a connection works in VDI. It's like having your personal computer stored remotely that is available whenever you need it. So you know what VDI is and how it works. Time to discuss some of its benefits. Firstly, VDI provides agility by allowing clients and virtual desktops to be easily initiated and terminated from the virtual desktop infrastructure. Additionally, it centralizes desktop management, leading to increased productivity. Furthermore, VDI enhances security by centralizing data and applications, granting companies remote control over users' operating systems and enabling strict access controls. With VDI, you get all these benefits and more, while also reducing operational costs. Exam Objective 4.2 Summarize Aspects of Client-Side Virtualization As previously discussed, desktop virtualization and the virtual desktop infrastructure involves hosting desktop environments on remote servers. 
In this model, the desktop environment, including the operating system, applications, and user data, resides centrally on a server and is accessed by a user's client device over a network connection. While this works great for many use cases, we do have another virtualization option. This option is called client-side virtualization, and it involves running virtual machines directly on the end user device. In this model, a type two hypervisor or virtualization software is installed on the client device, not a remote server allowing users to create and run multiple virtual machines concurrently. Each virtual machine operates as an isolated environment with its own operating system and applications, enabling users to run different operating systems or experiment with software configurations without affecting the host system. Next, I will take you a bit deeper into this topic and show you what client-side virtualization might look like. Behind me, I have a laptop, which will be referred to as the host device in this client-side virtualization setup. This device has physical hardware, such as a CPU, memory, storage, and a network connection. This host device also has an operating system installed on it. So far, this setup is just like any other until I install a Type 2 hypervisor application. Once I do that, I unlock the power of client-side virtualization. With a Type 2 hypervisor installed on the host OS, I can create and control virtual machines, complete with their own isolated operating systems, applications, and data files. Each virtual machine will also be allocated a configurable portion of the host machine's physical resources with which to use. While you can configure the virtual machine with as little or as much resources as you would like, just make sure to save enough resources for the host OS. Moving on, client-side virtualization provides a versatile solution for various use cases. Firstly, it can serve as a sandbox environment, allowing users to create isolated virtual machines for testing new software, experimental code, or conducting system experiments without impacting their primary operating environment. This ensures that any potential issues or conflicts are contained within the virtual environment, minimizing risks to the host system. Additionally, client-side virtualization is invaluable for software development and testing, enabling developers to replicate different operating systems, hardware configurations, or network setups for comprehensive testing and validation of applications. Furthermore, it facilitates the virtualization of legacy software or operating systems, enabling organizations to continue using outdated applications without the need for dedicated legacy hardware. Lastly, client-side virtualization supports cross-platform development and testing by allowing users to create virtual machines with different operating systems, ensuring seamless performance across diverse platforms Overall, client-side virtualization enhances productivity, streamlines testing processes, and overcomes compatibility challenges in software development and deployment. Exam Objective 4.2 Summarize Aspects of Client-Side Virtualization Hypervisor We're on the brink of wrapping up our exploration of Domain 4 in the CompTIA A plus core one exam objectives. But hold on to your hats because we've got one more exciting topic to cover, hypervisors. Now, you might recall that we encountered the term hypervisor in our studies of desktop virtualization and then again when I covered client-side virtualization. Well, that is because a hypervisor is the software that makes virtualization possible. A hypervisor is a software layer that allows multiple operating systems to run on a single physical hardware platform simultaneously. It accomplishes this by dividing up the computer's resources, like its processing power, memory, and storage, so that different programs or operating systems can run on it without getting in each other's way. Now that we have a solid definition of hypervisor, we will move on to learning about the two main types, the Type 1 hypervisor and the Type 2 hypervisor. 
Type 1 hypervisors, also known as bare metal hypervisors, operate directly on the host hardware without requiring an underlying operating system. They have direct access to physical resources, offering high performance and efficiency, which makes them suitable for enterprise environments and data centers where virtualizing servers is common practice. In contrast, Type 2 hypervisors, also known as hosted hypervisors, run as applications on top of conventional operating systems like Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. They rely on the underlying operating system to manage hardware resources and provide services to virtual machines. Type 2 hypervisors are often used for client-side virtualization. The primary distinction between Type 1 and Type 2 hypervisors lies in their architecture and how they interact with hardware, with Type 1 offering superior performance and scalability for larger-scale virtualization deployments, while Type 2 is more suitable for smaller-scale or individual virtualization needs. After you install a hypervisor, you can open up its user interface and begin to create, start up, shut down, and terminate any number of virtual machines. You will also have the ability to control resource allocations to each instance, including the amount of memory or RAM, the number of CPU cores. You can even set up various types of networking capabilities. Lastly, let's explore virtualization security. When it comes to securing virtualized environments, several measures can be taken. One strategy is to limit the ability to create virtual machines altogether. Disabling virtualization in the BIOS or UEFI settings is a security measure used to prevent unauthorized or unintended virtual machine creation and execution on a system. Next, we have a Virtual Trusted Platform Module, or VTPM. This technology is used in virtualized environments to provide security functions similar to a physical TPM. The Virtual Trusted Platform Module enables the creation and management of a virtual TPM instance within virtual machines, allowing them to benefit from TPM functionality without requiring physical TPM hardware. This technology enhances security by enabling features such as secure boot and hardware-based encryption within the guest operating system. Even with all this security in place, the primary security concern facing a virtualized environment is an attack known as virtual machine escape. This is a security vulnerability in virtualized environments where an attacker gains unauthorized access to the host system or hypervisor from within a guest virtual machine. This exploit allows the attacker to break out of the confines of the virtual machine and execute malicious code or access sensitive information on the host system. Virtual machine escape vulnerabilities pose a significant security risk as they can potentially compromise the integrity and security of the entire virtualized environment. Exam Objective 5.1 Given a scenario, apply the best practice methodology to resolve problems. Troubleshooting methodology. Troubleshooting is simply the process of problem solving. In the world of IT, you will be called upon to solve problems on a regular basis. Having a step-by-step -step approach to troubleshooting will help make this task much easier. In exam objective 5.1, CompTIA has outlined a troubleshooting process to follow. This process can be broken into six steps. 1. Identify the problem. 2. Establish a theory of probable cause. 3. Test the theory to determine the cause. 4. Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem. 5. Verify full system functionality. 6. Document the findings, actions, and outcomes. The first step in CompTIA's troubleshooting process is to identify the problem. To do this, we must turn to the left side of our brains and think logically. Fortunately, we have a few guidelines that can help keep us on track during this stage of troubleshooting. The main objective at this stage in the troubleshooting process is to gather information. 
Information can be gathered in many ways. You can try duplicating the problem. Observing the issue as it occurs can give great insight. You can question the users. If a user is experiencing the problem, they will have first-hand knowledge of the issue. Also, don't discount that the issue could be user error. Computing systems and their programs, at times, can be complex, so misuse is always a possibility. Identifying the symptoms will help narrow down possible causes for an issue. Symptoms could include error messages, logs, or physical conditions. Many times we can use our sense of smell, sight, touch, or hearing as diagnostic tools. I would probably avoid taste, though. Determining if anything has changed is another way to identify a problem. Commonly, issues arise after changes or updates have taken place. These changes could be environmental or infrastructure-based. Finally, if data loss is a possibility, perform a backup before making any changes. Step 2 in CompTIA's troubleshooting process is to establish a theory of probable cause. This step is closely related to step 3, which is to test the theory to determine the cause. These two steps may also be repeated as many times as necessary, as sometimes our initial theory is wrong. If at first you don't succeed, try again. If you have completed step 1, identify the problem. Then you hopefully have gathered sufficient information about an issue to proceed to step 2. Establish a theory of probable cause. Here you will begin to think about possible causes to an issue with the hopes of narrowing down the list of suspects. When first getting going, start with theories that are easy to test and be sure to question the obvious. Assumptions at this point can be catastrophic. Let's say we receive a complaint that a user's laptop is not working. An example of questioning the obvious would be to check if it is even charged. It may also be necessary to conduct external or internal research based on the symptoms. For this, you would use a research knowledge base. A knowledge base is a self-serve library of information about a product, service, or topic. A knowledge base could be compiled by a company, manufacturer, or simply the internet, which would probably be the biggest knowledge base of all. The whole idea behind a knowledge base is to pull from the experience of those who have come before you. In other words, if someone has already experienced the same problem and has documented the solution, and you trust the source, then maybe their solution can work for you too. Step 3 in CompTIA's troubleshooting process is to test the theory to determine the cause. Coming up with a theory was a great start, but now you need to test it. While testing is the logical step after establishing a theory, we need to remember these two steps are an iterative process and we might need to repeat them a number of times. Testing a theory will require some kind of experiment or action to confirm the cause of an issue. This can include changing out a component for a known good component or performing an experiment on a test system. Once your theory is confirmed and you have found the root cause of an issue, the next step is to resolve the problem. If testing does not confirm your theory, establish a new theory. At some point, you may run out of ideas, and that is okay. At that point, you need to find a way to escalate the problem. A form of escalation could be seeking help from another technician, a supervisor, or a specialist in the area you are having an issue with. After determining the root cause of an issue, you can move on to step 4 in CompTIA's troubleshooting process. Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement the solution. Within your plan of action, you are likely to come to one of three solution measures repair, replace, or ignore. Ignoring a problem as a solution measure is self-explanatory, so I will focus on repair and replace. The choice between repair and replace will usually come down to cost. Repairing is usually a cheaper alternative to replacing, but not always. When establishing your plan, start by deciding if you will repair, replace, or ignore the problem. The rest of your plan will fall in line after that. Another item to be aware of when establishing a plan is to identify the potential side effects of your plan. 
Many times in IT, systems are interconnected. A change to one system can often have unintended side effects on another system. You may not be able to prevent every side effect, but proper planning can at least keep these to a minimum. Once you have established a plan of action, it is time to implement your solution. The biggest concern with implementing a solution is minimizing disruptions and obtaining authorization. If you did a thorough job while establishing your plan, it will include detailed steps, required resources, and most importantly, a rollback or backout plan should things go wrong. Also, you should have spent some time reviewing any related vendor documentation for guidance. Having these items in place will help the implementation process run smoother. Your job at this point is to cause as little disruption to the systems in place and their users as possible. In larger environments, it may even be necessary to seek authorization for a change. This authorization might come from a supervisor or a change advisory board. Whatever steps you take, just be sure your actions always align with the corporate policies and procedures for the implementation of changes. After the implementation of a solution, it is time for Step 5 of CompTIA's troubleshooting process which is to verify full system functionality. While you may have only made a change to one system in IT, it is common that multiple systems will be interconnected. Thus, in addition to verifying that you resolve the initial issue, you will need to verify the system as a whole continues to function properly. Now that you have solved the problem, we want to make sure it does not happen again. Preventing the recurrence of an issue is where you can truly set yourself apart from other technicians. Though not always in your control, the recurrence of some issues can be avoided with user education, by changing a process, or by using an alternate software or equipment provider. The final and last step in CompTIA's troubleshooting process is to document your findings. Again, the last step is to document everything document the symptoms, document your actions, document your outcomes, and document any lessons learned. That way, when a problem is resolved, there is a complete record of everything that transpired during the entire troubleshooting process. This can be extremely helpful when providing any technical support in the future. Do you remember when we discussed the research knowledge base a few moments ago? Well, where do you think a company's knowledge base comes from? Knowledge bases evolve and grow over time as issues are experienced. So do your best when documenting any issues you resolve, as people other than you may come to rely on it in the future. Exam Objective 5.2 Give them a scenario, troubleshoot problems related to motherboards, RAM, CPU, and power. This video will cover troubleshooting issues related to motherboards, RAM, CPU, and power. For each of the common symptoms listed in the CompTIA A plus Core 1 Exam Objective 5.2, I will provide some basic information and possible root causes. Additionally, as a pro test taking tip, you should always perform verifications, inspections, or checks before performing any repairs or component replacements. When a computer system fails to power on, it signals a potential array of underlying issues that require attention. One primary culprit for this scenario could be a malfunctioning power supply unit, or PSU, which is responsible for supplying electrical power to the computing device. A faulty PSU may fail to deliver adequate power or fail entirely, preventing the system from starting up. Additionally, Loose connections between the power supply cables and the motherboard, CPU, or other components can disrupt the flow of electricity, resulting in a failure to power on. Furthermore, the PSU may not be receiving power from the wall outlet. If the computing device has sufficient power, it will proceed to the power on self-test or post. If everything checks out OK during the post, a single audible beep will be heard. Otherwise, a series of beeps will be triggered, indicating a potential hardware malfunction. These audible alerts or beeps play a crucial role in diagnosing underlying issues.
Each beep pattern will correspond to a specific hardware problem, with the most common culprits being motherboard malfunctions, memory failures, or CPU issues. By recognizing and deciphering these post peep codes, users can promptly address the root cause, whether it involves examining the motherboard for defects, such as chipset failures, damaged capacitors, corrosion, or loose components, troubleshooting memory modules to see if they have failed or become unseated, or inspecting the CPU for failure or a disconnected CPU fan. Encountering a black screen upon startup can be indicative of several potential hardware issues within a computer system. One possible cause for this occurrence is a problem with the motherboard. This could prevent the power on self-test from ever taking place or cause a beep code. Similarly, problems with the graphics card or the display can also result in a black screen scenario. Additionally, issues with the power supply unit can contribute to a black screen situation. If your device has power, gets past the post-test, and does not encounter a black screen, then it will continue on with the boot process. The next stage is to load the operating system. This is where you may encounter a proprietary crash screen. Encountering proprietary crash screens, such as the infamous blue screen of death on Windows systems or the spinning pinwheel on Mac OS, is often a distressing experience for computer users. These screens serve as indicators of critical system errors that require immediate attention. One common culprit behind these crash screens is driver conflicts, where incompatible or outdated device drivers clash with the operating system, leading to system instability and crashes. Furthermore, faulty hardware components can also trigger these crash screens. Issues such as damaged motherboards, failing RAM modules, malfunctioning graphics cards, or overheating CPUs can all contribute to system crashes and the appearance of proprietary crash screens. Overheating is another threat to the stability and performance of computer systems. One of the primary consequences of overheating is system instability, wherein the computer may exhibit erratic behavior, unexpected shutdowns, or even hardware damage. Several factors contribute to overheating, with inadequate cooling mechanisms being a primary concern. Insufficient airflow within the computer case, inadequate ventilation, or poorly designed cooling systems can all exacerbate heat buildup, leading to elevated temperatures. Additionally, the accumulation of dust and debris on internal components can impede heat dissipation, compounding the problem. Another common cause of overheating is a malfunctioning fan. If a fan fails to operate at optimal speeds or stops working altogether, the computing device can quickly reach dangerously high temperatures. Sluggish performance is a frustrating issue that can significantly impair the functionality and efficiency of a computer system, hindering productivity and user experience. One common underlying cause of sluggishness is insufficient compute resources such as CPU processing power, available RAM, or available storage. Another factor contributing to sluggishness is CPU overheating. When the CPU reaches excessively high temperatures due to inadequate cooling or airflow within the system, it may throttle or reduce its processing speed to prevent damage. Intermittent shutdowns are another concern facing computing devices. These abrupt shutdowns may stem from various underlying causes, necessitating thorough investigation to pinpoint the root problem. One potential reason for these shutdowns is a faulty power supply. Fluctuations in power delivery or outright failures can trigger sudden system shutdowns. Power supplies with insufficient wattage ratings can also lead to the same issue. Additionally, Overheating poses another significant concern. When critical components, such as the CPU or graphics card, reach excessive temperatures due to poor ventilation or malfunctioning cooling systems, the system may automatically shut down to prevent damage, manifesting as intermittent shutdowns during operation. Frequent application crashes can significantly disrupt productivity and frustrate users, 
often indicating underlying issues within the computer system. The cause behind these crashes may be faulty RAM. When RAM modules develop defects or fail to function properly, they can corrupt data or cause applications to crash unexpectedly. Additionally, software conflicts can also trigger frequent application crashes. Incompatible software versions, conflicting drivers, or corrupted system files can create conflicts within the operating system, causing applications to malfunction and crash. Moreover, insufficient storage can exacerbate application crashes, as a lack of available disk space can impede the proper functioning of applications and the operating system. The detection of a burning smell within a computer system serves as a potent warning sign, hinting at potentially severe hardware issues that demand immediate attention. This cue typically indicates overheating or damage to internal components, signifying a critical situation that requires swift resolution. The source of the burning smell may vary, with just about every hardware component being a possible cause. For instance, a malfunctioning PSU may emit a distinct burning odor when its internal components become overheated or compromised. Similarly, a damaged motherboard or overheating CPU can also produce a burning smell, signaling imminent hardware failure or damage. Prompt action is imperative when detecting such a scent, as ignoring it could lead to irreversible damage, data loss, or even a fire hazard. When a burning smell is encountered, Users should immediately power off the system, unplug it from the power source, and seek professional assistance to diagnose and address the underlying cause. Capacitors are essential electronic components found on computer motherboards and other circuit boards, tasked with storing and releasing electrical energy as needed. They serve various functions within the system, including stabilizing voltage levels and regulating current flow. When a capacitor becomes swollen or bulging, it signifies a significant issue known as capacitor swelling, which often indicates impending component failure. This swelling occurs due to internal pressure buildup caused by factors such as excessive heat, prolonged usage, or manufacturing defects. As the capacitor expands beyond its normal dimensions, it can disrupt the electrical circuitry and functionality of the motherboard. This disruption can lead to system instability, erratic behavior, or even complete system failure. Additionally, in severe cases, the swelling of capacitors can result in the leakage of electrolytic fluid, which may emit smoke and a distinct burning smell as it comes into contact with other components or circuitry. Lastly, the CMOS is a component within a computer system that aids in preserving BIOS settings, including system date, time, and hardware configuration details. The CMOS is essentially a small onboard battery used to retain these settings even when the computer is powered off. Inaccurate system date and time settings can often be attributed to issues related to the CMOS battery. The CMOS battery provides backup power to maintain the integrity of these settings when the main power source is disconnected. However, if over time, this battery may degrade or lose its charge, leading to inaccuracies in system date and time settings. Detecting inaccuracies in system date and time settings is crucial as they can affect various system functions, including file timestamping, software licensing, and scheduled tasks. Exam Objective 5.3 Given a scenario, troubleshoot and diagnose problems with storage drives and RAID arrays. This video will cover troubleshooting issues related to storage and RAID arrays. For each of the common symptoms listed in the CompTIA A plus Core 1 Exam Objective 5.3, I will provide some basic information and possible root causes. Additionally, as a pro test taking tip, you should always perform verifications, inspections, or checks before performing any repairs or component replacements. Storage drives and RAID arrays are integral components of modern computing systems responsible for storing and managing vast amounts of data. However, they are not immune to issues that can arise over time, leading to data loss, 
system instability and performance degradation, troubleshooting and diagnosing problems with storage drives and RAID arrays require a comprehensive understanding of common symptoms and their underlying causes. Kicking things off, we have LED status indicators that serve as a vital diagnostic tool for both storage drives and RAID arrays, offering insights into their operational health. These indicators, often present on the exterior casing of the drives or the RAID controller, utilize different colors or blinking patterns to convey critical information to users and system administrators. A steady green light typically signifies normal operation, indicating that the drive or array is functioning as expected. However, deviations from this standard can alert users to potential issues. For instance, a flashing red LED might indicate a drive failure, prompting immediate action to replace the faulty disk and initiate data recovery procedures. Similarly, an amber or orange light might suggest a cautionary state. Furthermore, specific blinking patterns may denote ongoing data transfer activity, providing reassurance that the storage system is actively processing information. By interpreting these LED status indicators correctly, users can promptly identify and address potential problems minimizing downtime and safeguarding data integrity within their storage infrastructure. Clicking sounds emanating from storage drives are often ominous indicators of imminent failure, typically attributed to malfunctioning read and write heads or damaged platters within a hard disk drive. These sounds, resembling repetitive clicks or ticks, signify mechanical distress and should prompt immediate attention from users or system administrators. In response to these audible warnings, swift action is imperative to mitigate risks of data loss and system instability. Urgent measures, such as backing up data and replacing the failing drive, are essential. By promptly addressing clicking sounds and initiating necessary remedial actions, Users can effectively safeguard their data and maintain the integrity of their storage infrastructure. Data loss or corruption represents a significant threat to the integrity and accessibility of stored data within computing systems. This perilous occurrence can manifest due to an array of factors such as a failed storage drive or corrupted file system. When confronted with such an issue, Users often resort to employing data recovery tools or seeking professional services to attempt the salvage of lost or corrupted data. These interventions aim to restore critical information and minimize the potential impact of data loss. However, prevention remains the cornerstone of effective data management. Regular backups serve as a formidable defense against data loss or corruption. Furthermore, Proactive measures such as running disk diagnostic utilities like the Check Disk Command on Windows systems or the File System Consistency Check on Mac OS can help identify and rectify underlying disk errors before they escalate into catastrophic data loss events. RAID or redundant array of independent disks are praised for their ability to provide both redundancy and improved performance in data storage systems. However, despite their advantages, RAID arrays are not immune to failures, which can manifest in various forms. Disk failures are perhaps the most common issue, where individual drives within the array malfunction, leading to the aforementioned data loss or corruption. When faced with a RAID failure, immediate action is necessary to mitigate potential data loss and restore system functionality. This often involves rebuilding the RAID array which entails replacing failed drives with new ones and initiating a data reconstruction process to restore redundancy. Moreover, RAID failure can also result in degraded array states where performance is compromised and data access speeds are significantly reduced. Addressing these issues promptly through proper diagnosis, component replacement, and maintenance procedures is essential to restoring the reliability and performance of the RAID array and ensuring uninterrupted access to critical data. Self-monitoring, analysis, and reporting technology, otherwise referred to as smart 
stands as a pivotal system embedded within modern storage drives, designed to continuously monitor their health status and anticipate potential failures before they occur. Unlike traditional disk checking utilities, such as the Check Disk Command on Windows systems or the File System Consistency Check on Mac OS, which primarily focus on file system integrity, Smart offers a proactive approach by monitoring various performance metrics related to drive health and performance. By analyzing these metrics, Smart can detect subtle signs of impending drive failure that may not be apparent during routine disk checks. When Smart detects anomalies or deviations from expected behavior that indicate a heightened risk of drive failure, it triggers a Smart failure warning. This warning serves as an urgent alert to users and system administrators, prompting them to take immediate action to safeguard data integrity and system stability. Typically, the recommended course of action in response to a Smart failure warning is to perform an immediate backup of critical data and replace the affected drive with a new one to prevent potential data loss or system downtime. Extended read and write times on storage drives can indicate several underlying issues that impacts system performance and functionality. These delays may stem from data fragmentation on hard disk drives, where data is scattered across the disk in small pieces, resulting in longer read times and reduced efficiency during read and write operations. Additionally, by ensuring there is enough storage space, fragmentation can also be reduced as there is space on the drive with which to place continuous blocks of data, avoiding the need to break data into small pieces. To address these issues, proactive measures like disk defragmentation can be used. Defragmenting a drive involves reorganizing the data into continuous blocks. This reduces read times and improves overall performance. Similarly, we can measure a storage drive's read and write performance based on its IOPS metric. IOPS stands for input-output operations per second and is a performance metric that measures the number of read and write operations a storage device can handle in one second. Calculating IOPS involves two parts, the average size of each operation and the storage drive's transfer rate. The average operation size refers to the amount of data read from or written to the storage device in a single operation and is typically measured in bytes. The transfer rate represents the amount of data that can be read from or written to the storage device per second. Now to calculate IOPS, Take the transfer rate and divide it by the average operation size. When drives are unexpectedly absent from the operating system, several factors may contribute to this inconvenience. One prevalent cause is disconnected cables, where physical connections between the storage device and the system become disrupted, impeding proper communication. Additionally, drive failure itself could be a factor with a malfunctioning or failed drive no longer detected by the operating system due to hardware issues. Alongside these factors, the drive's initialization status is significant. Drive initialization is a process by which the drive is prepared for use by the operating system. It involves creating a partition table and formatting the drive with a file system. This step is crucial especially for new drives or those previously used with different systems. Without proper initialization, the drive may not appear in the operating system's list of available drives. Lastly, if the drive that happens to be missing is the drive that contains the operating system files, you will likely encounter an error message that reads bootable device not found. Again, this could likely be a storage drive connection where physical cables connecting the drive containing the OS has become loose or disconnected. Another possibility is drive failure, where the storage drive itself experiences malfunctions or damage, rendering it inaccessible for booting. Additionally, examining the BIOS settings, specifically the boot order, to verify that the correct boot device is selected can help rectify configuration-related issues Exam Objective 5.4, given a scenario, troubleshoot video, projector, and display issues.
This video will cover troubleshooting issues related to displays. For each of the common symptoms listed in the CompTIA A plus Core 1 Exam Objective 5.4, I will provide some basic information and possible root causes. Additionally, as a pro test taking tip, you should always perform verifications, inspections, or checks before performing any repairs or component replacements. Understanding the intricacies of display devices, including monitors and projectors, is crucial for effective troubleshooting given their pivotal role in various settings like classrooms, conference rooms, and various media systems. For our first display issue, we have an incorrect data source selection. While troubleshooting a projector or monitor, this can manifest as a lack of image or an error message like, no input signal detected. This common issue often occurs when users inadvertently choose the wrong input source on the display device. However, resolving this issue is relatively straightforward. By verifying and adjusting the input source settings to ensure the correct one is selected, you can effectively remedy the situation. Damaged physical cabling can also disrupt various display setups, leading to image and audio signal distortion or even a complete lack of signal input. These disruptions often stem from loose or damaged cables, connectors, or adapters within the system. To effectively address these issues, users need to carefully inspect all cables and connections for any signs of damage, such as frayed wires, bent pins, or worn out connectors. A dim image is yet another display issue where the display image appears significantly darker than desired. This symptom can arise due to various underlying causes. Firstly, an incorrect brightness setting on the source or display device may be at fault, leading to decreased illumination levels. Additionally, in the case of a monitor, a failed backlight may be responsible for a dim screen. With many modern monitors, a backlight is used to illuminate the display panel allowing the images to be visible. If the backlight fails or malfunctions, it can result in a dim or completely dark display. Furthermore, a malfunctioning inverter within the display may also contribute to the dimness of the screen. The inverter is a component responsible for supplying power to the backlight in older LCD displays. If the inverter fails or encounters an issue, it can result in an inadequate power supply to the backlight leading to dimness or flickering in the displayed image on the screen. One method to determine if the inverter or backlight is malfunctioning is to shine a light directly onto the screen and observe for any faint images. If you see an image when shining a light onto the screen, it suggests that the backlight may be malfunctioning or not receiving power as the image is being displayed but not adequately illuminated. Next. We have display burn-in. Display burn-in refers to the phenomenon where persistent images or patterns become burned into the display screen over time, resulting in ghost images. This occurs when certain pixels on the display are subjected to prolonged exposure to static images, causing them to degrade at a faster rate compared to surrounding pixels. To avoid display burn-in, users can take several measures one approach is to minimize the display of static images for extended periods. This can be achieved by using screensavers or power-saving features that automatically dim or turn off the display after a period of inactivity. Additionally, rotating content or using dynamic wallpapers can help prevent the prolonged exposure of specific pixels to static images. Moving forward, we have dead pixels. These are individual pixels on the display screen that fail to illuminate, resulting in small, black spots that remain dark, regardless of the display content. Dead pixels can occur due to physical damage to the display panel or prolonged use. To reduce the occurrence of dead pixels, users should handle their displays with care to prevent physical damage. This includes avoiding applying excessive pressure to the screen and keeping the display away from liquids. If you come across a display that rapidly switches between being visible and blank, you're dealing with a flashing screen. 
The primary causes of this issue typically involve either cable connections from the source device or electrical malfunctions, such as problems with the backlight or inverter. Poor or loose cable connections between the display and the source device can result in signal interruptions, causing the screen to flicker or flash intermittently. This can occur due to loose video cables as well as damaged connectors or adapters. Ensuring that all cables are securely connected and undamaged is essential to prevent signal disruptions and minimize the occurrence of a flashing screen. Electrical malfunctions within the display, such as issues with the backlight or inverter, can also contribute to a flashing screen. If either of these components happens to fail or malfunction, it can result in an irregular power supply to the display, leading to screen flickering or flashing. Do you have a display with distorted, washed out, or inaccurate colors? If so, you might want to check for a faulty cable. If cables such as HDMI or VGA suffer damage, it can result in signal degradation or an interference, leading to color distortion or imbalance on the screen. Users should regularly inspect cables for signs of wear, fraying, or damaged connector pins as addressing cable issues can effectively resolve color display problems. In addition to cable damage, misconfigured color settings on the display or source device can also lead to incorrect color display. Users should check color settings such as brightness, contrast, hue, and saturation to ensure they are correctly configured. Furthermore, displayed hardware issues, such as malfunctioning components, can also cause incorrect color display. This is especially common in LCD displays where specific areas on the display screen may become noticeably affected. When it comes to projectors, they tend to have some specific issues that users may encounter. One such issue would be intermittent shutdowns during operation. This unexpected powering off is often attributed to overheating. Overheating can be caused by the accumulation of dust and debris within the projector or a dirty air filter, hindering proper airflow and the effectiveness of cooling mechanisms. Regular maintenance, including cleaning the projector's air filter and ensuring adequate ventilation, is crucial to prevent shutdowns related to overheating. Additionally, users should inspect power connections and inspect internal components if shutdown issues persist after ruling out overheating. Another issue you might encounter with a projector is a burned-out bulb. This issue is characterized by no image being projected. The projector bulb, like any other light source, deteriorates over time, leading to diminished brightness and eventually failure. To resolve this issue, users should replace the projector bulb following the manufacturer's guidelines. The image a projector produces may also appear fuzzy at times. This issue is characterized by the appearance of a blurry or less than sharp image. The fuzzy image may result from various factors, including an out of focus lens or improper resolution set. Firstly, users should check the focus of the projector lens to ensure it is properly adjusted for sharpness. Additionally, Verifying and adjusting the resolution settings on both the projector and the source device can help optimize image clarity. Lastly, we have audio issues. Since audio often accompanies video, now is a great time to cover this topic. Audio issues may include distorted audio or no sound at all. These issues can stem from various causes, such as incorrect audio settings, faulty cables, or speaker-related problems. To address these issues effectively, users should start by checking the audio settings, ensuring that the audio output is correctly configured and the correct output device selected can often resolve issues related to sound playback. Additionally, inspecting cables for signs of damage or wear is crucial, as faulty cables can cause signal loss, resulting in audio distortion or no sound output. If cables are found to be faulty, replacing them with new ones can restore proper audio transmission. Furthermore, users should troubleshoot speakers or audio output devices to identify any potential issues with the hardware itself. 
This may involve testing the speakers with other audio sources or connecting alternative output devices to determine if the problem lies with the speakers or the audio source. Exam Objective 5.5 Given a scenario, troubleshoot common issues with mobile devices. This video will cover troubleshooting issues related to mobile devices. For each of the common symptoms listed in the CompTIA A plus Core 1 Exam Objective 5.5, I will provide some basic information and possible root causes. Additionally, as a pro test taking tip, you should always perform verifications, inspections, or checks before performing any repairs or component replacements. In the modern era, mobile devices have evolved from mere communication tools to essential companions in our daily lives, aiding us in everything from work to entertainment. However, despite their sophistication, these devices are not immune to issues that can disrupt their functionality. Understanding common problems and knowing how to troubleshoot them is crucial for users to maximize the utility of their devices. Let's explore some prevalent issues that users may encounter with their mobile devices, starting with improper charging. Improper charging, a common issue encountered by mobile device users, can stem from various causes that require troubleshooting for resolution. Firstly, a bad cable presents a significant concern as damaged or faulty charging cables hinder the flow of electricity from the charger to the device. Secondly, a poor connection between the charging cable and the device's port can add to charging issues. This could be due to a loose connection or simply an accumulation of debris within the charging port. Lastly, Mismatched power ratings between the charger and the device can pose a significant risk. Using a charger that provides insufficient power may result in slow charging or failure to charge, while using a charger with a higher power rating than required can potentially damage the device's battery over time. Next, poor battery health poses a significant concern for mobile device users. One common cause of poor battery health is prolonged usage, where the battery undergoes extensive cycles of charging and discharging, leading to degradation over time. Additionally, as batteries age, they naturally lose their capacity to hold a charge effectively, resulting in decreased overall battery life and performance. Moreover, improper charging can accelerate a battery's decline. When a device feels hot to the touch or fails to retain a charge, it indicates a serious decline in battery health. A swollen battery is a critical issue that demands immediate attention as it poses serious safety risks to the user and the device itself. Typically recognized by a small bulge in the device casing and potential overheating, a swollen battery indicates internal chemical reactions that leads to gas buildup and expansion within the battery itself. This battery expansion causes various physical deformations to the device, often resulting in the inability to click buttons on the trackpad or press keys on the keyboard properly. Additionally, the device may no longer sit level on a flat surface due to the uneven bulge caused by the swollen battery. Furthermore, if the device overheats occasionally, especially while plugged into a wall outlet, it further confirms the poor health status of the battery. In such cases, immediate action is crucial to mitigate potential hazards. Users should refrain from using the device and seek professional assistance promptly to replace the swollen battery. Ignoring a swollen battery can lead to catastrophic consequences, including battery leakage, fire, or explosion. Therefore, addressing this issue promptly is paramount to ensure the safety and functionality of the device and the user. Physically damaged ports present a significant hindrance to the functionality of mobile devices, often manifesting in the inability to charge. This issue arises when the charging port sustains physical damage due to mishandling, accidental impacts, or exposure to moisture. Users may find themselves unable to establish a charging connection despite repeated attempts, indicating a problem with the port's integrity. Additionally, 
The device may also lose the ability to connect with accessories or peripherals that rely on the port. A great first step in troubleshooting a physically damaged port would involve using a replacement cable to determine whether the port itself is the problem or if the cable is faulty. Overheating is a concerning issue that can often be linked to the battery's health, especially if it's deteriorating or swollen. But you already know that. So what else can cause overheating? How about the prolonged usage and or the presence of background applications consuming excessive system resources? Yes, that too can lead to overheating as applications put a strain on the device's processor. Additionally, avoiding prolonged use of the device as a Wi-Fi hotspot can help minimize heat generation, as this feature can significantly increase the device's workload and contribute to overheating. Similarly, other connection types such as GPS should be used judiciously to prevent unnecessary strain on the device's hardware, reducing the likelihood of overheating incidents. When a mobile device encounters liquid damage, it often exhibits telltale signs such as water being visible under the screen or distortion in the graphic display. Even in the absence of visible indicators, it's crucial to promptly power off the device if liquid damage is suspected. After powering off the device, it is essential to remove any liquid or moisture that is present. If there's suspicion that internal components were exposed, disassembling the device for thorough drying becomes necessary. Once dry, cleaning the circuit boards and contacts would be recommended. A broken screen is a common issue that compromises both the functionality and aesthetics of a mobile device. When the screen is cracked or shattered, it not only obstructs visibility, but also poses potential safety risks. In such cases, users should consider replacing the screen to restore the device's usability and appearance. However, replacing the screen goes beyond mere visual restoration. It also entails ensuring that essential components such as the webcam, microphone, and wireless antennas, which are often built into or surround the screen, remain operational. While a broken screen affects the display of visual elements, a misconfigured or damaged digitizer presents a very different set of issues. A digitizer is responsible for detecting and interpreting touch inputs. When users experience digitizer issues, the screen may appear normal, but touch interactions fail to register accurately or at all. Users may find that despite the screen displaying content as usual, attempts to interact with the device yield no response. This can be particularly frustrating when essential functions such as tapping icons or typing on a virtual keyboard become impossible. In such cases, Troubleshooting may involve adjusting tablet or PC settings to ensure that touch screen functionality is enabled and properly configured. However, if the device continues to be unresponsive to touch inputs, despite these adjustments, it may indicate a more serious underlying issue requiring component repair or replacement. Cursor drift and touch calibration issues commonly occur when the digitizer of a device becomes misaligned or inaccurate. With cursor drift, users may notice that the cursor on the screen continuously drifts or moves erratically, making precise selection or navigation challenging. Similarly, users may encounter difficulties in selecting the intended target, with touch inputs failing to register accurately or consistently. To address these issues, Recalibrating the touchscreen digitizer is recommended. By initiating the calibration process, a user like you can rectify misalignment issues and restore the responsiveness and accuracy of the touchscreen, allowing you to finally hit that subscribe button. When it comes to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, poor connectivity or complete lack of connectivity issues can be frustrating and disruptive. When facing a scenario of no connectivity, several factors need to be considered. Firstly, users should check if the adapter is enabled, ensuring that the device is configured to connect to the desired network or peripheral. Additionally, verifying that the antenna is properly connected is essential for establishing a stable connection, 
particularly in wireless communication scenarios. Furthermore, ensuring that peripheral devices, like a wireless mouse, keyboard, or headset, are adequately charged is crucial, as low battery levels can impede connectivity functions. Now, in cases of poor or intermittent connectivity, troubleshooting involves additional considerations. Users should ascertain if the device is within range, as proximity plays a significant role in maintaining a stable connection. Additionally, confirming that the devices are properly paired or configured for communication is essential, as incorrect settings can lead to connectivity issues. Finally, users should be mindful of potential signal interference from external sources, such as electronic devices or physical obstacles, which can disrupt wireless signals and cause connectivity disruptions. Lastly, malware can pose a significant threat to the functionality and security of mobile devices, often manifesting in various symptoms that disrupt normal operation. When a device exhibits unexpected behavior, such as sluggishness or unresponsiveness, malware or rogue applications should be considered as potential causes. Malicious software can consume system resources excessively, leading to degraded performance and unresponsiveness to user inputs. Moreover, malware may initiate unauthorized data usage, resulting in unexpected charges or depletion of data allowances. Additionally, certain types of malware have the capability to access sensitive functionalities of the device, such as the camera, microphone, and location services, without user consent. This invasion of privacy poses serious risks to user data and personal information. Therefore, when encountering unusual behavior on a mobile device, users should remain vigilant and consider the possibility of malware infection. Exam Objective 5.6 Given a scenario, troubleshoot and resolve printer issues. This video will cover troubleshooting issues related to printers. For each of the common symptoms listed in the CompTIA A plus Core 1 Exam Objective 5.6, I will provide some basic information and possible root causes. Additionally, as a pro test taking tip, you should always perform verifications, inspections, or checks before performing any repairs or component replacements. Troubleshooting and resolving printer issues can often be a frustrating yet essential task to maintain smooth operations and high-quality print outputs. When encountering specific symptoms, it's crucial to identify potential causes and apply appropriate solutions. For instance, imagine you have encountered some unintended vertical lines that are ruining your printed pages. What do you do? For this printer issue, and with most printer issues, there are many potential causes. As for a general first step, you should consider which type of printer you are working with. Whether you are working with an inkjet printer, laser printer, thermal, or impact printer can make a world of difference. Now back to this issue of lines down the printed page. In a laser printer, this could be caused by an accumulation of debris on the photosensitive drum. Similarly, scratches on the imaging drum can produce similar results as the drum rotates during printing. Issues with the fuser roller in a laser printer, whether due to wear or damage, can also manifest as lines on printed pages during the fixing process. Another potential cause is a dirty feed roller, which can result in inconsistent paper feeding, leading to lines down the printed page. Additionally, Scratches on the scanner glass can cause streaks or lines to appear on scanned or copied documents, which may subsequently be printed with the lines visible. Another possible issue would be garbled print. This issue presents as random or incorrect characters throughout the page, or it might look similar to a bunch of alien symbols. Regardless of the type of incoherent output you get, the causes for garbled print can stem from various issues within the printer system. Incompatible firmware due to an update is one common cause, where recent firmware updates can result in compatibility problems. In such cases, consider rolling back the firmware update, contacting manufacturer support, checking for firmware patches, 
or reinstalling the firmware update. Another cause is corrupted or incompatible print drivers installed on the computer. If the driver is corrupt or incompatible with the printer model, it can lead to garbled print. Updating or reinstalling the printer driver to ensure compatibility may resolve the issue. Additionally, communication errors between the computer and the printer caused by loose cables, network issues, or interference can also cause garbled print. Ensuring a stable and secure connection can help alleviate this problem. The next issue is specific to laser printers. When toner fails to fuse properly to the paper during printing, it can lead to smudging or smearing and poor print quality. Several factors could contribute to this issue. Firstly, a faulty fuser unit, responsible for heating and pressing the toner onto the paper, may be to blame. Secondly, using an incorrect paper type or weight can affect toner adhesion. Adjusting printer settings or fuser temperature may help in such cases. Additionally, worn or damaged fuser rollers can hinder proper toner fusion. Paper jams are a frequent nuisance in printers, disrupting workflow and causing frustration. When confronted with a paper jam, it's crucial to handle it promptly and safely to prevent printer damage and ensure continued operation. The initial step is to remove the device from service and disconnect the printer from the power source. This minimizes the risk of accidents due to electrical shock, moving parts, or burns from a hot fuser unit. Once safety concerns have been addressed, carefully examine the printer's paper path to identify and remove any obstructions that may be causing the jam. Be thorough in clearing out any loose paper or debris that could impede the paper's movement. If paper jams occur frequently, inspect the pickup roller for wear or contamination, as these issues can contribute to jams. Cleaning or replacing the pickup roller may help prevent future jams. Finally, if an error message persists even after clearing the jam, investigate the paper path for a blocked paper jam sensor. Faded prints can be frustrating, especially when you're expecting crisp and vibrant output. Several factors could contribute to this issue, resulting in prints that appear faint or washed out. One common cause is low ink or toner levels in the printer cartridges. When levels are low, prints may lack intensity. Checking the ink or toner levels and replacing cartridges as needed can help restore print quality. Additionally, incorrect print settings, such as print density and resolution, can lead to faded prints. Adjusting these settings to higher levels can also improve print quality. When encountering double images, also known as echo images, on printed documents, it's important to address the underlying causes. The first step involves checking the imaging drum responsible for transferring toner onto the paper during printing. Inspect the drum for visible signs of damage, wear, or contamination, and clean it using a lint-free cloth and isopropyl alcohol, or as directed by the manufacturer. Additionally, it's essential to inspect the printer's cleaning mechanism, which removes excess toner or debris from internal components, including the drum. When speckling appears on printed pages, it can significantly reduce the overall print quality. This issue often stems from problems with the toner cartridge or insufficient printer maintenance. Firstly, examine the toner cartridge for any signs of leakage or damage. If leakage is present, it can lead to speckling on the pages. Additionally, accumulated dust, debris, or excess toner inside the printer can also cause speckling. If this is evident upon visual inspection, thoroughly clean the internal components of the printer including the drum, fuser unit, and paper path using a toner-approved vacuum and or a lint-free cloth. Printing on the incorrect paper size, such as using letter-sized paper when the document is formatted for legal-sized paper, can lead to various issues. One common problem is that the printer may cut off the bottom of the print job as legal-sized paper is longer than letter-sized paper. To address this scenario effectively, verify the print settings of the document or application to ensure that the correct paper size is selected.
If the document is formatted for legal size paper, but you're using letter size paper, adjust the settings accordingly. Additionally, when using a multi-tray print setup, ensure that the printing trays are correctly set. Incorrect page orientation issues can lead to printouts that do not align properly with the intended layout, resulting in wasted paper or misaligned content. A common scenario involves selecting the wrong orientation in the settings menu. This might cause not just unexpected, but unusual outcomes. To address this problem, start by verifying the print settings before printing. Ensure that the correct page orientation, portrait, or landscape is selected in the printer settings or within the document software. Next, utilize the print preview feature to visualize how the document will appear before printing allowing you to further identify any orientation or layout issues. Incorrect print colors due to toner or ink cartridge issues can significantly affect the quality of printouts. If the colors appear distorted, faded, or inconsistent, it may indicate a problem with the toner or ink cartridges. Begin by checking the levels of toner or ink in the cartridges. Low levels can lead to inconsistent color output or fading. Replace any cartridges that are low or empty to ensure optimal color quality. After addressing toner or ink cartridge issues, if print quality problems persist, it may indicate incorrect color settings. Ensure that the correct color profile and settings are selected within the document or image you are trying to print and verify that the printer settings align with the color settings in your document or image. Additionally, consider calibrating the color settings on your printer to ensure accurate color reproduction. When encountering problems with paper not feeding properly into the printer, it's essential to consider various factors. Firstly, ensure that the paper is correctly aligned within the paper tray, as improper alignment can lead to feeding difficulties. Additionally, verify that the paper loaded in the tray matches the size and weight specifications supported by the printer, as using the wrong paper size or weight can hinder feeding. Checking the condition of the paper stack is also crucial, as any damage such as creases or moisture can lead to feeding problems. Lastly, inspect the feed roller for signs of wear or damage, as a worn feed roller may not grip the paper properly resulting in feeding issues. Regarding multi-page misfeeds, a common cause is a worn or damaged separation pad. This component ensures that only one sheet of paper is fed into the printer at a time. When a printer emits a grinding noise, it often indicates a mechanical issue within the device. If such a noise is heard, inspect the printer's internal components by opening the printer's covers and visually examining gears, rollers, and belts for signs of damage, wear, or misalignment. Regular maintenance also has a role in preventing grinding noises. This involves cleaning the printer's interior and lubricating moving parts, according to the manufacturer's guidelines. When a print queue is backed up, it means that there are multiple print jobs waiting in line or are pending but not currently printing. This situation can arise due to various reasons. For instance, the print device may be out of paper, ink, or toner, hindering it from processing print jobs. Additionally, if the printer is offline or experiencing connectivity issues, it can cause a backlog in the print queue. Moreover, Errors while processing a specific print job can also contribute to the queue being backed up. To address this in Windows, go to Windows Settings to access the printer and open its print queue. Then proceed to restart the current job. If that does not work, delete the print job and try printing it again. If you cannot delete the print job, you will need to stop and restart the print spooler service. Lastly, we have issues related to printer finishing units. These are optional components available in some printers that provide additional features beyond basic printing capabilities. These units are designed to enhance the appearance and functionality of printed documents by offering options such as stapling, hole punching, and folding. However, issues can arise with these finishing units, particularly concerning hole punching and stapling.
When users attempt to hole punch or staple a stack of sheets that exceeds the maximum capacity supported by the finishing unit, it can lead to jams and malfunctions. Exam Objective 5.7 Given a scenario, troubleshoot problems with wired and wireless networks. This video will cover troubleshooting issues related to networking. For each of the common symptoms listed in the CompTIA A plus Core 1 Exam Objective 5.7, I will provide some basic information and possible root causes. Additionally, as a pro test taking tip, you should always perform verifications, inspections, or checks before performing any repairs or component replacements. Troubleshooting networking issues is crucial to maintain a reliable internet connection and ensure seamless communication between devices. One common symptom users may encounter is limited connectivity, which can manifest as the internet connection being down or displaying a message stating, no internet access. When faced with limited connectivity, several potential issues could be causing the problem. One common troubleshooting step that can be used to isolate the root cause is to check whether the device has obtained an APIPA address. APIPA addresses are self-assigned IP addresses that devices generate when they fail to obtain an IP address from a DHCP server. If the device has an APIPA address, it indicates a problem with the DHCP server or the device's network configuration. Another troubleshooting step involves testing connectivity by trying to communicate with a remote device or IP address. After ruling out software-based causes, you can move on to physical causes. These include items like faulty network cables and connections. Slow network speeds is another potential networking issue. When addressing slow network speeds, several factors must be considered to pinpoint the root cause and implement effective solutions. First off, Interface configurations, particularly speed and duplex settings, can significantly affect network performance. Incorrectly configured speed and duplex settings may lead to data packet loss or transmission errors, resulting in slow network speeds. Users should ensure that network interface cards and switches are configured to match the network's requirements for optimal performance. Damaged cables or poor connections can also contribute to slow network speeds. Inspecting cables for signs of wear and tear and securely connecting them to network devices can help mitigate this issue. Network congestion occurs when the volume of data traffic exceeds the network's capacity, leading to packet loss and slower transmission speeds. Identifying and addressing congestion points, such as overloaded switches or routers, can help alleviate slow network speeds. Malware infections on network devices can degrade network performance by consuming bandwidth or launching denial-of-service attacks. Regularly updating antivirus software and conducting network security audits can help detect and remove malware, ensuring optimal network performance. Regardless of the underlying issue, it will often speed up the troubleshooting process if you determine the scope of the slow network issue. This involves assessing whether the issue exists on a single device, a specific grouping of devices, or the entire network. Next, we have port flapping. Port flapping refers to a network issue where a port on a network device, such as a switch or router, rapidly alternates between the up and down states. This continuous fluctuation between up and down states which is essentially the interface turning on and off, disrupts network connectivity. Port flapping typically occurs due to problems with the physical connection, such as a faulty cable or connector, or issues with the network interface card. External interference, such as electromagnetic interference, or EMI, poses a significant threat to the stability and reliability of wired networks. EMI can originate from various sources, including fluorescent lights, power cables, generators, and nearby signals emitted by other electronic devices. When cables are exposed to EMI, it can disrupt the transmission of data signals, leading to packet loss and overall network performance degradation. 
To mitigate the impact of EMI on wired networks, it is essential to implement proper shielding and grounding techniques for network cables. Shielded cables help deflect electromagnetic fields, preventing them from interfering with the data signals. Additionally, ensuring that network cables are routed away from power cables and other potential sources of interference can further minimize the risk of EMI-induced disruptions. In wireless network environments, EMI can present unique challenges, particularly in settings where multiple access points are deployed to facilitate wireless connectivity for users. Interference from external sources, such as microwave ovens, cordless telephones, and neighboring Wi-Fi signals, can significantly disrupt wireless communication. This interference can lead to intermittent connectivity issues, slow data transfer rates, and overall poor network performance. To address EMI-related problems in wireless networks, several strategies can be employed. One approach is to carefully select Wi-Fi channels that are less susceptible to interference from neighboring networks and other electronic devices. Additionally, investing in Wi-Fi equipment that incorporates advanced interference mitigation technologies can help minimize the impact of EMI on network performance. These technologies may include signal filtering mechanisms or adaptive channel selection algorithms, which work together to optimize signal quality and reliability in the presence of external interference. Intermittent wireless connectivity, a prevalent issue in wireless networks, can stem from various factors. Alongside the electromagnetic interference we previously discussed, physical obstructions like walls, furniture, or other obstacles can weaken wireless signals, leading to signal loss or degradation. Additionally, the distance between a client device and an access point can exacerbate signal attenuation. Moreover, faulty hardware, such as network interface cards or access points, can compound intermittent wireless connectivity problems. If hardware components are malfunctioning or outdated, they may struggle to establish a stable connection or maintain consistent signal strength. Latency, in simple terms, refers to the time it takes for data to travel from one point to another in a network and is often measured in milliseconds. This can also be thought of as the delay between sending a message and receiving a response. Several factors can contribute to latency issues. Firstly, the physical distance between devices has a direct impact on latency. Understandably, the farther apart two devices are, the longer it takes for data to travel between them. Additionally, network congestion, resulting from excessive traffic, can lead to delays or even loss of data packets, thereby increasing latency. Then there is external influences like EMI. Just about anything you can think of that would slow down network speeds would increase latency, as these two properties are inverses of each other. Therefore, addressing latency issues often involves optimizing network configurations or upgrading hardware, as these actions increase overall network speeds. Jitter in simple terms refers to the variation in delay or the latency of data in a network. Both latency and jitter are metrics that can be used to measure network performance, but unlike latency, which measures the overall time it takes for data to travel from one point to another. Jitter focuses on the inconsistency or fluctuations in the arrival time of data packets. Stated another way, latency represents the average delay between sending a packet and receiving a response, while jitter indicates how much this delay varies over time. Lastly, we have poor voice over IP quality. This issue is rather self-explanatory and can significantly impact communication clarity and effectiveness. Voice over IP operates by transmitting voice data over the internet in real time, making it more sensitive to latency and jitter compared to other types of network traffic. Both latency and jitter can cause audio disruptions, such as audio breaking up or voice distortion, making it difficult to understand the other party during a voice over IP call. Since voice over IP relies on real-time transmission, 
Even slight delays or fluctuations in packet arrival times can result in noticeable audio quality degradation. High latency can lead to delays in audio transmission, causing conversations to feel disjointed or out of sync. Similarly, excessive jitter can cause packets to arrive out of order or with inconsistent timing, resulting in audio distortion or dropouts. Addressing poor voice over IP quality involves optimizing network configurations to minimize latency and jitter. This may include prioritizing voice over IP traffic over other data types. Additionally, upgrading network hardware and software, such as routers and switches, can help improve the reliability and stability of voice over IP connections. Well done on finishing our CompTIA A Plus Core 1 training course. The commitment and drive you have demonstrated to arrive at this milestone is truly admirable, regardless of whether you embarked on this journey with limited IT knowledge, leveraged prior experience, or just continued on from the ITF Plus certification. Your progress is commendable. Now you stand on the verge of your next major achievement, passing your CompTIA A Plus Core 1 certification exam. But before you take that next step and schedule that exam, we have an exciting new challenge waiting for you to tackle. We've assembled an exclusive practice exam on our channel, packed with 200 plus questions meticulously designed to test your knowledge and simulate the format and difficulty of the actual exam. It's essential to remember that repetition is the key to mastery. The more you practice, the more confident you'll feel. Also, as you navigate through our practice exam, be sure to make notes of areas you're unsure about and feel free to revisit any part of our training course as needed. So are you prepared for our practice exam? Great. Then click on the link to my left to get started. This CompTIA A plus Core 1 practice exam will challenge you, gauge your readiness, and move you one step closer to your certification goal. We wish you all the best, and here's to you passing that exam.